They shrugged, took a last look around the curved tower battlements, and turned to head back to their posts. If the master wanted to tell them what it had been, he would. If he kept silent about it, twould be best if they did, too, and... Halgland pointed, and they both stared. Halfway back along the way they'd come, the mist was dancing along the battlements. It had a definite shape now, and the shape was female, barefoot and in flowing skirts, with long hair flying free in her wake as she ran, a faint chiming in her wake. The guards could just see through her. In unspoken accord, they broke into a run. If she turned across the bridge they were supposed to be guarding, she ran right past it, heading toward the binding racks and blood stains of Blood Top Tower where, when the master had prisoners he no longer needed, the wyverns were sometimes allowed to feed. That was a good way off, and the ghostly lady seemed in no hurry. The pounding guards gained on her swiftly. A dark-robed figure was coming across the bridge. The master. Haugland hissed a curse, and Curthis felt like joining in, but the mage ignored them turning to join the chase along the battlements well ahead of his two guards. He carried a wand in one hand. The guards saw her turn, hair swirling in the moonlight, amid the binding racks, and silently beckon the master of wyverns as coyly as any lover in a minstrel's ballad. As he approached her, she danced away to the edge of the battlements. The hard-running guards saw him follow warily, wand raised and ready. Glymrel looked back at them once, as if deciding whether or not to wait until they reached the tower, and Curthis clearly saw amazement on his face. Not of their master's making, then, and unexpected to boot. They did not slow in their now panting sprint. But even so, Curthis knew the strange foreboding that precedes by instance the sure knowledge that one is going to be just too late. The woman became a snake-like, formless thing, and the shocked guards heard a long, raw howl from Clandarless Glymrel as something bright whirled around him in a swift spiral, climbing toward the moon. An instant later, the master of wyverns became a roaring column of flame that split the night with its sudden fury. Curthis clutched at Halglin's arm, and they came to a ragged, panting halt together all too close to where the battlements joined Blood Top Tower. There was a booming thump, and something exploded out of the pyre, trailing flames down into the inner courtyards. The wand. The guards exchanged fearful looks, licked dry lips, and started to back away in fear. They had managed two strides before the stones beneath their feet rippled like waves on a beach and started to slump and fall. They fell into oblivion with the gathering roar of Glymral Guard collapsing, ringing in their ears. As the moon saw that great fortress crash back down into the tumbled ruin it had been before Glymral's spells had rebuilt it, a bright and triumphant mist danced over the rising dust and fading screams, its chimes mixed with cold, echoing laughter. The court mage looked at the guard captain's grim face and sighed, Who was it this time? Anne Levas Joavrin, Lord Elminster, a merchant from somewhere south across the sea. Brasswork, sundries, nothing important, but a lot of it. Many coins here over many seasons. His throat was cut. Elminster sighed. May a Thor or one of the new barons? L Lord, I know not and hardly dares your hunches, loyal Roagalo. The guard captain glanced nervously from side to side. El smiled crookedly and leaned over to put his ear right to the man's lips. Limitor, the officer breathed hoarsely. El nodded and stepped back. No particular surprise if Roagalo was right. Limitor was the only baron or lordling in Galadorna busier in dark corners with bribe threat and ready knife than Maethor of the many whispers. Go and dine now, he told the exhausted guard officer. We'll talk later. Roagalo and his three armsmen hurried out. El took care not to sigh until the antechamber was quite empty. He murmured something and moved two fingers a trifle. There was a faint thump behind one wall as the spy there abruptly went to sleep. El gave the section of wall a mirthless smile 
and used the secret door he wanted to keep secret a little longer, taking the lightless passage beyond to one of the disused and dusty hidden rooms in the House of the Unicorn. A little time alone to think is a rare treasure some folk never seize for themselves, and others the truly deprived in life cannot. Three barons had died so far this year, one of them with a dagger in his throat not two steps from entering the throne chamber, and six, no, seven lesser lords. Galadorna had become a nest of vipers, striking at each other with their fangs bared whenever the whim took them, and the court mage was not a happy man. He had no friends. Anyone he befriended soon ended up staring sightlessly at a ceiling of a morning. There were whisperings behind every door in the palace, and never any true smiles when those doors opened. El was even getting used to the sight of dark ribbons of blood wandering out from under behind closed doors. Perhaps he should issue a decree commanding all doors in Nethrar be taken down and burned. Ha, to that! He was becoming what he knew they called him behind his back, the flapping mouth that spews decrees. The barons and lordlings constantly tried to undercut royal authority, or even steal openly from the court, and his lady master was no help at all, using her spells too seldom to engender any fear that might in turn breed obedience. There came a faint scratching sound from off to his left. Elminster pulled on the right knob and a panel slid open. Two young guardsmen peered into the dimness. You sent for us, Lord Elminster? Ye found the scrolls, Delver, and... Burned, and the ashes in the moat, Lord, as you ordered, mixed with the dust you gave me. I used all of it. Elminster nodded and reached out a hand to touch a forehead. Forget all, loyal warrior, he said, and so escape the doom we all fear. The guard he'd touched shivered, eyes blank, then turned and hurried back into the darkness, unlacing his breeches as he went. He'd been heading for his quarters when the sudden urgent need to use the garter robe had come upon him and led him into the disused wing of the palace. In Grath, the court mage asked calmly, I found the quick, uh, her work in the red shield chamber and mixed in the white powder until I could see it no more. Then I said the words and got out. El nodded and reached out his hand. Ye and Delver are earning such handsome rewards, he murmured. The guardsman chuckled. <laughs> Not the need to go to the Jakes, please, Lord. Let it be wandering trying to recall my youthful dalliances down here, eh? El smiled. As ye wish, he said, as his fingers touched flesh. Ingrath's eyes flickered, and the forgetful warrior stepped around the still and silent mage, walked in a thoughtful circle around the room, found the panel, and trotted away again his part in slowing Dasumia's evil forgotten once more. Which might just keep him alive another month or two. T'would be safer if the two weren't friends and knew nothing of each other, but it had happened that the best warriors Al could trust, after subtle but thorough mind-scrying, were fast friends. That should be no surprise, he supposed. El paced the gloomy room, his mood dark enough to match it. Mistress' command to serve had been clear, but serve in his own way had always been Elminster's failing. If it was a flaw that was to doom him now, then let it be so. Some things a man must cling to, to remain a man, or a woman cleave to, to be herself, and there was certainly one lady in Galadorna doing just as she pleased. Queen Desumia always seemed to be laughing at him these days, and certainly cared nothing for the duties of being queen. She was seldom to be found on the throne or even in the royal castle, leaving El to issue decrees in her stead. Galadorna could sink into war and thievery without her noticing, and daily as more slavers and unscrupulous merchants rushed in, knowing they'd be left more or less unrestricted in their dealings, the lords of Lothkind were casting covetous eyes on the increasingly wealthy kingdom. One thing lawlessness among merchants does bring is full tax coffers. El sighed again. The important thing was to make sure that with all this gold, lawlessness did not spread to the crown. Sweet Mistra Forfend, whatever would it be like to live in a land ruled by merchants?
Everyone ignored the splintering and crashing sounds of a table collapsing under two cursing men slugging each other and the shivering and tinkling sounds of breaking glass that followed as various nearby drinkers hurled bottles at the combatants, seeking to alter the odds of wagers just placed. Someone screamed from another room, a death cry that ended in a horrible wet gurgle and was answered by drunken applause. It was late, after all, and this was the Goblet of Shadows. Nethrar had known wilder taverns in its time, but the days of golem dancers who ate their fees to enrich Ilgrist were gone, and the dens they'd done more than dance in were gone with them. The goblet, however, was very much here, and those too afraid to brave its pleasures alone could always hire a trio of surly-looking warriors to guard them and make them, at least in their own eyes, seem a veteran member of a band of adventurers on dangerous business bent. And there were the ladies, one such a vision in blue silk and mock armor, whose loops of chain and curves of leather did more to display than conceal, had just perched on the edge of a table not far from where Beldrune and Tabarist were nursing glasses of ruby-hued but raw heart's fire and grumbling, well-aged, six days belike, to each other. Over their glasses, Beldrune and Tabarist watched the saucy beauty in the silks bending low over two young men at the table she'd chosen, giving them a view of the sort that older, more sober men have fallen headlong into before now. The two wizards cleared their throats in unison. "'Tis getting a mite hot in here,' Tabarist observed weakly, tugging at his collar. "'Over that side of the table, too,' Beldrune grunted his eyes locked on the lady in blue. He flicked a finger, and through the din of chatter and laughter, singing and breaking glass, the two mages could suddenly hear a voice purring, as if it was speaking right in their ears. Delver? Ingrath? Those names are exciting. The names of daring men, of heroes. You are daring heroes, aren't you? The two young warriors chuckled and said something more or less in unison, and the saucy beauty in blue whispered, How daring are you both feeling this night, and how heroic. The two men laughed again rather warily, and the beauty murmured, Heroic enough to do a service for your queen, a personal service? They saw her reach into her bodice and draw forth a long heavy chain of linked gold coins that caught and held their hungry eyes as she flashed the unicorn-adorned royal ring of Galadorna. The two sets of eyes widened and looked slowly and more soberly up from the coins and the curves to the face above, where they found an impish grin followed by a tongue just darting into view between parted lips. Come, she said, if you dare, to a place where we can have more fun. The watching wizards saw the two men hesitate and exchange glances. Then one of them said something, lifting his eyebrows in an exaggerated manner, and they both laughed rather nervously, drained their tankards, and rose. The queen looped her chain of coins around the wrist of one of them and towed him playfully off across the dim and crowded maze of tables, beaded curtains, and archways that formed the backbone of the goblet. Blue silk and supple leather swayed very close past the innocently tilted noses of Beldrun and Tabarist. When the second warrior had stalked past, hungry eyes, hairy arms and all, the two mages with one accord drained their heart's fires, turned to each other and turned red at the same time, tugged at their collars again, and cleared their throats once more. Tabarist rumbled, Uh... I think it's time to see the bottom of more than one tankard, don't you? My thoughts exactly, Beldrune agreed. After a keg or three of beer now, mind you. Deep in the dimness, behind a pillar in the Goblet of Shadows, an elf whose face might have been cut from cold marble, watched Queen Desumia of Galadorna tow her two prizes out of the tumult. When they'd rounded a corner out of sight, Ilbrin Starim turned his head to sneer down at the two blushing old wizards who didn't see him. Then he glided off through the goblet toward the exit he knew the queen would use, 
taking care to keep well back and well hidden. Roagolo had brought word of another murder and a knifing whose victim might live. Elminster had handed him a hand keg of Burdeem's best from the royal cellar and told him to go somewhere safe and out of uniform to drink it. Now the court mage of Galadorna was striding wearily bedward, looking forward to some solid hours of staring up into the darkness and getting some real thinking work done on the governance of a feud-festering little kingdom. Perhaps there'd be another assassination attempt in the wee hours. That would be jolly. El's mood had a sword edge to it just now, an ache was already raging in his head from dealing with sharp-tongued merchants all day. Moreover, he couldn't seem to put an idea out of his mind. A rumor abroad in Nethrar, courtesy of the two old bumbling mages from Moonshorn Tower, who seemed to have followed him here, that Dasumia was the name of the dread sorceress called the Lady of Shadows. Could she and the queen somehow be related? Hmm... El sighed again, for perhaps the seven hundredth time this day, and out of habit glanced along the side corridor his passage had brought him to. Then he came to a dead halt and peered long and hard. Someone very familiar was crossing the corridor farther down, using a passage parallel to his own. It was the queen, clad in blue silks and leather and chains like a tavern dancer and she was leading two young men, warriors by their harness, whose hands and lips were hard at work upon her person as she led them along, out of view and into a part of the house of the unicorn Elminster had never yet visited. Cold fear stirred deep in his vitals as he recognized those two ardent men as his sometime tools against her, Delver and Ingrath. His headache started to pound in earnest as he caught up his robes and sprinted as quietly but as swiftly as he could down the corridor toward the place where he'd seen Dasumia disappear. It was better not to use a concealment spell now in case his lady master had a trailing spell tell active. The queen was making no effort at stealth. The high tinkling laugh she used as false flattery rang out as El reached the corner he thought was the right one and began hopping from pillar to pillar. There followed the sounds of a slap, Delver's voice telling a jest he couldn't catch the words of, and more laughter. El abandoned stealth for haste as he saw the passage they'd used and at an archway. He was just in time to see the amorous trio leave the far end of that empty echoing room through another arch. One dark and disused chamber proved to lead into another through a succession of open archways, and El took care to keep out of sight of anyone glancing back and freeze whenever the sounds ahead ceased. He'd worked his way back to being a single chamber behind when some trick of eddying air currents made the voices of those he was following startlingly loud. Where by all the gods of battle are you taking us, woman? Uh, your majesty, he meant to say, this does look suspiciously like a way down to the dungeons. Dasumia laughed again, a deep, hearty sound of pleasure this time. Keep that hand right where it is, bold warrior. And no, don't be gentle, sirs. We're heading nowhere near the dungeons. You have a royal promise on that. El crept to the next archway like a hunting cat and peered around its edge, in time to hear the rattle of a beaded curtain unseen around a corner, parting. Light flared out from beyond it. El took a chance, danced across the room to that corner, and took another chance. Across the open lit way they'd taken was another curtain. He could hide behind it and see into the lit area, if he just darted across the open way at the right moment not to be seen. Now? He darted, halted, and tried to bring his breathing back to soundlessness, all in a handful of instants. He used the next handful and the next to stare at where the queen had taken her catches. The brightly lit area beyond the curtains was only an antechamber. An archway in its far wall opened into a place lit by a red, evil-looking radiance. Flanking that arch were two fully armored guardians, with their visors down and curving sabers raised in their gauntlets, warriors without feet, 
whose ankle stumps were gliding along inches above the stone floor without ever touching it. Helmed horrors, men called them, magically animated armor that could slay as surely as living armsmen. El watched them start menacingly forward, only to halt at a gesture from the queen. Desumia strode between them without stopping, towing her living warriors, and El stole along boldly in their wake, watching those raised sabers narrowly. Before he reached the helmed horrors, they wheeled around and floated along after the trio, sheathing their swords soundlessly. El brought up the rear, moving very cautiously now. The chamber beyond was very large and very dark, its only light coming from a glowing ruby-hued tapestry at the far end, a tapestry that displayed a black device larger than many cottages El had seen, the Black Hand of Bane. The aisle that ran down the center of the temple was lined with braziers. As Dasumia strode between each pair of them, they burst spontaneously into flame. Delver and Ingrath were obviously having second thoughts about their royal night of passion. El could clearly hear them gulping as they slowed and had to be dragged along by Dasumia. There were pews on either side of the aisle, some of them occupied by slumped skeletons in robes, others by mummified or still-rotting corpses. El ducked into an empty row, crouching low to the floor. He knew what must be coming. No! Ingrath cried suddenly, twisting free of the queen's grasp and whirling around to flee. He moaned despairingly, an instant before Delver tore free of the chain of coins, began his own sprint, and screamed. The two helmed horrors had been floating right behind them, gauntleted hands out and ready to close on their throats. Those steely fingers beckoned to them now, as the empty helms leaned horribly closer. Moaning in despair, the two guardsmen turned back to face the queen. Desumia was lying on the altar, propped up on one elbow, and wearing rather less than she'd entered the temple with. Laughingly, she beckoned them. Reluctantly, the two warriors stumbled forward. 10. To Taste Dark Fire the best thing an archmage can do with his spells? Use them to destroy another archmage, of course, and himself in the doing. We'll plant something useful in the ashes. Radishes, perhaps. Albrindgandar of the Singing Sword, from Thoughts on a Better Feroon, published circa the Year of the Lion. Unseen drums boomed and rolled beginning an inexorable, unhurried beat that shook the temple. El watched narrowly as a large hand of Bane, a trifle taller than a man and seemingly carved of some black stone, rose into view behind the altar block. A halo of wispy red flames rose and fell around its fingers, and by their flickering light, as Desumia leaped lightly back down from the altar, Elminster saw two long metal-barbed black whips lying crossed upon the altar where she'd been lying. The drumbeats quickened very slightly. Seeking a better view, El drew up the hood of his robes to hide his face in its cowl and slowly rose into a seated position on his pew, becoming just another slumped form among the many corpses. His decaying neighbors were no doubt one-time victims of rituals here. Delver and Ingrith and one Elminster, too, for that matter, might well soon join them if the court mage of Galadorna didn't act with precise timing and do just the right things in the moments just ahead. The two warriors stood facing Desumia, and they were trembling with fear. She took their hands and spoke to them. The words were lost to El in the sound of the drums, but she was obviously reassuring them. From time to time she embraced or kissed them, ignoring, as they could not, the hulking helmed horrors floating just behind their shoulders. The queen turned, took up the whips, and handed one to each man. Leaning back against the altar, she snapped a command to them and held up her hands toward the dark, unseen ceiling in a gesture of summoning. With great reluctance, they swung the whips in her direction with no force, so the barbed lengths simply brushed against her and bounced off harmlessly. Elminster heard Desumia's angry order this time. Strike! Strike or die! 
She held up her hands in a summoning once more, and the whips lashed out at her in earnest this time. Her body jerked under the blows, and a wisp of blue smoke fell away. She hissed encouragement to Ingrith and Delver, who struck harder, their whips cracking. A lash wrapped around her, bearing one of her breasts. At their next blows, the first wheels marked Desumia, and she groaned at them to strike harder still. The guardsmen obeyed tentatively at first, then with spirit as she shouted at them to strike ever harder, staring up at them as she had more than once overwhelmed Elminster with her will. Delver and Ingrith reeled, then bent to their task, putting all their fear of dying here and resentment at her entrapping them behind each blow. Blood drenched blue silk, and smooth flesh beneath rapidly vanished under a rain of blows from whips that glistened dark with blood. Abruptly, Desumia threw back her head and howled at them to stop. Delver, weeping hysterically, failed to do so, and the helmed horror behind him snaked out a gauntlet and caught his arm in a grip that halted his frantic flailing in mid-swing. She looked more like a beast skinned for the roasting pit than a naked woman now, but as Desumia drew her arms down and put her hands on her hips to explain the next part of the ritual, she might have been imperiously gowned and giving orders to kneeling courtiers. She showed no trace of pain despite the blood coursing down her limbs, moving easily and with her usual wanton sway of the hips as she ordered Ingrith on to the altar to lie on his back. Anger was rising in Elminster, anger and revulsion. He had to do something. He had to make this stop. El tried to recall what he'd once heard a drunken worshipper of Bane say about this sort of ritual. Sacrifices being cut to death by priests flailing with sharp swords, was it? Or a floating hand of Bane crushing sacrifices in its grip? Aye, that was it. Desumia had mounted the guardsmen on the altar and was crying out, Strike! Strike! to Delver who was moving reluctantly forward with his whip to obey her, when El knew he could watch no longer. The whip cracked down, trailing blood at each swing, and El found himself tingling with rage and with risen power, power throbbing at his very fingertips. He was a chosen of Mistra, however hazily he recalled what that had meant. Mistra, he murmured, guide me. However evil his lady master had turned out to be, he could not watch her blood raining down any longer while he did nothing, and two good men drew closer and closer to their deaths. That black hand behind the altar would slowly rise, then reach out to crush them, as it was moving now. Horrified, Elminster reached out with his will, using the one spell he could unleash without speaking or moving. Hopefully he could remain an anonymous corpse for a few moments more. He moved not against the hand, that would come next, but to disable the foes who were sure to come diving down on him the moment he was discovered. He could feel the webwork of linkages now, coursing out from the altar. With infinite care, he detached one linkage from a helmed horror, shifting it to a section of ceiling beyond the floating thing rather than severing it outright. If he could get one step further before being discovered, Desumia stiffened and sat up, ignoring the continuing bite of the lash. She glared around the temple, seeking the intruder. El shrugged and broke the bindings of the second-helmed horror with savage abruptness. Dark and terrible eyes bored into him. Then slowly Desumia's lips twisted into a smile. She sat back on the altar, reclining again on one elbow with an air of amusement, and watched him. Silently, their limbs jerking, Delver and Ingrith began to shuffle toward Elminster. Obviously in thrall, they thrust the bloody whips they carried back over their shoulders, ready for the first lashing strike. The barbs that had so mutilated Desumia glistened red with her blood as the guardsmen lurched nearer and nearer. El's shearing spell was still active, and he was loath to spend another magic when the duel of his life was waiting, sneering at him up on the altar. Yet what good would it do to break her thrall upon the warriors when with another spell, no doubt to her a trifling magic, she could restore it? Delver and Ingrith stumbled stiffly nearer, their faces locked and impassive, their eyes horrified and rolling, pleading with him for aid or mercy or release. 
El snapped the linkages that controlled them with brutal force, ignoring their suddenly spasming bodies and uncontrolled spitting and undulating, he rode the shock of the magical backlash into their minds, feeling the same pain they did. It was he who cried out in agony, but they toppled bonelessly to the floor, senseless. It had worked. El discovered he'd bitten his lip. He shot a glance at the altar, but Desumia hadn't moved. She was still reclining at her ease, soundlessly laughing, and the blood and whip cuts were fading from her skin, melting away as if they'd never been. El drew in a deep breath and glanced behind him to be sure there were no other helmed horrors, arriving Bane worshippers, or any other menace that might strike from behind. He found nothing. He thought he saw a movement among the corpses along the darkest row of pews right at the back, but he could not be sure and could see nothing moving when he stared hard at that place. He dared not turn his back on Desumia any longer. Wheeling around, he found her still lying at ease on the altar, whole and healed now, her body quite bare. She laughed aloud, and El gritted his teeth against the rage now boiling up in his throat, and with iron control worked his next magic with precision. Lady Master or no, he was going to bring that huge, hovering black hand of stone crashing down on the altar. He was— The hand resisted him utterly. Desumia's laughter rose into real mirth as he snarled and strained to move it. He could feel the linkage. He could insinuate his will into its flows to grasp at the magic. And it ignored him, remaining as rigid as an iron bar despite his best efforts to budge it. He was. He could. He could not. As the Queen of Galadorna hooted at him, El abandoned the spell with a snarl and worked another magic hiding his gestures from her, down below the back of the pew in front of him. When he was ready, a seeming eternity later, he stood up and hurled his magic through her cruel laughter, not at the deadly beautiful woman on the altar, or at the altar itself, a stone block that positively throbbed with ebbing and flowing magic he could not hope to overmaster. The floor beneath one end of it, however, Flagstones heaved, buckled, and shattered into shards, their cracks louder than those the whip had made. The floor rippled like a wave of stone, sending slivers of stone clattering against the back wall of the temple, and suddenly subsided, opening a huge pit. There must be cellars down there his magic could shove the earth and stone into to clear a space so swiftly. Desumia sprang calmly off the altar to land on her feet, facing him. She smiled approvingly, saluted him, then turned to watch as the altar block shivered, teetered, and tipped over, sliding into the chasm with a thunderous crash. Shattered! How destructive of you, Desumia observed merrily. Care to destroy anything else? In grim, wordless answer, Elminster snatched a stall plate from the end of his pew and broke it across his knee, cracking the hand of Bane. Dying enchantments spat black sparks. He cast its wooden shards onto the floor and reached for the next plate. Desumia laughed. So it has come to a duel between us two at last, brave Elminster. Are you ready to dare me at last? No, Elminster almost whispered. Have ye forgotten what I told ye when first we met at the Rivenstone? I serve Mistra first, and then Desumia. Then Galadorna. Tell me, who does Desumia serve first? Desumia laughed again. Choices have prices, she said almost merrily. Prepare to pay yours. Her hands rose in a simple gesture, and almost immediately Elminster felt a tightness in his throat, a choking feeling that grew steadily worse. His legs and hips seemed to shift under him, his clothes began to feel tight, then more than tight. El struggled to rise and saw that his fingers were becoming stubby, bloated things like mismatched mottled sausages. So was the rest of him. Clothing began to split and disintegrate then with tearing sounds like whip strikes. The shredded remnants of the mantle of court mage of Galadorna fell away in tatters as El wallowed about, trying to rise on legs that kept changing in length and thickness. 
Desumia was howling with laughter as he fell over to one side or another, growing steadily larger until he was pressed tight against the pew in front of his own in a grip that grew steadily more vice-like. He was as fat as two cart barrels now and still growing. He tried to spin the gestures of another spell with fingers that dangled and wobbled and were as long as his forearm, a forearm that was now as broad as his chest had been before it too had started growing. Then his own spell took hold, and the tightness was suddenly gone as the pews in front of him, behind him, and under him all tore free of the floor, trailing dust as they rose, and tumbling him onto the floor, a grotesque mass of sliding, many-folded flesh that lay on its back, panting. El heaved and struggled, gasping for breath, and managed to get over onto one side, facing his foe. The moment he could see her, three pews flashed through the air at her under his grim bidding, like gigantic lances. Desumia ducked, rolled, then backflipped, turned as she landed, and in the same motion flexed her magnificent legs and sprang. All three pews missed, crashing into the floating black hand with a splintering fury that shook the room. One of the fingers broke off the hand, leaking magical radiances as it went. Dasumia hissed something fast and harsh, and almost instantly Al found himself rising into the air. Up and up he rose uncontrollably, trying to see what was where around the temple as he went. Was she going to lift him and drop him, or— El caught sight of something lying in the aisle and got an idea. He worked the spell he needed in furious haste knowing that a bruising impact with the cobwebbed stone ceiling was coming up fast. He finished his spell just in time to throw one arm up in front of his face and turn his nose aside before slamming hard into the ceiling, sending startled bats screeching away in a wild flapping of wings, and finding that her magic was still pressing on him, pinning him against the dank stone. He scrabbled with his arms and elbows, trying to roll over so he could see Desumia, and not dark, dirty stone an inch from his eyelashes. He needed to be able to see to work the spell he'd cast. Grunting and grasping, he managed to roll his ponderous bulk over in time to see a tightly smiling Desumia magically raise one of the shattered pews he had hurled at her into the air and send it right back at him. Larger and larger it loomed as El scrambled along the ceiling trying to get out of its way using his great bulk to catch and kick at vault ribs that would have been ten feet or more out of his reach if he'd been his proper size. El tried to concentrate on his own spell down below and ignore the oncoming pew. He never saw the slim, dark-robed figure that stood up in the back pew to take calm, careful aim at him, fix his position in mind, then begin to cast its own deadly spell. As El moved, the pew curved in the air to follow, Desumia's smile broadening with anticipatory glee at the coming impact. The end that would strike Elminster was a splayed mass of jagged wooden splinters, most of them as long as a man was tall. Desumia took three swift steps sideways to get a better look at the situation, and that was all El needed. He rolled over a roof vault, wheezing like some great aerial whale, and in its lee called on his spell. Two whips rose from the aisle like eager, awakened snakes to pounce on the Queen of Galadorna. As the pew struck the ceiling with a crash that sent him bouncing off the ceiling tiles amid showers of dust, El had a brief glimpse of Desumia's startled face as bloodied black leather whipped around one wrist and jerked down, throwing her onto her back. She struck her head on the floor and cried out in pain, and that was all the time that two whips needed. The wrist that had dragged her down was bound fast to her ankle. The other whip did the same on her other side, and one whip slapped its handle across her eyes, blinding her with tears, while the other thrust its handle into her open mouth, effectively gagging her. Most of the pew broke away and showered the temple below with shards of wood as the gigantic missile cart wheeled away from the roof vault. Ilbrin Starim didn't even have time to flee, as the rest of the pew plunged into the pew right in front of where he was sitting, sending riven wood in all directions and hurling him helplessly into the air, tumbling head over heels in the midst of his own conjured ball of magical flames 
to strike the back wall of the temple with a crash. He slid slowly and brokenly down that wall, his screams fading. Abruptly, El found himself plummeting to the ground. He grinned savagely. This must mean Desumia was either falling unconscious or abandoning her spell in favor of something desperate. He sent the whips an urgent command to thrust their captive aloft so he could give her the same sort of fall if she overcame him, or his own landing was too... hard. Gods, El knew bones had shattered, even before he rolled over like some sort of agonized elephant and tried to scramble to his feet. Scrambling didn't work, but he did get upright by throwing his great bulk to one side, then trying to climb it with his clumsy legs. He got himself turned around in time to see his whips suddenly swinging empty, their captive gone from their entangling midst. A moment later, a cold, cold pain slid into his side and out again, and he knew where she'd gone. He didn't bother to try to turn and face her just to see a sword dripping with his own blood and to give her a better target to stab at, but concentrated on ignoring the pain and calling up another spell. The blade slid into him once more, but El knew his great bulk kept him safe from her slitting his throat. She couldn't reach it without so much climbing that he'd be able to simply topple over onto her to win this fight forever. He threw himself backward and heard her startled curse and the clangor of a dropped sword bouncing on stone. Now he did start to turn, heaving himself around. If the blade was close enough, he could throw himself on it and bury it. He met Desumia's startled eyes, and she brought one hand to her mouth, glanced down at the sword lying so close to him, and vanished just moments before El completed his spell. It was a blood magic incantation. El threw back his head and shrieked at the pain. As the magic healed his wounds, it felt like fire raging through his gigantic body, fire that flared, raged, then swiftly faded as the healing neared completion. It could also teleport him to wherever his freshly shed blood might be, on the floor beneath him, on the sword mere feet away, and on the hands of the queen wherever she might be. The spell flashed, the temple around him twisted, and he was suddenly behind the altar where a crouching Desumia was looking up at him in startled surprise. He reached out to clutch at her should she try to flee and threw himself off balance so as to fall on her. Desumia backflipped again, her heels grazing the floating black hand of Bane, and Al crashed down inches away from her frantically rolling form. He grabbed at her, but couldn't reach, and was still huffing and wallowing and trying to pivot his great bulk around so that his bloated and deformed arm could reach her when she fetched up against the back wall of the temple and cast another spell, favoring him with a cat-like smile of triumph. Something flashed. El turned his head in time to see one of the floating helmed horrors flow and twist, breaking apart into a whirling sphere of jagged metal shards. Shards that came out of their dance in a stream that leaped right at him. El threw one ponderous arm up in front of his eyes and throat, and with the other grabbed blindly, felt Desumia's struggling form, closed his grasp mercilessly, and hauled her like a rag doll back up in front of him as a shield. As searing shards cut into him in three places or more, El heard Desumia gasp, a sound that was cut off sharply. When he lowered his shielding arm, he saw that she was biting her lip, blood trailing down her chin and eyes closed in her contorted face. Jagged shards had transfixed her in a dozen places, and she was shuddering. The blue-white motes of magic leaking from her might be contingencies, or might be something else. As he watched, a shard drooped, dangled, then broke off and fell, visibly smaller. Another seemed to be melting into her, and another. Gods! The sudden pain made Elminster drop his foe. Her ravaged body fell onto his great bulk, and the real pain began. A burning, smoke was rising from where she lay sprawled on his mounded flesh, and she was slowly sinking. Acid. She'd turned her blood to acid, and it was eating away at him and at the shards. Well, the watching gods knew he'd spare flesh in plenty to lose, but he had to get clear of her. He snatched at her, threw her as hard as he could at the floating hand of Bane, 
and had the satisfaction of seeing her strike it limply and stick for a moment before her own weight peeled her free to fall from view behind the altar. Wisps of smoke curled up from the hand as a little left behind acid ate at it, too. L sat back grimly and sighed. Unconscious she might be, but he lacked the strength to crush her. Perhaps if he pushed her into the pit and shouldered those two loose pews into it on top of her, nay, he could not be so cruel. And so, when she awakened, Elminster Almar would die. He was almost out of spells and still trapped in this grotesquely enlarged form, probably unable to fit through the passages that had brought him here. He could do little more to stop the evil Lady Master whom Mistra had sent him to serve. Her magic overmatched his, as his outstripped that of a novice. She would make a magnificent and able servant of Mistra, a better chosen than he, if she were only biddable enough to obey anyone. He shut his eyes against the banner of Bane and called up a mental image of the blue-white star of Mistra. Lady of Mysteries, he said aloud, his voice echoing in the now silent temple. One who has been thy servant cries to ye in his need. I have failed thee, and failed in my service to the one called Desumia. But see in her strength that could well serve thee in my place. Succor this Desumia, I pray, and... Sudden searing cold shocked him into an inarticulate cry. He could feel himself trembling uncontrollably as magic stronger than he'd ever felt before surged through him. Numbly, he waited for whatever killing strike Desumia would deal him, but it did not come. Instead, a warmth gently grew within the ice, and he felt himself relaxing, even as a strange crawling sensation swept over him. He was healed. He was growing smaller and lighter and himself again and a face that he could barely see through flooding tears was bending over him. Then he heard a voice speaking to him tenderly, a voice that belonged to the Queen of Galadorna, but no longer held the cold cruelty of Desumia. So you pass the test, Elminster Amar, and remain the first and dearest of my chosen even if your brains are too addled to recognize when a ritual of bane is being perverted, bringing pleasure to this altar instead of pain, and shedding the blood of someone willing. A fond and musical laugh followed, then the words, I am proud this night. Gentle arms enfolded him, and Elminster cried out in wonder as he felt himself lifted up, in a soaring flight that should have smashed them both into the ceiling but did not, reaching high and clear into the stars instead. The roof of the House of the Unicorn burst apart, towers toppling, as a column of silver fire roared up into the night. As men on the battlements screamed and cursed, something chill and chiming that had been coiled hungrily around a spire close by their heads, fled in a misty parabola, to drift away low over the streets of Nethrar, cowering in the night. Silver fire danced on dark water, throwing feeble reflections into purple-bordered tapestries of deepest black. High on those tapestries in purple thread were worked their sole adornments, cruel, somehow feminine smiles. The inky waters of the scrying font rippled and the scene of silver fire soaring up out of a castle was gone. Someone close above the water said excitedly, You saw? I know how we can use this. Tell me, a cold voice snapped, sharp with excitement. Then in lower tones, in another direction, said more calmly, Cancel the even flame service. We'll be busy, and undisturbed, mark you, Sister Knight, until further notice. And so it was that Galadorna lost its queen and its court mage in the same night, less than a ten-day before the armies of Lothkund rolled down from the tree-girt hills to set Nethrar ablaze and shatter the unicorn kingdom forever. Book Two 
Sunrise on a dark road. 11. Moonrise, frost fire, and doom. Adventurers are best used to slay monsters. Sooner or later, they become your worst monsters, and you have to hire new ones to do the obvious thing. Raldrick Hallowshaw, Jester, from To Rule a Realm, from Turret to Midden, published circa the Year of the Bloodbird. Seems peaceful enough, don't it? The warrior rumbled, looking around from the height of his saddle at the forest of hyaxal, blue leaf, and gnarled old fandar trees that flanked both sides of the road. Birds called in the distant depths of its shade gloom, and small furry things scuttled here and there among the dead leaves that carpeted its mossy stumps and mushroom-studded deadfalls. Golden shafts of sunlight stabbed down into the forest here and there, lighting little clearings where shrubs fought each other for the light, and the moss-draped creepers were fewer. Don't say such fool-head things, Arvis, one of his companions growled. They sound all too much like the sort of cues ambushing brigands like to follow. That sentence of yours sounds like something that should end with an arrow taking you in the throat, or the chunk of road your charger's standing on rising up to be revealed as the head of some awakened titan or other. I'll take the or other, you merry-faced killjoy, Arvis grunted. I just meant I don't see claw-sharpening marks on trees, bloodstains, that sort of thing which should make you even more cheerful. You can be sure the High Duke didn't hire us to block the star Mantle road while we argue about things I'd rather other ears didn't hear about, a deeper voice said sharply. Arvis, Fald asked, stow it. Put Eregur, Arvis said in weary tones. Have you looked up and down this road recently? Do you see anyone, anyone but us? Block the road from what, may I ask? Since the deaths began, travel seems to have just about stopped along here. Possibly about the same time you got this funny idea into your head that you're somehow entitled to give the rest of us orders. Was it the new armor, the heavy helm pressing hard on your brains, or was it the new thrusting codpiece with the Arvis enough, said someone else in exasperation. Gods, it's like having a babbling drunk riding with us. Rolian, his halfling comrade said from somewhere below the level of the human's belts, it is having a babbling drunk riding with us. There was a general roar of laughter, even echoed, albeit sarcastically, by Arvis himself, and the frost fire banner urged their mounts into a trot. They all wanted to find a good defensible place to camp before dark or have time to get back to Star Mantle if no such sight offered itself, and it wouldn't be all that many hours now before the shadows grew long and the sun bright and low. High Duke Horostos styled himself lord over the rich farmlands west of Star Mantle, along a forested cliff of a coast that offered few harbors, and no good ones. As realms went, it was a quiet and safe land, plagued by the usual owl bears and sturges from time to time, the odd band of brigands, thieving peddlers, small problems that a few armsmen and foresters with good bows could handle. Lately, it seemed, at about the time the worst winter snows ended and folk considered the useful part of the year of the awakening worm to have begun, the High Duchy of Langalos had somehow acquired a big problem— something that left no tracks but killed at will, passing merchants, woodcutters, farmers, livestock, and alert war bands of the Duke's best armsmen alike. Even a high-ranking priest of Tempest, traveling with a large-mounted and well-armed bodyguard, had gone missing somewhere along the wooded road west of Starmantle, and was thought to have fallen afoul of the mysterious Slayer. Could this be the awakening worm of the prophecies? Perhaps, but hired griffin riders flying over the area had found no sign of large caves, scorched or broken trees, or any other marks of large beasts, or any sign of brigands or their encampments, for that matter. Nor had the few foresters who still dared to venture anywhere near the trees seen anything. 
and one by one, these were disappearing too. Their reports told of a land that seemed barren of any beast so large as a fox or hare. The game trails were grown over with ferns. So the High Duke had reluctantly opened his coffers while he still had subjects to tax and refill them and had hired the classic solution, a band of adventurers, in this case, higher swords who'd been thrown out of service to wealthy Tetherians for a variety of reasons and gathered as the frost fire banner to seek their fortunes in more easterly lands where their past indiscretions would be less well known. The money offered by Horostos was both good and needed. The banner were ten in all, and numbered among their ranks a pair apiece of mages and warrior priests, yet they went warily. This was unfamiliar country to them, but death knows all lands, intimately and often. So it was that cocked but unloaded crossbows hung across several saddles, though it was bad for the strings, and no one rode carelessly. The forest stayed lovely and deserted. No stags, Arvis grunted once, and his companions, nodding their replies, realized how silent they'd fallen, waiting for the blow to fall. A goodly way west of Starmantle, the road looped around and beneath an exposed spur of rock, an outcropping that pointed out to sea and upward like the prow of some great buried ship. Once the sun sank low and the banner knew they had to turn around, they settled on the rocky prow as their camp. Yon's as good a place as the gods provide, short of bare hilltops. One to watch along the road and down the cliffs, and two to face the forest along the neck of it. Here, tie up our horses below and be damned to anyone trying to use the road by night. And we're set, Roland grunted. Pairiger gave a wordless grunt as his only answer. The tone of that grunt sounded unconvinced. The silence of fear hung heavy over the camp that night, and even feast was eaten in hushed tones. We're as close to death as we've ever been, the halfling muttered as they rolled themselves into their cloaks, laid weapons to hand, and watched the stars come out over the water. Will you belt up about dying? Rolian hissed. No one can come at us unseen. We've set a heavy watch. The dippers and the shields are ready for a fast wakening. What more can we do? Ride out of here and go back to Tether, Arvis said quietly. Yet the camp had grown so still that most of them heard him. Several heads turned, wearing scowls, but no one said a word in reply. Overhead, as deep night came, the stars began to come out in earnest. What's that? Rolian breathed, beside Pairiger's ear. Do you hear it? Of course I hear it, the warrior replied quietly, rising silently to his feet and turning slowly, his drawn blade glinting in the light of the new risen moon. He could hear it best to the west, somewhere very close by, a thin, aimless, chiming sound. A bridle? A bell on a minstrel's instrument? or on the harness of a wayward horse, or the little fey ones come calling. After a moment he took a few cautious crouching steps across the rock spur, picking his way between the still forms of his sleeping fellows. A thin thread of mist was drifting in the lee of the rock spur, strange that, with the moon rising, but there was nothing to be seen, not even sea birds or an owl. In fact, that was why this was so eerie. The woods were still. No scuffling, no night cries or the shrieks of small animals being caught by larger prowlers. Nothing. Pairiger shook his head in puzzlement and turned slowly to go back. There it was again, that faint chiming. He turned back to the west again and became a listening statue. After a time, the chiming was gone. The tall warrior shrugged, glanced down at the horses below the prow, and froze. Where were the horses? He took two quick strides to the other side of the prow, in case they'd all shifted to the east of the overhang. Their lead reins were long enough. But no, they were gone. Rolian, 
he growled, beckoning sharply, and ran along the prow to its very tip, where the still cowled form of Arvis sat facing out to sea, his sword across his knees. Ha! Some watchguard he'd turned out to be. Arvis, he hissed, clapping a heavy hand on the warrior's shoulder. Where are the horses? If you've been drinking again, so help me, I'm good. The shoulder under his hand crumpled like a thing of dry leaves and kindling, and the faceless husk of Arvis pivoted toward him for a moment before collapsing into ash. The man's skull tumbled out to bounce off Peiriger's boot before falling out and down to the road below with a dull clatter. Peiriger almost fell off the spur, recoiling in horror. Then he scrambled back along it to the first of his sleeping companions and turned the blankets back with the point of his blade. A skull grinned up at him. Gods, he sobbed, slashing with his sword tip at the next cloak. His blade caught on the garment and dragged it half off. Bones spilled out in a confusion of ash and collapse. Peiriger knew real gut-wrenching terror for the first time in his life. He wanted to run, anywhere, away from here. Rolian was taking a damned long time to arrive. Peiriger glanced along the spur to where Rolian had been sitting beside him, facing the forest, had been whispering to him only a few breaths ago. Where had... The chiming, coming again only this time from among the wall of dark trees they'd been facing, sounded almost mocking. A little mist was curling around their trunks, and Rolian, Rolian was standing in those trees with his sword in the crook of his arm and the laces of his codpiece in his hands, in the eternal wide-legged pose of men relieving themselves in the woods, facing away into the darkness. But Eriger started to relax, then fresh fear coiled in the pit of his stomach. Rolian was standing very still, too still. Frostfire, awake! Peiriger roared, with all the volume he could muster. The very rocks rang back his shout, and an echo came back faintly from the depths of the forest. He was running as he bellowed back along the spine of the spur toward Rolian, already knowing what he'd find. He came to a stop behind that still form and tried to peer past it. Fangs? Eyes? Waiting blades? Nothing. The moonlight was enough to show him nothing but trees. He stretched out his sword gently. Roll in. The warrior gave a long, formless sigh as he toppled forward into the trees. He broke into three pieces before he hit the ground, his blade bouncing away among dead leaves and left Peiriger staring at a pair of empty boots and a tangle of slumped clothing. Ye bloody, grave-sucking gods! The tall warrior took two quick steps back from that place and spun around. Was he the only one left alive? Had any? But no. He almost shouted with relief. The mage Leorand was on his feet, face pinched with sleepy disapproval, as was the giant among them, slow-witted but loyal Fostral, his full-plate armor making him a gleaming mountain in the moonlight. Two. Two of them all. Something has killed all the others, Peiriger told them tightly. Something that can slay in a moment, and silently. Oh? Laren snarled. Then what's that? It was the chiming again, only loud and insistent now, as if standing in triumph over them. Suddenly the mist was back, sliding past their feet and bringing its own chill with it as it drifted along the spur. Peiriger's eyes narrowed. Larent, he said suddenly, can you hurl fire? Yes, of course, the mage snapped. At who? I... At that! Peiriger shouted, fear making his voice almost a scream. Now! And as if it could hear his words, the mist thickened into bright smoke and struck, snake-like, at Fostral. The giant warrior had raised his blade and moved to challenge it, even before Peiriger's cry. His companions could only see his back and hear a faint sighing. Was that a sizzle at the heart of it? A gurgle? In the instant before his blade fell from his hand? The gauntlet went with it, and nothing was left behind. The vambrace ended in a stump. Then slowly, Fostral turned to face his companions. His helm was empty, his head entirely burnt away. But something was filling it, or at least holding it where it should be, above the armored wall of the warrior's chest. 
the thing that had been Fostral staggered toward them, moving slowly and tentatively. The mage stepped back and started to stammer out a spell. Instantly, the gigantic armored form turned toward him and toppled, crashing down on its face, or where its face had been, as a white whirlwind boiled up out of it, chiming. Pairiger shouted in fear, waving his sword and knowing it would avail him nothing, but Leorind shrieked and sprinted the length of the spur with the mist thing in cold and chiming pursuit. The mage never tried to turn and fight. He ran as fast as he could and leaped high and far out over the road to somewhere above the cliffs beyond, where he howled all the way down to a wet and splintering end. So that was a despairing death. Pairiger swallowed. What better would a heroic one be? And how would any minstrel know once he was bones and ash? The whirlwind came back along the spur, slowly chiming, almost coyly, as if it was toying with him. The tall warrior set his jaw and raised his sword. When he judged the mist was near enough, he slashed at it and danced to one side, then planted himself to drive a vicious backhand back through its chiming whiteness. Unsurprisingly, his blade met nothing, though its edge seemed to acquire a line of sparks. Even as he noticed them, in his frantic trot along the spur, they winked out. He circled, tripping on someone's helm and almost falling, to lash out with his blade again. Once more he clove nothing, gasped his way aside from looming mist, and slashed through it again with the same utter lack of effect. The mist swirled, leaping over his head, and he dodged aside to avoid having it fall on him. It continued its sinuous rush, curving around his vainly thrusting blade to dart in along his sword arm. At the last instant, it turned into him rather than grazing past, and blazing agony exploded through him. Pairiger was dazedly aware that he was screaming and staggering away vainly slapping at empty air with his arm. His only arm. Nothing remained on the other side but a twisted mass of seared flesh and leather, all melted together. There was no blood, but there was no arm left at all. His sword arm. Pairiger looked wildly about as the ribbon of mist floated almost mockingly past and saw his sword lying atop a huddled mess that had once been a priest of Timora. Much good Lady Luck had brought them all, to be sure. He ran unsteadily, not used to one side of him being a lot lighter than the other, over to his blade and scooped it up. He was still straightening when the burning pain came again, and he fell heavily onto his tailbone on the rock, watching an empty boot spin away. It had taken his leg. He struggled to rise, to move at all, his remaining boot heel kicking vainly against the uneven stone, and waved his blade defiantly. The mist closed in, and he made of himself a desperate whirlwind, spinning around and around with his blade constantly slashing the air. He rang it off the stone around him twice, once hard enough to chip the edge, and cared not. He was going to die here. What good is a pristine blade to a dead man? The mist came at him again in an almost gloating dive, its chiming rising around him as he twisted and slashed desperately. When the burning came again, it was in his intact thigh, and he was rolling helplessly over, flailing at nothing with his useless sword. One limb at a time. It was toying with him. Was he going to be reduced to a helpless torso, unable to do anything but stare as it slew him very slowly? A few panting breaths later, as he stared up at the uncaring stars through swimming eyes, he knew the answer was going to be yes. He wondered just how long the mist would make him suffer, then decided he was past caring. Almost his last thought was a rueful realization that all who die slowly enough to know what is happening must come to a place beyond caring. He was... He was Pairiger Amaether Donless, and he had come to this cold end here on a rock in the wilderlands of the accursed High Duchy of Langalos in the early summer of the year 767, as Dale Reckoning ran, with no one to mourn or mark his passing and his dead comrades all around him. 
Well, have my thanks, all you vigilant gods. Peiriger's last thought was that he really should remember the name of that star. And that one, too. The crypt of the Moondark family was overgrown with brambles, creepers, and contorted curving trees deformed by warding enchantments that were still strong after centuries. The Moondark house, a happy mingling of elf and human blood, had been known for its fell sorcery, but no Moondarks had walked Faroon for something like 116 winters, and Westgate was quite content about that. No more powerful spells that might challenge a king or discomfit self-styled nobles, and no more need to be polite to half-bloods who were graceful, handsome, learned, bright, all too merry, and all too insistent on fairness and honesty in ruling. There was even a sign, much more recent than the spell-locked gates, Behold the ending of all who insist too much. Elminster smiled grimly at that little moral notice. It was the first thing to crumble into dust at the touch of his most powerful spell. The long, untested wards beyond were the next thing. Dawn was almost upon Westgate, and he wanted to be safely inside the tomb house before folk took to the streets. The guards at the corner were still yawning and dozing against the outer wall of the crypt as Elminster slipped inside. On his short walk along the statue-flanked path to the doors of the pillared tomb house, El's magic burnt away an astonishing number of magical triggers and traps, an odd thing for one in the service of Mistra to practice, but then Mistra dealt in a healthy array of odd things. What he was here to do was one of his most important tasks as a chosen, one he spent a lot of time at these days one that seemed to awaken an almost girlish glee in the Lady of Mysteries. Elminster Omar would do anything to see her smiling so. The door wards, falling beam trap and weave of jutting blade traps were all to be expected, were anticipated, and were dealt with in but a few seconds. The fact that folk from time to time had to enter a family tomb for legitimate purposes, burials, not thefts, meant that such defenses had to be of a lesser order. In a matter of a few calm breaths, Elminster was inside the dark chamber with the door shut and spell sealed behind him, and a radiance of his own making awakening everywhere along the low cobwebbed ceiling. Moondarks lay crumbling on all sides of him in stacked stone coffers that must have numbered nearly a hundred. The oldest ones were the largest, carved with ornate scenes along the sides, their lids effigies of the deceased. The more recent ones were plain stone boxes, some lacking even names. Thankfully, none were stirring in undeath. He was running late as it was, and never liked to hurry the fun part. The bright and wealthy moondarks had even been considerate enough to leave a funeral slab in the center of the crypt, a high table on which the coffin of the most recently dead could lie during a last service of remembrance, before it was muscled on to one of the stacks of the dead that lined the walls to be left undisturbed forever, or at least until a clever chosen of Mistra happened along. Elminster hummed a tune of lost myth Dranner as he laid out his cloak on the empty slab, a large but nondescript lined leather cloak that wasn't much of any color anymore and sported more than the usual assortment of patches. The inside of the cloak bore several large crude pockets, though they seemed flat and empty as Al patted them affectionately, then turned away to wander around the chamber peering at dark corners, particular caskets, and even the underside of the funeral slab. When he returned from his stroll, he slid his fingers into an upper pocket and drew forth a lacing-wrapped flask full of an amber liquid. Holding it up, he murmured, Mistra, to thee, as always, a pale shadow of the fire of thy touch. A long, gasping pull later, El stoppered the flask, sighed contentedly, and put it away again in a pocket that still looked empty. 
he dug in the next empty pocket with both hands and drew forth a wand in a shabby, almost crumbling, wyvern skin case. He'd spent two careful spells and a lot of running around, trailing the case along the rough stone blocks of an old castle wall, getting the case to look this elderly. He was even prouder of the wand, discolored by decades of handling that he'd accomplished in a few minutes with goose grease, sand, and soot. Now Air Gladden Moondark had died destitute, begging his kin for a few coppers with which to buy a roasting fowl. But who save one Elminster was still alive to remember that? So accomplished a mage as Air Gladden could quite well have had a wand, and of course a spell book. El reached back into the empty pocket and pulled forth a worn and bulky tome with huge, much-battered brass corners, that he hadn't sold in his last year of life after all. Not to mention the usual dagger enchanted so as not to rust or go dull, and to glow upon command. These enchantments were made to last, say, three centuries by a higher caste elven long-look spell from one of the poorer Mithdranen apprentices. Aye, so. El calmly lifted the lid of Air Gladden's casket, murmured, well met, Master Mage of the Moondarks, and gently laid the wand, dagger, and spell book in the proper places around the mummified skeleton that had been Air Gladden. Then he closed the casket and went back to the cloak for a few scrolls, on carefully aged parchment, and a battered little book of magical observations, copied runes, and half-finished spells that should lead even a half-wit to the creation of a spell that would temporarily imbue the non-magically gifted with the ability to carry and cast a spell placed in them by a mage. This work took up much of his time in the service of Mistra these days. At her bidding, Elminster traveled Faroon visiting ruins and the tombs of dead mages, planting old scrolls, spell books, minor enchanted items, and even the occasional staff for later folk to find, and all such leavings were in truth items he'd just finished crafting and made to look old. Almost always part of the treasures he left for others included notes that should lead anyone with a gift for magic to experiment and successfully create a new spell. Mr. cared not over much who found these magics or how they used them, so long as ever more magic was in use, and ever more folk could wield it, rather than a few arch-wizards lording it over the spell-poor or magically barren, as had happened in the days of lost Netheril. El loved this sort of work, and always had to fight a tendency to linger in the ruins and crypts, mischievously letting his lights and spell effects be seen by others to lure exploring adventurers toward his leavings. About as subtle as an orc horde, Mistra had once termed these tactics, pouting prettily, and El knew she was right. Wherefore today he firmly took up his cloak, worked the powerful spell Azuth had given him that obliterated all traces or magical echoes of his visit, and left in the form of a shadow. The thoughtful shadow restored a few of the wards and traps in his wake before he slipped back out onto the street inches distant from the back of a guard whose attention was on a gold coin that seemed to have fallen from the sky moments before. Unnoticed, the shadow turned solid and strolled away. The cloaked, hawk-nosed figure had been gone from sight around a corner for exactly the time it took to draw in a single good deep breath, when a dark horse came trotting through the steady stream of walking folk and clopped to a halt in front of the guard. That worthy looked up, raising an eyebrow in both query and challenge, to see a young maroon-robed elf in a rich cloak peering down at the coin in the guard's weathered palm. The guard closed his fingers around it hastily and said, Aye, what do you want, outlander? Myth Drannan, was it not? the elf asked softly. Found hereabouts? The guard flushed. Paid to me fair and square, more like he rumbled. The elf nodded, his gaze now lingering long and considering on the overgrown crypt the guard was standing duty in front of. The Moondarks, that bastard house of dabbling mages, 
and all of them who'd found their way home to die now shared a stone tomb house, such as humans favor, in good repair by the looks of it, with its wards still up. It was closed up much too securely for inquisitive birds or scurrying squirrels to pluck up a gold coin and carry it outside the walls. His eyes narrowed, and his face grew as sharp as honed flint, causing the guard to warily raise his weapon and shrink back behind it. Ilbrin Starum dropped the man a mirthless and absent-minded smile and rode on toward the stars and sword. Wizards who came to Westgate always stayed at the swords, in hopes of being there when Alshinri wandered in and did her trance dance. Alshinri was getting old and a bit gaunt now. Her dances weren't the affairs they'd once been, with the house crowded with hungrily staring men. Her dance, too, was usually just so much play-acting and drunken mumbling. But sometimes, a little more often than once a month, it happened and entranced Al Shinri uttered words of spells not known since Netheril fell, advice that might have come from the Lady of Mysteries herself, and detailed instructions as to the whereabouts, traps, and even contents of certain archmages' tombs, ruined schools of wizardry, sorcerous caches, and even long-forgotten abandoned temples to Mistra. Bad things happened to mages who so much as spoke to Alshinri outside the sword, or who tried to coerce or pester her within its walls. So they contented themselves with booking rooms at the inn so often that some of them could be considered to have been living there. Even if a certain human mage, one Elminster, formerly court mage of Galadorna, before the fall of that realm, had not taken a room at the sword, it held the best gathering of folk in Westgate, who might just have seen him hereabouts or heard something of his deeds and current doings. The hard looks thrown his way by every guard and many merchants he passed suddenly hit home. Ilbrin blinked, looked all around, and found that he was galloping his startled mount down the street, its hooves slipping and sliding on the cobbles. He reined in and settled the horse into a careful walk thereafter. The bright, sparkling, spell-animated sign of the stars and sword loomed ahead, and the champion of Starim Honor steered his mount through the bustling folk to, he hoped, some answers, or even the man he sought. As he gathered the reins together in one hand to free the other for the bell pull that would summon hostlers to see to his horse, Ilbrin discovered that something he carried in a belt pouch had found its way into his hand, and it was now clenched there, a scrap of red cloth that had been part of the mantle of office of the court mage of Galandorna, Elminster's mantle. The elf looked down at it, and although his hand remained rock-steady, his handsome face slowly slipped into a stony, brooding mask. His eyes held such glittering menace that both hostlers recoiled and had to be coaxed back. As he swung himself down from the saddle and reached for the handle of the sword's finely carved front door, Ilbrin Starim smiled softly. And as one of the hostlers put it, that were worse than his glaring. Still smiling, Ilbrin put one hand, the one flickering with the risen radiance of a ready deadly spell, behind his back and with the other opened the door and went in. The hostlers lingered, half expecting to hear a terrific crash or smoke or even bodies hurled out through the windows, but their hoped-for entertainment never came. 12. The Empty Throne It must bother most wizards a lot that for all their spells they can't seize immortality. Many try to become gods, but few succeed. For this, let us all be very thankful. Sambrin Ugraithen, Lord Sage of Samarish, from The View from Stormwind Hill, published circa the Year of the Gate. Far to the east of Westgate, even as a smiling elf slipped into an inn expecting trouble, a mist drifted through an old, deep forest. It was a mist that sparkled and chimed as it went, moving purposefully through the trees. 
Sometimes it rose up into an almost humanoid striding form, bulking tall, thick, and strong. At other times it moved like an ever-leaping, undulating snake. No birds called in the shade around it, and nothing rustled in the dead leaves underfoot. Only its own whirling breezes stirred the creepers and tatters of hanging moss it wound its way through. Silence ruled the forest it traversed. This was no wonder. Early chiming hungers had left not a creature alive in that part of the forest to witness its haste. The chiming mist had left the graveyard of the Frostfire Banner far behind, moving for miles along the deserted road to a place where most eyes would have missed the sapling-studded overgrown remnants of a lane turning off into the woods. The mist drifted along the dips and turns of that road, passing like eager smoke across crumbling stone bridges that took the road across rivulets to the deep green place where the road ended and the ruins began. The lines of gigantic old trees flanking the overgrown road gave way to a litter of creeper-shrouded sagging wagons and coaches. Beyond lay thickets at their hearts overgrown mounds that had once been stables and cottages. Beyond the thickets rose shadow tops so tall that their gloom choked away thickets and lay in endless shadow over the rotting ruin of a drawbridge across a deep muddy cleft that had once been a moat and the stone pillars or teeth within the moat that had once been the stout buttresses of most fallen walls, walls that had once frowned down on Faroon from a great height, formed a massive keep. The long-fallen fortress was more forest and tumbled stone now than a building. The mist moved purposefully through the tangle of leaning trees and creepers that grew in its inner spaces, as if it knew what chambers could be found where. As it went, the walls became taller. Here and there ceilings or roofing had survived, though all of the archways gaped open and doorless, and there were no signs that anyone or anything dwelt within. The mist came to a gently chiming halt in a chamber that had once been large and grand indeed. Gaps in its walls showed the forest just outside, but there was still a ceiling and even furniture. A rotting canopied bed larger than many stable stalls stood with ornate gilded bedposts and cloth of gold glinting among the green mildew fur of its bedding. Close by stood a lounge, canted over where one leg had broken, and beyond that several stools were enthusiastically growing mushrooms. A little way farther on, across the cracked marble floor, a peeling man-high oval mirror stood beside a sagging row of wardrobes. Water was dripping down onto what had once been a grand table in another part of the room, and beyond it, in the darkest, best-roofed rear of the chamber, stood a ring-shaped parapet. Within the knee-high circular wall was only deeper darkness, and when the mist began to move, it headed straight for this well. As it approached, sudden flashes of light occurred in the air above the parapet. The mist hesitated, rose a little higher, and ventured closer to the well. The radiance reached for it, brightening, and was echoed by similar glows that crawled snake-like along the stone walls and the surrounding floor, outlining hitherto invisible runes and symbols. The mist danced for a moment among these flame-like tongues of silent light, then swooped in a plunge that took it right down into the well. Elaborate traceries of magic flashed and flared into visibility for a moment as the mist arrowed past, seeming to lash and claw at it, but when it had disappeared down the well, these fading remnants of guardian spells lapsed into quiescence once more. The shaft was a good distance across and fell straight down, a long and lightless way. It ended in a floor of uneven natural stone, one end of a vast and dark natural cavern. The mist moved into this velvet void with the confidence of someone who moves through utter darkness to a familiar spot. It chimed softly as its own faint radiance revealed something in the emptiness ahead. A tall, empty stone seat facing it as it approached. 
The mist stopped before it reached the man-sized throne and hovered above a semicircle of large, complex runes that were graven into the floor in front of the throne. If the throne had been the center seat of a barge facing ahead, the runes formed the rounded prow of the barge. The mist seemed to linger for a time in thought, then the breeze of its movements suddenly quickened into a brisk whirlwind, spiraling around and around as it sparkled and chimed. As it swept up to violent speed, dust rose and whirled with it, pebbles rolled at its bidding, and the whirlwind rose into a horned, shifting column. Arms it grew, and absorbed again, then humps or moving lumps that might have been heads or might have been other things, before it flashed once, then grew very dim. No whirlwind or snake of mist now glowed in the darkness. Where the mist had been stood the translucent, ghostly shape of a tall, thin woman in a plain robe, her feet and arms bare, her hair a knee-length, unruly tangle, her eyes rather wild. She threw up her arms in triumph or glee, and mad laughter broke out of her, harsh and high and shrill, echoing back from dark and unseen stony crevices. You dare to doubt visions sent by Our Lady who sings in darkness? the voice from behind the veil asked in dry tones. That sounds perilously close to heresy, or even unbelief to me. No, no, dread sister, a second female voice replied, a trifle too hastily. My wits fail me, a personal flaw, no act of unbelief or discourtesy to the night singer. And I cannot see why this shrine must be established in the depths of a wood, where none dwell and none will know of its existence or location. It is needful, the veiled voice replied. Lie down upon the slab. You shall not be chained. Your faith shall be demonstrated by your remaining in place upon it while the owl bear feeds. Offer yourself to it without resistance, and be free of fear. My spells shall keep you alive whatever it devours of you, and no matter how painful it seems, no matter what wounds you sustain, you shall be restored wholly when the rite is done. I have survived such a ritual in my day, and so have a select few here. To do this is a mark of true honor. The blood of someone so loyal is the best consecration we can offer the dread mistress of all. Yes, dread sister, the under-priestess whispered, and the trembling of her body could be heard in her voice. Will, will I? Will my mind be untouched by watching something eat me? Her voice rose into what was almost a shrill shriek of horror at the thought. Well, dread sister, the veiled voice purred calmly, that is up to you. The slab awaits. Dearest of those I've guided, make me proud this day, not ashamed. I shall be watching you, and so shall one who is far, far greater than any of us shall ever be. By Mistress Smile, that feels good, Beldrune said wonderingly, as he stretched and wiggled his fingers experimentally. I do feel younger. All the aches are gone. He swung himself up to a sitting position, rubbing at his face around his eyes, and from between his fingers fixed Tabarist with a level look. Truth time, trusted colleague of the Arcane, he said firmly. Wizards of a certain standing don't just find new spells on hitherto blank back pages of their spell books. Where did it really come from? Tabarist of the Three Sung Curses looked back over the tops of his thumb-smudged spectacles rather severely. You grow not old gracefully, most highly regarded Droon. I detect a growing and decidedly unattractive tendency in yourself to open disbelief in the testimony of your wiser elders. Crush this flaw, my boy, while yet you retain some friendly relations with folk who can serve as your wiser elders. For tis sure that, given your advancing age and wisdom, these are few, and shall be fewer henceforth." The older wizard took a few thoughtful paces away, scratching the bridge of his nose. I did indeed just find it on a page that has always been blank, 
that I have looked to fill with a spell puissant enough to be worthy of the writing these last three decades. I know not how it came to be there, but I believe, I can only believe, that the sacred hand of the lady is involved somehow. Spare me the hearing, the spittle and drawn breath of your usual lecture on Mistress Utter and Everlasting Refusal to Give Magic to Mortals. Beldrune blinked. Tabarist waited, carefully not smiling. Very well, the younger mage said after a pause that seemed longer than it truly was. But you leave me now with very little to say. Some silences, I fear, are going to stretch. Then Tabarist did smile an instant before asking in innocent tones, Is that a promise? Fortunately, a rejuvenated bell droon of the bent finger proved to be every bit as a bad shot with hurled pillows as the old one had been. Though not a living creature could be seen in the deep shade of the duskwoods, here where their trunks stood so close together that they might have been gigantic blades of grass, the lone human could feel that someone was watching him, someone very near. Swallowing, he decided to take a chance. Is this the place men call Tangle Trees? He asked the air calmly, sitting down on the huge and moss-covered curve of a fallen tree trunk and setting his smooth-worn staff aside. It is, came a grave reply in a voice so light and melodious that it could only have been elven. Umbregard, once of Galadorna, resisted his instinctive desire to turn toward where the voice seemed to have come from, to see who might be there. Instead, he smiled and held out his hands, empty palms upward. I come in peace without fire or any ill will or desire to despoil. I come seeking only answers. A deep, liquid chuckle came to his ears, then the words, So do we all, man, and the most fortunate of us find a few of them. Be my guest for a time, in safety and at ease. Rise and go around the two entwined trees to your right, down into the hollow. Its water, I suspect, will be the purest yet to pass your lips. My thanks, Umbregard replied and meant it. The hollow was cold and as dark as a cave. Here the leaves met close overhead, and no sun at all touched the earth. Faintly glowing fungi gave off just enough light to see a stone at the edge of the little pool and a crystal goblet waiting on it. For my use? the human mage asked. Of course, the calm voice replied, coming from everywhere and nowhere. Do you fear enslaving enchantments or elven trickery? No, Umbregard replied. Rather, I do not want to give offense by seizing things over boldly. He took up the goblet. It was cool to the touch, and somehow softer in his fingers than it should have been, dipped it into the pool, and drank. As the ripples chased each other across the water, he thought he saw in them a sad, dark-eyed elf face regarding him for a moment, but if it had ever truly been there, it was gone in the next instant. The water was good, and seemed at once both invigorating and soothing. The man let it slide down his throat, closed his eyes, and gave himself over to silent enjoyment. Somewhere a bird called and was answered. It was all very peaceful. He sat up with a start, fearing for one awful moment that he had slept under an elven spell and carefully set the goblet back on the stone where he'd found it. My thanks, he said again. The water was every bit as you said it would be. Know that I am Umbregard, once of Galadorna, and have fled far since that realm fell. I work magic, though I can boast no great power, and I have prayed to Mistra, the goddess of magic humans venerate, often in my travels. And what have you prayed to her for? The elven voice asked in tones of pleasant interest, sounding very close. Again Umbregard quelled the urge to turn and look at its source. Guidance in what good and fitting things magic can be used for, 
to build a life for one who is not interested in using spells as blades to threaten or thrust into others, he replied. Galadorna, before its fall, had become a nest of spell-hurling vipers, each striving to bring rivals down and not caring what waste and ruin they wrought in the doing. I will not be like that. Well said, the elf said, and Umbregard heard the goblet being dipped then lifted up out of the pool. Yet it is a long and hard wandering through the shadowed wood for one of your kind to hear. What brought you hence? Mistra showed me the way, and this duskwood grove, Umbregard replied. I knew not who I'd meet here, but I suspected it would be an elf, once of Myth Dranner for such a one would know what it was to choose a path after the fall of your home and all you held dear. He could clearly hear a wince in the elven voice as it replied, You certainly have the gift of speaking plainly, Umbregard. I mean no offense, the human mage replied, turning quickly and offering his hand. A moon elf male in a dark blue open front shirt and high-booted tight leather breeches was sitting perhaps another handspan away, the goblet raised in his hand. He seemed weaponless, though two small objects, black teardrop-shaped gemstones that twinkled like two dark stars, floated in the air above his left shoulder. He smiled into Umbregard's wonderstruck eyes and said, I know. I am also known among my folk for my uncommon bluntness. I am called in your tongue... Star Sunder, a star fell from the sky at the moment of my birth, though I doubt whatever it heralded had anything at all to do with me. The human mage gasped, shrank back, and said, That's one of the... The elf's eyebrow lifted. Yes? he asked. Or blurt you out a secret you must now try to keep. Umbregard blushed. Ah, uh, no, no, he said. That's one of the sayings of the priests of Mistra. Seek you one for whom the stars fell, for he speaks truth. Starsunder blinked. Oh, dear, my role, it seems, is laid out for me, the elf said with a smile, drained the goblet, and set it down on the stone just as carefully as Umbregard had done. In soft silence, it promptly vanished. What truths have you come to hear? the elf asked. And in that moment, Umbregard came to understand that the lacing of laughter in an elf's voice is not always mockery. He hesitated for a moment, then said, Some in Galadorna whispered that the man Elminster, who was our last court mage, also lived in Myth Dranor long ago, and worked dark magic there. I know this is a human I ask about, and that I presume overmuch, why should you freely yield secrets to me at all? But I must know, if humans can live long years as elves do, how and why? At what tasks should they spend all this time? Starsunder held up a hand. The flood begins, he joked. Hold at these for now, lest your remembrance of answers I give be lost in the rushing stream of your next query, and the one to follow, and so on. He smiled and leaned back against a tree root. To your first? Yes, the same man named Elminster dwelt in Myth Dranor from before the laying of its mythal to some time after, learning and working much magic. Those who hated the idea of a human thrusting his way in among us elves, for he was the first, or among the first, and many folk who came to Myth Dranor once it was open to all, and envied him his power, might have termed some of his castings dark, but I cannot in truth judge them so, or his reasons for working this or that enchantment. Umbregard opened his mouth to speak, but Starsunder chuckled and threw up a hand to still him. Not yet, please. Bald and important truths shouldn't be rushed. Umbregard flushed then smiled and sat back, gesturing to the elf to continue. There was a twinkle in Star Sunder's eyes as he spoke again. Humans who master magic enough, or rather think they've mastered magic enough, 
try many ways to outlive their usual span of years. Most of these, from lichdom to elixirs, are flawed in that they twist the essential nature of persons using them. They become new, and many would judge I among them, lesser beings in the process. If you ask me how you could live longer, I would say the only unsustained way to do so, though it will change you as surely as the lesser ways, is the one Elminster has taken, or perhaps been led into. I know not if he ardently sought it and worked toward it, drifted into it, or was forced or pushed into it. He serves Mistra as a special servant, doing her bidding in exchange for longevity, special status and powers to boot. I believe he is called a chosen of the goddess. How did he get to be chosen for this service? Umbregard asked slowly. Do you know? I know not. Starsunder replied, but I do know how he has continued it for what to humans is a very long time. Love. Love? Mistra loves him, and he loves her. There was a disbelief or incredulity in the confusion written plainly on the human mage's face, so Starsunder added gently, Yes. Beyond fondness and friendship and the raging desires of the flesh, true, deep, and lasting love. It is hard to believe this until you've truly felt it, Umbregard. But listen to me. There is a power in love greater than most things that can touch humans, or elves, or orcs for that matter. A power for good and for ill. Like all things of such power, Love is very dangerous. Dangerous? Starsunder smiled faintly and said, Love is a flame that sets fire to things. It is a greater danger to mages than any miscast spell can ever hope to be. He leaned forward to lay a hand on Umbregard's arm and said almost fiercely as they stared into each other's eyes, Magic gone awry can merely kill a mage. Love can remake him and drive him to remake the world. Our coronal's great love drove him to seek a way for Cormanthir that remade it, and most of my folk would say, in the end, destroyed it. I was yet young one warm night, out swimming for a lark, with no magic of my own to be felt, something that probably kept me alive then, when the great lady of the Starim, Ildenaintra, who had loved the coronal and been loved by him, slew herself to try to bring about his death, driven by her love for our land, just as he was, and both of them seared in their striving by their denied yet thriving love for each other. The moon elf sighed and shook his head. You cannot feel the sadness that stirs in me when I hear them again in my head, arguing together, and you are the first human after Elminster to know of that night. Mind and mark, Umbregard, to speak of this secret to others of my kind may mean your swift death. I shall heed, Umbregard whispered. Say on. The elf smiled wryly and continued. There's little more to say. Mistra chose this Elminster to serve her, and he has done well where others have not. The gods make us all different, and more of us fail than succeed. Elminster has failed often, but his love has not, and he has remained at his task. Bravery, I think your bards term it. Bravery? How can one armored and aided by a god fear anything? Without fear to wrestle with and reconquer again and again, where is bravery? Umbregard asked, excitement making him bold. Something like fondness danced in Starsunder's eyes as he replied, There are many gods. Divine favor marks a mortal for greater danger than his ordinary fellow, and is very seldom a sure defense against the perils of this world or any other. Only fools trust in the gods so much that they set aside fear entirely and dismiss or do not see the dangers. I have seen bravery among your kind often. It seems something humans are good at, 
though more often I see in them recklessness or foolish disregard for danger that others who see less well might term bravery. So what is bravery? Umbregard asked. Standing in the path of danger? Yes. Staying at one's post or task as diligent as ever, knowing that at any time the sword waiting overhead may fall, or seeing fast approaching doom and not abandoning all to flee. Please know that I mean no disrespect, but I must know. If such is bravery, how is it, Umbregard whispered, fear in his own eyes at his own daring, that Myth Dranner, Cormanthir, fell, and you still live? Starsunder's answering smile held sadness. A race and a realm need obedient fools to survive, even more than they need brave and soon-dead heroes. He stood up and made a movement with his hand that might have been a wave of farewell. You can see which I must be. If ever you meet this Elminster of yours face to face, ask him which of the two he is, and bring back his answer to me. I must know all. It is my failing. Like a graceful panther, he padded up out of the hollow into the duskwood grove above. Wait, the human mage protested, rising and stumbling up into the trees in the elf's wake. I've so much more to ask. Must you go? Only to prepare a place for a human to snore and a meal for us both, Star Sunder replied. You are welcome to stay and ask all the questions you can think of for as long as you want to tarry here. I've few friends left here among the living and this side of the sundering seas. Umbregard found himself trembling. I would be honored to be considered your friend, he said carefully, and found himself trembling. But I must ask this. How can you trust me so? We've but spoken for a few moments of your time no more. How can you measure me? I could be a slayer of elves, a hunter of elven treasure, an elfbane. I give you my word I am no such thing, but I fear human promises to elves have all too often rung empty down the years. Star Sunder smiled. This grove is sacred to two gods of my kind, Sehenine and Rilifane, he said. They have judged you. Behold. The eyes of the human wizard followed the elf's pointing hand to the moss-covered fallen tree and the wooden staff leaning there. Umbregard knew its familiar well-worn length as well as he knew the hand that held it. That staff had accompanied him for thousands of miles walking Faroon and was both old and fire-hardened, its ends bound shod with copper to keep them from splitting. Yet for all that, while he'd sat talking in the hollow, it had thrown forth green shoots in plenty up and down its length, and every shoot ended in a small, beautiful white flower glowing in the shade. In a colder darkness, a ghostly woman stopped laughing and let her hands fall. The echoes of her cold mirth rolled around the cavern for some time, while she looked around at its dark vastness, almost as if seeing it for the first time, her eyes slowly becoming sharp and fierce and fiery. They were two glittering flames when she moved at last, striding with cat-like confident grace to a particular rune. She touched the symbol firmly with one foot, watched it fill with a bright blue-white glow, then stood with arms folded, watching, as wisps of smoke rose from the radiance to form a cloud like a man-sized spark, a cloud that suddenly coalesced into something else, a legless, floating image of a youngish-looking man, eager and intensive manner, faced the empty throne, hanging in mid-air above the rune that had spawned it. As the image began to speak, the ghostly woman strode around the runes to the throne, leaned on one arm of that seat, and watched the image's speech. It wore robes of rich crimson trimmed with black, and gold rings gleamed on its fingers, their hue matched by the blazing gold of the man's eyes. He had tousled brown hair and the untidy beginnings of a beard, and his voice fairly leaped with eager confidence. I am Carsis, as you are Carsis, 
If you behold this, disaster has befallen me, the first Carsus, and you, the second, must carry on to glory. The image seemed to pace forward but actually remained above the rune. It waved one hand restlessly and continued, I know not what you recall of my, our life. Some say my mind is less than clear these days. Know that many mages of our people have achieved great power. Mightiest of these, the arch-wizards of Netheril, rule their own domains. Mine, like many, is a floating city. I named it for us. I am the most powerful of all the arch-wizards, the Arcanist Supreme. They call me Carsus the Great. The image waved a dismissive hand, blazing eyes still fixed on the throne. The ghostly woman was murmuring along with the words she'd obviously heard many times before. Something that might have been a faint sneer played about her lips. Of course, the image went on, given your awakening, none of that may mean anything. I may not have been slain by a rival or suffered a purely personal doom. Carsis, the city, and the glory of Netheril itself may have fallen in a great war or cataclysm. We have made many foes, the greatest of them ourselves. We war among ourselves, we Netherese, and some of us war within ourselves. My wits are not always wholly my own. You may well share this affliction, watch for it, and guard against it. The image of Carsis smiled, arching a sardonic eyebrow, the ghostly woman smiled back. Carsis spoke on. Perhaps you'll have no need of these recording spells of mine, but I've prepared one for each speculum you see on the floor in this place, a series of spell-casting lessons, lest you face the perils of this world lacking certain enchantments I've found crucial. Our work must continue. Only through power absolute can I, we, find perfection, and Carsis exists has always existed to achieve perfection and transform all Toral. The watching woman laughed at that, a short and unpleasant bark. <laughs> Mad indeed, Carsus. Destiny, reshape all Toral. Oh, you were certainly competent to do that. Your first need may now be for physical healing, and I have anticipated the recurrence of this need in time to come. In a life where you may lack loyal servant mages or anyone you can trust, know then that touching the speculum that evoked this image of me while speaking the word Dalabrindar will heal all hurts. This power can be called upon as often as desired for so long as this rune remains unbroken and can so serve anyone who speaks thus. The word is the name of the wizard who died so that this spell might live. Truly, he has served us well and... Wasted words, Carsus, the ghostly woman sneered. Your clone was a headless mummy decorating this throne when I first saw it. Who slew it here, I wonder? Mistra? Azuth? Some rival? Or did the great and supreme sleeping Carsus fall to a passing adventure mage of puny spells who thought he was beheading a lich? Many other spell will serve where these do not but I have here preserved demonstrations of my casting of enchantments of lasting usefulness and— The ghostly woman turned away from the words she'd heard so many times before, nodding in satisfaction. They'll do, they'll do indeed. I have here a lure no mage can resist. She strode across the rune again, and the image vanished in mid-word the radiance winking out of the graven stone to let darkness rush back into the cavern. Now how to let living mages know of it, without causing them to crowd in here by the elbowing thousands? Ghostly lips asked the utter darkness. The darkness did not answer back. A frowning ghost strode to the bottom of the shaft and began to blur, unraveling in a spiraling wind of her own making, until once more a whirlwind of flickering lights danced in the darkness, spiraling slowly up the shaft. And how to keep my mage catches here for more than one night? At the top of the shaft, the chiming whirl of lights hovered over the well ring, and a soft, echoing voice issued from it. I must weave mighty spells to be sure. The runes must respond only to me, and then only one a month no matter what means are tried. That should cause a young mage to linger here long enough. 
With sudden vigor, the mist darted to one of the rents in the walls and plunged through it, snaking through the trees, trailing wild laughter and the exultant shout, Long enough for a good feed! 13. Kindness Scorches Stone Cruelty is a known scourge, too seldom clever, for which we should all thank the gods. Kindness is the stronger blade, though more often scorned. Most folk never learn that. Raldric Hallowshaw, Gesture From To Rule a Realm, From Turret to Midden Published circa the year of the Bloodbird The tall, thin stranger who'd given them a cheerful smile as he'd gone into the maid was back out again in far less time than it took to drain a tankard. The two old men on the bench squinted up at him a mite suspiciously. Folk seldom turned their way, which is why it was their favorite bench. It sat in the full shadow of the increasingly ramshackle porch of the fair maid of Ripplestones. A cold corner, but at least it wasn't in the full dazzle of the morning sun. The stranger was, though, his face outlined in gold as he tossed his nondescript cloak back to lay bare dark and dusty robes and breeches that bore no badge or adornment, as... Wonders of the realms? Alniscaver came bustling out with the best folding table and chair and food. The tavern master shuttled back and forth, puffing, as the two old men watched a meal the likes of which they'd not seen in many a year accumulate under their very noses. A tureen of the hot soup that had been making the two old bellies rumble all morn, a block of the sharpest red ruck cheese, and three grouse pies. Bear Daw and Calidaster scratched at various itches and glared sourly at the hawk-nosed stranger, wondering why by all the angry gods he'd had to choose their bench as the place to set his morn feast on. Everything they'd dreamed of being able to afford for months now was steaming away under their noses. Just who by the armpit of Tempest did he think he was, anyway? The two old men exchanged looks as their all-too-empty bellies rumbled, then with one accord stared the stranger up and down. No weapon, not much wealth either by the looks of him, though his travel-scuffed boots were very fine. An outlaw who'd had them off someone he knifed? Aye, that would fit with all the money thrown out on a huge meal like this, coming down out of the wilderlands as starving and with stolen coins aplenty. Now Alney Scaver was back with the haunch of venison they'd smelled cooking all yester eve, all laid out cold amid pickled onions and sliced tongue and such like, on the platter used when the high duke came by. It was too much to bear, arrogant young bastard. Shaking his head, Bairdaw spat pointedly into the dust by the stranger's boots to get out and away before this young glutton tucked into such a feast as this under their very noses and drove him and his empty vitals wild. Calidaster was in the way, though, and slower to move, so the two old men were still shifting their behinds along the bench when the tavern master came back again with a keg of beer and tankards. Three tankards! The stranger sat down and grinned at Bairdaw as the old man looked up with the first glimmers of amazement dawning on his face. "'Well met, good sirs,' he said politely. "'Please forgive my boldness, but I'm hungry. I hate to eat alone, and I need to talk to someone who knows a fair bit about the old days of Ripplestones. Ye look to have the wits and years enough. What say we make a deal? We three share this, and eat freely, no stinting.' Ye keeping whatever we don't eat now, and ye give me, as best ye know, answers to a few questions about a lady who used to live hereabouts. Who are you? Bairdaw asked bluntly, at about the same time as Calidaster said under his breath, I don't like this. Meals don't just fall out of the sky. He must have paid all Niscover to get even a quarter of this out here on a table. But what's to say we won't have to pay some at two? Our thin purses, Bairdaw told his friend. Alniscaver knows just how poor we are, so does everyone else. 
He nodded his head toward the tavern windows. Caladaster looked, already knowing what he'd see. Near everyone in the place was crowded up against the dirty glass, watching as the hawk-nosed stranger poured two full tankards and slid them across the table, emptying eating forks and trencher knives out of the last tankard and sliding them across too. Caladaster scratched his nose nervously, raked a hand down one of his untidy white and gray mutton-chop whiskers, a sure sign of hurried, worried thought, and turned back to the stranger. My friend asked who you are, and I want to know, too. I also want to know whatever little trick you've readied for us. I can leave your food and just walk away, you know. At that moment, his stomach chose to protest very loudly. The stranger ran a hand through unruly black hair and leaned back. My name is Elminster, and I am doing some work for my lady master. Work that involves my finding and visiting old ruins and the tombs of wizards. I've been given money to spend as I need to, in plenty. See? I'll leave these coins on the table. Now, if I happen to vanish in a puff of smoke before ye pick up that tankard, there's enough here for ye to pay Alniskaver yourselves. Beardaw looked down at the coins as if they were a handful of little sprites dancing under his nose, then back up at the stranger. All right, that tale I'll grant, he said slowly. But why us? Elminster poured his own tankard full, set it down, and asked, Have ye any idea what weary work it is, spending days wandering around a town of increasingly suspicious folk, peeking over fences and looking for headstones and ruins? By the first nightfall, farmers always want to thrust hay forks through me. By the second, they're trying to do it in droves. Both men barked short and snorting laughs at that. So I thought I'd save a lot of time and suspicion, the stranger added, if I just shared a meal with some men I liked the look of, with years enough under their belts to know the old tales, and where so-and-so lies buried and— You're after Sharandala, aren't you? Caladaster asked slowly, his eyes narrowing. El nodded cheerfully. I am, he said. And before ye try to find the right words to ask me, know this. I will take nothing from her tomb. I am not interested in opening her casket, performing any magic on her while I am there, or digging up or burning down anything, and I'd be happy to have ye or someone else from Ripplestones along to watch what I do. I need to be able to look around thoroughly, in good bright daylight, and that's all. How do we know you're telling the truth? Come with me, Elminster said, doling out platters and cutting into one of the pies. See for thyselves. Beardaw almost moaned at the smell that came out of the opened pie with the rush of steam, but he'd no need to. His stomach took care of the utterance for him. His hands went out before he could stop himself. The stranger grinned and thrust the platter bearing the slice of pie into his hands. I'd rather not go about disturbing dead sorceresses. Caladaster replied, and I'm a bit old for clambering around on broken stones wondering when the roof's going to fall down on my head. But you can't miss Scorchstone Hall. You came— He broke off as Beardock kicked him under the table, but Elminster just grinned again and said, Say on, please. I'm not going to whisk away the meal the moment I hear this. Caladaster ladled himself a bowl of soup with hands that he hoped weren't shaking with eagerness, and said thickly, "'Friend Elminster, I want to warn you about her wards. That's why no one plundered the place long since, and why you didn't see it. Trees and thorn bushes and all have grown around it in a wall just outside the shimmering. But I recall, before they grew, seeing squirrels and foxes and even birds of wing fall down dead when they so much as brushed Sharon Dalla's wards. You came right past it on your way in, just after the bridge, where the road takes that big bend. It's bending around Scorchstone. He took a big bite of cheese, closed his eyes in momentary bliss, and added, It burned after she died, mind. She didn't call it Scorchstone. Beardaw leaned close across the table to breathe beer conspiratorially all over Elminster and whisper roughly, They say she walks there still, you know, 
a skeleton in the tatters of a fine gown, still able to slay with her spells. L nodded. Well, I'll try not to disturb her. What was she like in life, do ye know? Bear Daw jerked his head in Caladaster's direction. The older man was blowing on his soup to cool it. He looked up, stroked his chin, and said, Well, I was not but a lad then, do you see, and... One by one, overcome with curiosity, the folk of Ripplestones were drifting out of the maid or down the street to listen, and no doubt to enthusiastically add their own warnings. Elminster grinned, sipped at his tankard, and waved at the two old men to continue. They were plowing through the food at an impressive rate. Bayardaw had already let out his belt once, and it lacked several hours to high sun yet. In the end, the two old men were content to let their good friend Elminster go along up to Scorchstone Hall, though Caladaster gravely asked the hawk-nosed mage to stop by their neighboring cottages on his way out, if in he'd need a bed for the night, or just to let them know he'd fared safely. L. as gravely promised he would, guessing he'd find deafening snores behind barred doors if he returned before the next morning. He helped the old men carry home the food their groaning full bellies wouldn't let them eat, and bought them each another keg of beer to wash it down with. They looked at him from time to time as if he was a god come calling in disguise, but clasped his hand heartily enough in almost tearful thanks, and wheezed their way indoors. El smiled and went on his way, waving cheerfully to the scattering of Ripplestone's children who came trailing after him, and the mothers who rushed to drag them back. He turned and walked straight into the thick standing trees that hid Scorchstone Hall from view. The last watchers from a farm who'd wandered down from the maid with their tankards in their hands spat into the road thoughtfully, agreed that Ripplestones had seen the last of another madman, and turned away to drift back to the tavern or about their business. The shimmering was as Caladaster had described, but sighed into nothingness at the first passage spell Al attempted. He became a shadow once more, in case more formidable traps awaited, and drifted quietly into the overgrown gardens of what had once been a fine mansion. It had burned, but only a little. What must have been a tower at the eastern front corner was now only a blackened ring of stones among brambles, attached to the house beyond by a rock pile of its fallen walls, but the gabled house beyond seemed intact. L found a place where a shutter sagged and drifted into the gloom through a window that had never, it seemed, known glass. The dark mansion beyond had its share of leaks, molds, and rodent leavings, but it looked for all the world as if someone cleaned it regularly. The shadowy chosen found no traps and soon reverted to solid form to poke and peer and open. He found sculptures, paintings smudged where someone had recently scrubbed mold away, and bookshelves full of travel journals, scholarly histories of kingdoms and prominent families, and even romantic novels. Nowhere in the house that he could see, however, was there any trace of magic. If this Sharandala had been a mage, all of her books and inks and spell substances must have been destroyed in the fire that brought down her tower and presumably the lady had perished therein, too. El shrugged. Well, a searcher in days to come wouldn't know that if he did his work properly. A forgotten scroll on a shelf here, a wand in a wooden box hidden behind this tall chest, and a sheaf of incomplete spell notes thrust into that book there. Now to put a few more scrolls in the closets he'd seen up in the bedrooms, and his work here was done magic enough to set a mageling on the road to mastery, if shrewdly used, and he opened a closet door and something moved, cowered, actually, as hand fire blazed between Elminster's fingers. Brown and gray bones shifted and shuffled into the deepest corner of the closet, holding a wobbling wand pointed at him. El saw glittering eyes, a wisp of cloth that might once have been part of a gown, and a snarl of long brown hair that was falling out of the shriveled remnant of a scalp as the skeleton brushed against the walls. 
He stepped back, holding up his hand in a stop gesture, hoping she'd not trigger that trembling wand. Lady Sharendala, he asked calmly. I am Elminster Amar, once of Myth Dranor, and I mean no harm nor disrespect. Please come out and be at ease. I did not know ye still dwelt here. I'll pay ye proper respects, then withdraw from thy house and leave ye in peace. He retreated to the door, put on his cloak, and summoned up defenses in case the undead sorceress did use the wand, and waited, watching the open closet door. After a long time that dark-eyed skull peered out and hastily withdrew. El leaned against the doorframe and waited. After a few moments more, the skeleton hesitantly shuffled out of the closet, looking in all directions for adventurers who might be waiting to pounce. She held the wand up, not leveled upon him, and came to a stop halfway down the room, gazing at him in silence. El offered her the chair beside him with a gesture. She didn't move, so he picked up the chair and carried it to her. The wand came up, but he ignored it, even when magic missiles spat forth and streaked at him, trailing blue fire. His spell defenses absorbed them harmlessly. El felt only gentle jolts as they struck. Pretending they'd never existed at all, or the second volley that tore into his face from barely an arm's length away, the last prince of Athelantar set down the chair and gestured to the walking remains of Sharendala, then to the chair, offering it to her. Then he bowed and went back to the doorway. After a long, silent moment, the skeleton went to the chair and sat down, crossing its legs at the ankles and leaning back on one arm of the chair out of long habit. Elminster bowed again. I apologize for my intrusion into thy home. I serve the goddess Mistra, and am here on her bidding to leave magic for later searchers to find. I shall restore thy wards and trouble ye no more. Is there anything I can do for ye? After a long while, the skeleton shook its head, almost wearily. Would ye find lasting rest? Al asked gently. The wand shot up to menace him. He held up a staying hand and asked, Do ye still work magic? The hair-shedding skull nodded, then shrugged, holding up the wand. El nodded. I've not searched for any magic ye may have hidden. I've only added, not taken away. A thought occurred to him then, and he asked, Would ye like to know new spells? The skeleton stiffened, made as if to rise, then nodded so emphatically that her hair fell out in handfuls. El reached into his cloak and drew forth a spell book. Muttering a word over it, he strode back across the room, ignoring the hesitantly lifted wand, which spat nothing more at him, and gently placed the tome in her lap, holding it as her free hand came across to clasp it. Her other hand dropped the wand and reached up impulsively to clasp his arm. Rather than pulling free, L reached out slowly to place his own hand over the dry, bony digits on his forearm and stroked them. Sharendala trembled all over, and for a long time, blue-gray eyes and dark points of light in the sockets of a fleshless skull stared into each other. El withdrew his stroking hand and said, Lady, I must go. I must place more magic elsewhere. But if I survive to return to Ripplestones in time to come, I'll stop and visit ye properly. He received a slow but definite nod in answer. Lady, can ye speak? Al asked. The skeleton stiffened, then the hand on his arm became a fist that smashed down on the arm of the chair in frustration. El bent over and tapped the book. There's a spell in here near the back that can change that for ye. It requires no verbal component, obviously, but I want ye to remember something. When ye have some unbroken time to devote to things and have mastered that spell, I want ye to hold this tome and say aloud the words, Mistra, please. Will ye remember? The skull nodded once more. El took hold of bony fingertips and brought them to his lips. Then, lady, fare thee well for now. I go, but shall return in time. Be happy. He straightened 
gave her a salute, and strode out of the room. The skeleton managed a wave at its last glimpse of his smiling face. Then its hand fell to the book, cradling it as if it would never let go. For a long time, the skeleton that had been Sharon Dalla sat in the chair, staring at the door and shuddering. The only sound in the room was a dry clicking as fleshless jaws worked. She was trying to weep. But there's more, Beldrune hissed, creeping forward with his fingers held out like claws before him. Spellbound, the circle of pupils watched him with nary a titter at the appearance of an old and overweight wizard trying to tiptoe like an actor overplaying the part of a skulking thief. This mighty mage has walked these very streets. Here, just outside, down yon alley, not three nights past, I saw him myself. Think of it, Tabarist took up the telling excitedly, never knowing that the mage they were speaking of was at that moment kissing the fingertips of a skeleton. We've walked with him. We studied magic at his very elbow in fabled Moonshorn Tower. And soon, just perhaps, you too may have this opportunity to talk with the supreme sorcerer of the age, a man touched by a god. Nay, Beldrune leered suggestively, a man touched by a goddess. Think of it. Tabarist put in hastily, flashing a warning glare at Drune. Don't the young ever think of anything else? The great Elminster has lived for centuries. Some believe him to be a chosen one, personally favored by the goddess Mistra. That's what my colleague was trying to say. And records are clear. He is a man who dwelt in fabled myth Draner, when elven magic flowed like water was respected enough to be accepted into a noble elf family there, advised their ruler, the coronal, and even survived the darkness of its destruction at the hands of a shrieking army of foul fiends. Hard to believe? Ask the folk of Galadorna about Elminster's survival in the face of the fell magic of an archpriestess of Bane, while defying her in her very temple. This was before Galadorna's fall, when he was the court mage of that realm. Aye, all this is true, Beldrune agreed, taking up the tale. And don't forget, he's been seen here, fearlessly strolling out of the tomb of the mage Tarascus in broad daylight. There were gasps at this last piece of news, and many involuntary glances toward the windows. A ghostly shape that had been floating outside one of those windows, listening intently, prudently fell away and dissolved into mists. I've lived here for centuries, too, it murmured, chiming as it gathered speed to go elsewhere. Perhaps this Elminster would make a fitting mate, if he's alive and human, and not some cleverly cloaked lich or crawling netherplaner spirit. Unaware that excited pupils were crowding the windows to glimpse her as a supposed magical manifestation of the very mage she was musing about, the sorceress drifted away, murmuring, Elminster, tis time to go hunting Elminsters. 14. The Elminster Hunt the deadliest sport among the Gentarum is vying for supremacy within its dark ranks, and in particular the doom of the too young and nakedly ambitious to be sent Elminster hunting. I'll wager that this has always been a perilous pastime. Some are wise enough, as I was, to use it as a chance to die our ways out of the Brotherhood. It was interesting, if a trifle depressing, to hear, while in disguise, what folk said of me once they thought me safely dead. One day I'll return and haunt them all. Destrar Gull Hollow, from Posthumous Musings of a Gentarum Mageling, published circa the Year of the Morning Star. The darkness never left Ilbrin Starim. It never would. Not since the day when the last hunting lodge of the Starm had been torn apart in spells and flame, their proud halls in Mithdranor already fallen, and the Starm had been shattered forever. 
If any of his kin still lived, he'd never found a trace of them. Once proud and mighty, the family that had led and defined Cormanthir for an age was now reduced to one young and crippled cousin. If the Seldarine smiled, with his magic he might be able to sire children to carry on the family name, but only if the Seldarine smiled. Again, it had been the accursed one, that grinning human Elminster, his spells splashing around the temple as he fought the Queen of Galadorna. A thousand times Ilbrin had relived those searing instants of tumbling down the temple broken and aflame, to work magic that would restore his leg and smooth his skin to be what it had once been, would ruin spells he'd never mastered, the spells that had cost him so much to keep his ravaged innards working. Years of agony, if he lived that long, lay ahead. Agony of the body to match the agony of his heart. Have my thanks, human, he snarled to the empty air. The horse promptly jostled him, sending stabbing pains through his twisted side as it clopped across a worn and uneven bridge. Ahead, through the pain, he saw a signboard. On his sixth day out of Westgate, riding alone on a hard road, it was a welcome sight. It told him he was getting somewhere, even if he didn't know quite where that somewhere was. Ripple stones, he read it aloud. Another soaring human fortress of culture. How inspiring. He drew his bitter sarcasm around himself like a dark cloak and urged his horse into a trot, sitting up in his saddle so as to look impressive when human eyes began their startled looks at him. An elf riding alone, all in black and wearing the swords and daggers of an adventurer, with whenever he let the spell lapse, one side of his face a twisted mottled mass of burn scar. The weaponry was all for show, of course, to make his spells a surprise. Ilbrin dropped one hand to a smooth sword pommel and caressed it, keeping his face hard and grim, as the road rounded a thick stand of trees and ripple stones spread out before him. He was always wandering, always seeking Elminster. To hunt and slay Elminster Amar was the burning goal that ruled his life, though there'd never be a house star him to return to with triumphant news of avenging the family unless Ilbrin rebuilt it himself. He was close on Elminster's trail now. He could taste it. He put out of his mind how many times he'd been this close before, and at the end of the day had closed his fingers on nothing. Ah, a tavern. The fair maid of ripple stones, probably the only tavern in this dusty farm town. Ilbrin stopped his horse, threw its reins over its head to enact the spell that would hold it like a statue until he spoke the right word, and began the bitter struggle to dismount without falling on his face. As it was, his artificial leg clanked like a bouncing cartload of swords when he landed, and he clung to a saddle strap for long seconds before he could clear his face of the pain and straighten up. The two old men on the bench just sat and watched him calmly, as if strange travelers rode up to the fair maid every day. Ilbrin spoke gently to them, but grasped the hilts of a blade and a throwing dagger as a sort of silent promise of trouble to come if they wanted trouble. May this day find you in fortune, he said formally. I hope you can help me. I'm seeking a friend of mine to deliver an urgent message. I must catch him. Have you seen a human wizard who goes by the name of Elminster? He's tall and thin with dark hair and a hawk's nose, and he steps into every wizard's tomb he passes. The two old men on the bench stared at him, frowning, but said not a word. A third man, standing in the tavern door, gave the two on the bench an even odder look than he'd given Ilbrin and said to the elf, Oh, him! Aye, he went in Scorched Stone right enough, and soon came out again, too. Headed east, he did, into the dead place. The dead place? Aye, them as goes in comes not out. There's nary a squirrel or chipmunk tween Ogle Stream and Rairdrin Hill, just this side of Starmantle. We go by boat now, if and we have to. No one takes the road, nor goes through the woods, neither. A ten-day and some back, some fancy adventuring band, 
and not the first one neither, hired by the High Duke himself went in, and came not out again. Nor will they, for my name's not Jalabal, which, eh, uh, tis. Mark you, they'll not be seen again, no. I hear there's another band of fools yet, just set out from Starmantle. The elf had already turned and begun the struggle up into his saddle again. With a grunt and a heave that brought a snarl of pain from between clenched teeth, he regained his seat on the high-backed saddle and took up his reins to head on east. Here, Jalabal called. Aren't you be staying then? Ilbrin twisted his lips into a grim smile. I'll never catch him if I stop and rest wherever he's just moved on from. But yon's the dead place, like I told thee. With two swift tugs, the elf undid the two silver catches on his hip that Beardaw had thought were ornamental, and peeled aside his breeches. Inside was no smooth skin, but a ridged mass of scars that looked like old tree bark, a sickly yellow where it wasn't already gray. The twisted burn scarring extended from his knee to his armpit, and above the knee were the struts and lashings that held on a leg of metal and wood that the elf had not been born with. I'll probably feel at home there, the elf told the three gaping men thinly. As you can see, I'm half dead already. Without another word or look in their direction, he pulled the catches closed and spurred his mount away. In shocked silence, the three men watched the dust rise and beyond it. The bobbing elf on his horse dwindled from view along the overgrown road toward Ogle Stream. Did you see? Did you see? Jalabal asked the two silent men on the bench excitedly. They stared at him like two stones. He blinked at them, then bustled back into the maid to spread word about his daring confrontation with the scorched elf rider. Beardaw turned his head to look at Calidaster. Did he say catch him up, or just catch him? He said catch him, Calidaster replied flatly. I noticed that in particular. Beardaw shook his head. I'd not like to walk in a mage's boots for all their power. Crazed, the lot of them. Have you noticed? Aye, I have, Calidaster replied, his voice deep and grim. It passes, though, if you stop soon enough. And as if that had been a farewell, he got up from the bench and strode away toward his cottage. Something flashed as he went and the old man's hand was suddenly full of a stout, gem-studded staff that Beardaw had never seen before. Beardaw closed his gaping mouth and rubbed his eyes to be sure he'd seen rightly. Aye, there it was, to be sure. He stared at Calidaster's back as his old comrade strode down the road home, but his friend never looked back. Despite the gray sky and cool breezes outside, many a student had cast glances out the windows during this day's lesson. So many, in fact, that at one point Tabarist had been moved to comment severely, I doubt very much that the great Elminster is going to perch like a pigeon on our window sill just to hear what to him are the rudiments of magic. Those of you who desire to grasp a tenth of his greatness are advised to face front and pay attention to our admittedly less exciting teachings. All mages, even divine Azuth, the lord of spells, who outstrips Elminster as he outstrips any of you, began in this way, learning mage lore as words dropping from the lips of older, wiser wizards. The glances back diminished noticeably after that, but Beldrun was still sighing in exasperation by the time Tabarist threw up his hands and snapped, As the ability to focus one's concentration, that cornerstone of magecraft, seems today to utterly elude all too many of you, we'll conclude the class at this point and begin with fresh insight and interest, I trust, on the morrow. You are dismissed. Homeward go, without playing spell pranks this time, Master Maglist. Yes, sir, one handsome youth replied rather sullenly, amid the general tumult of scraping chairs, billowing cloaks, and hurrying bodies. Muttering, Tabarist turned to the hearth to rake the coals out into a glittering bed and put another log on the fire. 
Beldrun glanced up at the smoke hanging and curling under the rafters. When things warmed up, that chimney would profit from a spell or two to blast it clean and hollow it out a trifle wider. Then clasped his hands behind him and watched the class leave, just to make sure no demonstration daggers or spell notes accidentally fell into the sleeves, scripts, boots, or shirt fronts of students' clothing. As usual, Maglist was one of the last to depart. Beldrun met his gaze with a firm and knowing smile that sent the flushing youth hastily doorward, and only then became aware that a man who'd sat quietly in the back of the class with the air of someone whose thoughts are elsewhere, despite the gold piece he'd paid to be sitting there, was coming slowly forward. A first-timer, perhaps he had some questions. Beldrun asked politely, Yes, and how may we help you, sir? The man had unkempt pale brown hair and washed-out brown eyes in a pleasantly forgettable face. His clothing was that of a down-at-heels merchant, dirty tunic and bulging pocketed over-tunic over patched and well-worn breeches, and good but worn boots. I must find a man, he said in a very quiet voice, stepping calmly past Beldrun to where Tabarist was bending over the hearth, and I am willing to pay handsomely to be guided to him. Beldrun stared at the man's back for a moment. I think you misunderstand our talent, sir. We're not— His voice trailed off as he saw what was being drawn in the hearth ashes. The nondescript man had plucked up a kindling stick from beside the fire and was drawing a harp between the horns of a crescent moon surrounded by four stars. The man turned his head to make sure that both of the elderly mages had seen his design, then hastily raked ashes across it until his design was obliterated. Beldrun and Tabarist exchanged looks, eyebrows raised and excitement tugging at the corners of their jaws. Tabarist leaned forward until his forehead almost touched Beldrun's and murmured, A harper. Elminster had a hand in founding them, you know. I do know, you dolt. I'm the one keeps his ears open for news, remember? Beldrun replied a trifle testily and turned to the harper. So who do you want us to find for you, anyway? A wizard by the name of Elminster. Yes, our founder. That Elminster. The pupils had any returned to spy on the hearth with the same attention they'd paid to the windows, would at that moment have witnessed their two elders, severe tutors squealing like excited children, hopping and shuffling in front of the fire as they clapped their hands in eagerness, then gabbling acceptances without any reference to fees or payments to the down-at-heels merchant, who was calmly returning the stick to where he'd found it, in the center of the happy tumult. Beldrun and Tabarist ran right into each other in their first eager rushes toward cupboards, laughed and clawed each other out of the way with equal enthusiasm, then rushed around snatching up whatever they thought might come in remotely useful on an Elminster hunt. The worn-looking harper leaned back against the wall with a smile growing on his face as the heap of essentials rapidly grew toward the rafters. What befell, Bresmer? The High Duke's voice didn't hold much hope or eagerness. He wasn't expecting good news. His seneschal gave him none. Gone, sir, as near as we can tell. One dead horse, seen floating by fishermen. They took Gerlin out to see it. He was a horse tamer before he took service with you, Lord. He said its eyes were staring and its hooves and legs all bloodied. He thinks it galloped right down the cliff, riderless, fleeing in fear. The boat guard report that the banner didn't light the signal beacon or raise the pennant. I think they're all dead, Lord. Horostus nodded, hardly seeing the wine glass he was rolling between his fingers. Have we found anyone else willing to take us on? Any word from Marskin? Bresmer shook his head. He thinks everyone in Westgate has heard all about the slayings, and so does Eltravar and Reth. Raise what we're offering the High Duke said slowly. Double the blood price. I've already done that, Lord, the Seneschal murmured. Eltravard did that on his own, and I thought it prudent to confirm his offers with your ducal seal. Marskin has been using the new offer for a ten-day now. It's the doubled fee all of these mercenaries are refusing. 
the High Duke grunted. Well, we're seeing the measure of their spirit, at least, to know who not to hire when we've need in future. Or their prudence, Lord, Bresmer said carefully. Or their prudence. Horostos looked up sharply, met his seneschal's eyes, then let his gaze fall again without saying anything. He brought his wine glass down to the table so hard it shattered into shards between his fingers and snapped. Well, we've got to do something. We don't even know what it is. And it'll be having whole villages next. I— It already has, Lord, Bresber murmured. I can stump. Sometime last ten day. The woodcutters? Horistus threw back his head and sighed at the ceiling. I won't have a land to rule if this goes on much longer he told it sadly. The slayer will be gnawing at the gates of this castle with nothing left outside but the bones of the dead. The ceiling, fully as wise as its long years, deigned not to answer. Horostos brought his gaze back down to meet the eyes of his expressionless, carefully quiet seneschal, and asked, Is there any hope, anyone we can call on before you and I up shields and ride out those gates together? I did have a visit from one outlander, Lord, Bresmer told the richly braided rug at his feet. He said to tell you that the Harpers had taken an interest in this matter, Lord, and they would report to you before the end of the season, if you could be found. I took that as a hint to tarry here until at least then, Lord. God's blasted, Bresmer! Sit like a babe trembling in a corner while my people look at me and say— there goes a coward, not a ruler. Sit doing nothing while these mysterious wandering harpists murmur to me what's befalling in my land and stay out of it? Sit watching money flow out of the vault and men die still clutching it, while crops rot in the fields with no farmers left alive to tend them or harvest them so we won't starve come winter? What would you have me do? It's not my place to demand anything of you, Lord the seneschal said quietly. You weep for your people and your land, and that is more than most rulers ever think to do. If you choose to ride out against the slayer come morning, I'll ride with you. But I hope you'll give shelter to those who want to flee the forest, Lord, and bide here, until a harper comes riding in our gates to at least tell us what is destroying our land before we go up against it. The High Duke stared at the shards of the wine glass in his lap and the blood running down his fingers and sighed. My thanks, Bresmer, for speaking sense to me. I'll tarry and be called a coward, and pray to Malar to call off this slayer and spare my people. He rose, brushing glass aside impatiently, and acquired the ghost of a grin as he asked, Any more advice, Seneschal? I, one more thing, Bresmer murmured. Be careful where you do your hunting, Lord. A chill, chiming mist dived between two curving moss-covered fandars and slid snake-like through a rent in a crumbling wall. It made of itself a brief whirlwind in the chamber beyond and became the shifting, semi-solid outline of a woman once more. She glanced around the ruined chamber, sighed, and threw herself down on the shabby lounge to think, tugging at hair that was little more than smoke as she reclined on one elbow and considered future victories. He must not see me, she mused aloud, until he comes here and finds the runes himself. I must seem linked to them, an attractive captive he must free and solve some mystery about. Not just how I came to be here, but who I am. A slow smile grew across her face. Yes, yes, I like that. She whirled around and up into the air in a blurred whirlwind to float gently down and stand facing the full-length peeling mirror. Tall enough, yes, she turned this way and that, subtly altering her appearance to look more exotic and attractive, waist in, hips out, a little tilt to the nose, eyes larger. Yes, she told the glass at last, satisfaction in her voice. A little better than Sarah Ada Lyonora was in life.
and yet no less deadly. She drifted toward one of the row of wardrobes, made long, slender legs solid enough to walk. It had been a long time since she'd strutted across a dance floor to say nothing of flouncing or mincing. The wardrobe squealed as it opened, a damp door dropping away from the frame. Sayreda frowned and went to the next wardrobe where she'd put garments seized recently from wagons and victims on the road when there had still been wagons. Her smile became cat-like at that thought as she made her hands just solid enough to hold cloth, wincing at the empty feeling it caused within her. To become solid drained her so much. As swiftly as she dared, she raked through the gowns, selecting three that most caught her eye, and draped them over the lounge. Rising up through the first, she became momentarily solid all over, and gasped at the cold emptiness that coiled within her. Mustn't do this for long, she gasped aloud, her breath hissing out to cloud the mirror. Dare not use too much, but these must fit. The blue ruffles of the first gown were flattened and wrinkled from their visit to the wardrobe. The black one, with its daring slits all over, looked better but would tear and fall apart most easily. The last gown was red and far more modest, but she liked the quality it shouted, with the gem-highlighted crawling dragons on its hips. Her strength was failing fast. Gods, she needed to drain lives soon or... With almost feverish speed, she shifted her shape to fill out the three gowns most attractively, fixed their varying requirements in her mind, and thankfully collapsed into a whirlwind again, dumping the red gown to the ground in a puddle. As mist, she drifted over it, solidifying just her fingertips to carry it back to the wardrobe and hang it carefully away. As she returned for the other two garments, an observer would have noticed that her twinkling lights had grown dim and her mist was tattered and smaller than it had been. By the time the wardrobe door closed behind the last gown, Sayreda had noticed that she was a little dimmer now. She sighed but couldn't resist coalescing back to womanly form for one last critical look at herself in the mirror. You'll have to do, I suppose. And another thing, Sayreda, she chided herself. Stop talking to yourself. You're lonely, yes, but not completely melt-witted. Try over there, a hoarse male voice said then, in what was probably intended to be a whisper. It was coming from the forest beyond the ruin, through one of the gaps in the walls. I'm sure I saw a woman yonder in a red gown. The ghostly woman froze, head held high, then smiled wolfishly and collapsed into winking lights and mist once more. How thoughtful, she murmured to the mirror, her voice faint and yet echoing. Just when I need them most. Her laughter arose as a merry tinkling. I never thought I'd be around to see it, but adventurers are becoming almost predictable. She plunged out through a hole in the wall like a hungry eel. Seconds later... A hoarse scream rang out. It was still echoing back off the crumbling walls when there was another. Fifteen. A Dark Flame Rising And a dark flame shall rise and scatter all before it, igniting red war, wild magic, and slaughter. Just another quiet interlude before the fresh perils of next month. Caldrahan Melimbrin, Sage of Matters Holy, from Atashlutan Traveler's Day Thoughts, published in The Year of Moonfall. Dread Brother Darlacan. It had a ring to it. It would go well with the branding and the whip scars that crisscrossed his forearms. He'd worked hard with a paste of blood and urine and black temple face paint to turn those scars into dark, permanent raised ridges. His eagerness to take branding in the temple rituals had not gone unnoticed. The wind off the shar was hot and dry this night, and he'd been looking forward to a quiet evening of prostrate prayer on the cold stone of the cellar floor. 
But the adeptress he'd paid to flog him first had come to him with a harshly whispered mission instead. By dread sister Clalera's command, he was to immediately bear this platter of food and wine to the innermost chambers of the House of Holy Night. I'm excited for you, dread brother, she whispered in his ear, before she'd given him the customary slap across the face. Kneeling, he'd clawed at her ankles with even more than the usual enthusiasm, his heart pounding with his own excitement. He'd thought the cruel overmistress of the acolytes had been eyeing him rather closely for the last ten day or so. Was this his chance at last? When he was alone, he hastened to fix the mantle of shards around him, tucking it up firmly between his thighs so as to make it draw blood before his first step, instead of walking with infinite care to avoid its wounds, as most did. Then he took up the platter, held it high, and made a silent prayer to the all-seeing goddess. O holy Shar, forgive my presumption, but I would serve you as the dark night wind, the barbed black blade, your scourge and trusted hand, not merely as a temple puppet at Clalera's whims. Shar, he breathed aloud, in case anyone was spying from behind panels and thought he'd been quailing or daydreaming instead of praying. He raised and lowered the platter in salute and set off briskly through the dimly torchlit halls of the temple. The smooth black marble was cold under his bare feet, and his limbs tingled where threads of blood trickled down. He walked straight and tall, never looking back at the naked novices crawling along in his wake, licking up his blood where it fell, and gave no sign he'd heard grunts and sobs and muffled screams behind the doors he passed as the ambitious clergy of the house made their own pain sacrifices to Holy Shar. He heard the rumble of the lone drum long before he reached the inner portal, and his excitement grew to an almost unbearable singing within him. A high ritual unannounced and unexpected, and he was to be part of it. Dread Brother Darlakan. Oh, yes, a measure of power at last, he was on his way to greatness. Darlakan rounded the last pillar and strode to the archway where the two priestesses crossed their razor-sharp black blades before him, then drew them back across his chest with the most delicate of strokes as he held the platter high out of the way. They turned toward him this night, and Darlakan stopped, trembling to receive their ultimate accolade. They let him watch as they shook his blood from the points of their swords into cupped palms and brought it to their mouths. He whispered, As Shar wills, to them, making of his tone a thanks, then strode on down the last passage to the inner portal, the drumbeat growing louder before him. He was surprised to find the portal itself unguarded. A black curtain adorned with the dark disk hung in the customarily empty portal arch. Darlakan slowed for a moment, wondering what to do, then decided he must follow the procedure all acolytes were trained in, as if nothing was occurring out of the ordinary. He paused at the portal, swept his elbows out to make the shards slash at him one last time, and to keep them out of the way as he knelt, and went to his knees, extending the platter at the full stretch of his arms and touching his forehead to the cold marble of the threshold. Swift hands snatched the platter away, and others beheaded him with a single keen stroke. A long, sleek arm snatched up the blood-gargling head by its hair. An oiled body stretched and thrust Darlakan's head into a brazier, ignoring the flames that raced back down oiled flesh. The last, that someone murmured, pain making the voice tight. Then no peace, dread sister, someone else said, touching her with the black quenching rod that drank all fire. The drum rolled one last time and fell silent. A long-nailed hand made a gesture and black flames roared up out of a dozen braziers with a collective crackle and snarl. Each brazier in the circle held a blackening, severed head. Each tongue of dark flame rose up in a twisting, flowing column to feed a dark sphere overhead. The sacred chamber of Shar, the most holy room in the house of holy night, was crowded indeed. 
All of the cruel and powerful upper priestesses of Shar were gathered here in their black and purple beneath the sphere of roiling shadows. All of them streamed blood from open wounds. All of their eyes were bright with excitement, and all of their attention was now fixed on the sphere that loomed so large above their heads, as tall as six men. Something swam into view briefly within the sphere, a human arm, slender and feminine, white-skinned and clawing vainly at nothing. Then an elbow was seen, and suddenly the head and shoulders of a feebly struggling human female swam into view. All that could be seen of her was bare, and she was thrashing about in the fire, seemingly blind. Despair was written large across her face, the eyes dark, staring pools, the mouth open in an endless, soundless scream. There was a murmur of puzzlement and surprise from among the gathered priestesses, and the tallest among them, resplendent in her horned black headdress and her mantle of deepest purple, stepped forward and brought the long sash in her hand down with brutal force across the bare back of a man kneeling under the sphere. Sweat flew in all directions. He was drenched and gleaming. Explain, dread brother high, the dark lady of the house commanded, her voice sharp. We were promised by you, and in ascending by the flame of darkness herself, that your striving would bring us great power and great opportunity. Even if this wench is some great queen of Faroon, I see no power nor opportunity here save the grubby achievement of seizing a land and its coffers. Explain both well and speedily, and live. The senior priest of the house looked at the struggling figure in the sphere as he let his hands fall to his sides, then slumped back to the marble floor, exhausted. Through his gasps, the priestesses saw the bright flash of his smile. It is a success, your darkness, he said when he could find breath enough. This is an avatar of the goddess Mistra, though of much less power than most she sends forth. We cannot harm it without unleashing magics too wild for all of us together to hope to control. But while we keep it trapped thus, we can tap the weave whenever it strives to, gaining magic to power spells studied and cast as wizards do. This avatar must have been tainted by its flirtation with Bane. There is a lasting weakness here, I believe. Time enough for such musings later, said Dark Lady Avrowana firmly. Her voice was still cold and biting, but the eagerness on her face and the tapping of her whip against her own thigh rather than across the face of High Brother Gnarlkund betrayed her excitement and approval. Tell me these spells. We sit and study as mages do, and fill our minds. And what then? No power floods into those memorized patterns until our captive here seeks to touch the weave, replied the senior priest, rolling over to face her on his knees, which happens every few hours or so. It seems unable not to strive to, for that is its essential nature, and how long can we keep this up? Avroana snapped, gesturing up at the sphere with her whip. So long as we have enthusiastic believers in the Dark Mother to furnish us with their heads. More have been called hither, said the Dark Lady, her lips shaping for a very brief instant, a smile that was as cold as the glacial ice that seals shut a northern tomb. They've been told we mount a holy crusade. Your darkness, High Brother Narlkund responded with a soft smile of his own. We do. This is what in human speech would be called the lookout tree, said the moon elf, sitting down on a huge leaf, which promptly curled and flexed around him to form a couch that cupped him like a giant, gentle hand. Umbregard stared around at the view between the great arched branches that split apart where they stood to soar still farther up into the thin, cold air. By the gods, he said slowly, those are clouds. We're looking down on the clouds. Only the lowest sort of clouds. Star Sunder said with a smile. Oh, didn't you know? Yes, different shapes of clouds hang at different levels, just as fish in a lake seek levels in the water that suit them. Fish? The human mage asked, then grinned and said, 
never mind. We stray swiftly from my original questioning. Starsunder grinned back. Now do you see how it was that humans studied in Myth Draenor for centuries, he said, and some of them still learned only a handful of the spells they came seeking? The best of them didn't even mind. Umbregard shook his head. Oh, to have been there, he whispered longingly, sitting down rather gingerly on another leaf. It promptly tumbled him into its center. He had time for only the briefest of startled murmurs, and folded itself around him to leave him upright and throned in warm comfort. Well, ahem, <clears throat> he offered in pleased surprise while Starsunder chuckled. Nice, very nice. He looked at Starsunder's chair, still clearly alive and attached to the gigantic shadow-topped tree they'd climbed so laboriously to the top of, up a spiral stair that had seemed endless. I suppose there's no chance of getting a chair like this anywhere else but in the elven court? None, Starsunder said with a wide smile. At all. Sorry. Umbregard snorted. You don't sound sorry at all. Why did we have to sweat our weary ways up here step after thousandth step? What's wrong with using spells to fly? The tree needed to get to know you, his elf host explained. Otherwise, when you sat down just now, it'd quite likely have hurled you off into yonder clouds like a catapult, and I'd have had no human wizards to chat with this evening. Umbregard shuddered at the vision of being helplessly thrust out, out into the oh-so-empty air before starting that terrible long plunge. Ugh! he shrieked, waving his hands to sweep away his mental vision. Gods, away, away! Let's get back to our converse. When we were eating... Oh, that tree jelly. How did... No. Later. I'll ask that later. Now I want to know why you said, when we were eating, that Elminster stands in such danger just now, and stands also so close to being an even greater danger to us all. Why? Starsunder looked out over miles of greenery toward the distant line of mountains for a moment before he said... Any human mage who lives as many years as this Elminster outstrips most human foes of his own making. They die while he lives on. His very longevity and power make him a natural target for those of all races who would seize him, or his powers from him, or his supposed riches and enchanted items. Such perils confront all mages who've enjoyed any success. Umbregard nodded and his elf host continued. It's reasonable to suppose that a wizard of greater success attracts greater attention, and so greater foes, yes? Umbregard nodded again, sitting forward eagerly. You're going to tell me about some great mysterious foes that Elminster's now facing? Starsunder smiled. Such as the Ferim, the Malagrim, and perhaps even the Sharn? No. Umbregard frowned. The fair Starsunder chuckled. If I tell you about them, they won't be mysterious any longer, will they? Moreover, you'll live the rest of your days in fear, and no one will believe you when you spread word of them. Each time you speak of them will increase the likelihood that one of their number will feel sufficient need to silence you, and so bring to a brutal and early end the life of Umbregard. No. Forget them. It's good practice for mages, for getting and letting go of things that interest them. Some of them never learn how and die long before their time. Umbregard frowned, opened his mouth to say something, and shut it again. Then it popped open once more, and he said almost angrily, Well then, if we're supposed to speak of no foes, what special danger does Elminster face? A small, tightly curled leaf at Starsunder's elbow opened then to reveal two glass bowls full of what looked like water. He passed one of the bowls over to Umbregard, and they drank together. It was water, and the coolest, clearest that Umbregard had yet tasted. As it slid down to every corner of his being, he felt suddenly fully awake and vigorous. He turned his head to exclaim about how he felt, 
looked into Starsunder's eyes, and saw sadness there. He hesitated in speaking just long enough for the moon elf to say deliberately, Himself. Himself? By the gods, had he been reduced to an echo? And was this his sixth evening here with Starsunder, or his seventh? Yes, he was like a small child invited into the converse of adults, seeing a longer, graver view of Faroon around him for the first time. With a sudden effort, Umbregard held his tongue and leaned forward to listen. Starsunder rewarded him with a slight smile and added, With all the friends, lovers, foes, and even realms of his youth gone, Elminster will feel increasingly alone, and, as is the way of humans, lonely. He will cling to all he has left, his power and accomplishments of magecraft, and begin to chafe at the bargain that has robbed him of his youth and of all the things he might have done but did not. In short, he will become restless in the service of Mistra. No, you said so yourself. Love, it is the way of the humans, Starsunder continued calmly, and of us all, at differing times in our lives. But now it is I who digress. In short, Elminster will for the first time as a mature mage of power, as opposed to an ardent, easily distracted youth, be ready to notice temptations. Temptations? Chances to use his power as he sees fit, without the bidding of or restrictions decreed by others. The desire to do just as he pleases, ignoring consequences for good or ill, smashing all who stand against him, to do whatever he's idly thought of doing, pursuing every whim. And so? And so, while he's about it, Every living creature on or under fair Toral must cower and hide. For what fate will Umbregard enjoy if it strikes a passing Elminster that a handful of Umbregard tripes will make a good toy or meal for the next few minutes? The elf let his words hang in silence for a time, waiting for Umbregard to speak. Soon enough the human wizard was unable to resist doing so. Are you saying, he asked softly, that we, I, or someone, must set out to destroy Elminster now to save all Toral? Starsunder shook his head almost wearily. Why is it that humans love that word so much? Destroy. He set his water bowl back into the leaf and asked with a smile, If you succeeded, Umbregard the Mighty, tell me. Who then would protect Toral from you? If I was a lurking slayer, I would want a lair. Sweet Mistra, Elminster murmured, smiling despite himself. Whatever you do, stop me from ever trying to be a bard. He took another step along the crumbling wall of the ruin, the slight scrape of his boot on damp, dead leaves seeming very loud in the eerie quiet of the empty forest. Somehow he knew this crumbling keep had to be linked to whatever was killing folk and forest creatures hereabouts. He'd felt it clear out along the coast road, calling him here. Calling him. He stopped and glared up at the mossy stones. Could a spell be at work on him, drawing him here? He'd have felt any simple charm or suggestion, wouldn't he? Abruptly, El wheeled around and started back across the sagging bridge, heading away from the ruins at a steady pace. He looked back once, just to be sure nothing was speeding toward his back, but all seemed as quiet as before. He still felt as if he was being watched, though. He studied the tooth-like remnants of walls for a long time, but nothing moved and nothing seemed to change. With a shrug, El turned around again and headed back down the road. He hadn't gone far when he saw it. Out of the corner of his eye, expected but not yet what he'd expected, a woman watching him from between two duskwood trees. He spun toward the trees, but there was no one there. He turned slowly on his heel all around, but he saw no watching human or anyone flitting from tree to tree or crouching in any hollow. 
he'd have heard the dead leaves rustling at any such movement anyway. With a little smile, El turned back to the road and an unhurried trudge along it back to the coast road. He suspected he'd not have to wait long before seeing that face peering at him again, for that was what it had been, no gowned figure but a head and a neck. She could even be a floating ghost. If she was the slayer, that could well explain the lack of tracks to follow or creatures for the High Duke's men to corner. The manner of slaying even argued. There she was again, peering at him from a tree ahead. This time El didn't rush forward, but turned slowly to look in all directions. And, as he'd expected, that face peered at him from a tree behind him, back toward the ruins, just long enough for their eyes to meet. He smiled slowly and walked back to that second tree. He was only a few paces from it, when a ghostly face turned to regard him from high in a tree a good distance closer to the ruins. Elminster gave her a cheery wave this time and allowed himself to be led back to the ruins. The sooner he got to the bottom of this, the sooner he could be away from here before dark and on about the main task Mistra had set him. He went the other way around the walls this time just to cover new ground and found himself looking through gaps in the crumbling stonework into a vast chamber that seemed to have furniture in it. He moved carefully nearer through the tangle of stunted shrubs and fallen stone, peering. There, a voice snarled, human, rough, and not far away. As Elminster ducked low and spun around, he heard the familiar hum of approaching arrows. The life those arrows sought was his. Ilbrin Starim reined in at the sentry's startled yell and held up an empty hand. I come in peace, he began, alone. By then javelins were whizzing his way and men with hastily drawn swords in their hands and fear and astonishment warring on their faces were leaping through the trees on all sides. Elves, one of them roared. I told you twas elves all along. The elf sighed, threw off his cloak with the word that made the world dark, and backed his snorting mount to one side. Its sudden jerk told him one of the javelins had found a mark even before it reared up, spilling him out of his saddle, and came crashing down heavily on its side, inches away from Ilbrin. The elf rolled away as hard as he'd ever done anything in his life. A stray hoof numbed his good hip and had probably laid it open, too. Bloody humans! can't even ride along woodland trails without getting jumped by idiot adventurers arrogant enough to pitch their encampments right across the trail itself. Ilbrin found his feet, stumbled awkwardly away until he ran into a tree and propped himself against it. The humans were blundering around in the little corner of nightfall he'd made, hacking at each other, of course, the fools, shouting in alarm, and generally despoiling their camp in the woods immediately around them. If these were the slayers, they were more than inept. No, these must be one of the bands of higher swords. Ha! They thought he was the slayer. Right then. Cloaked in darkness, only he could see through. Ilbrin watched the fray rage for a time as he caught his breath and peered around, seeking mages or priests who might have the wits and power to end his spell. Once he unleashed another, his darkness would fall like a dropped cloak so he wanted that spell to be a good one. Two of this benighted band of adventurers were dead already at the hands of their fellows, and as Ilbrin watched, a third met a screaming end spitted on two javelins. The stronger of his slayers ran him back against a tree and left him pinned to it, and vomiting his lifeblood away. The elf shook his head in disgust and kept looking. There, that man by the tent bent over the scrolls, Ilbrin readied his spell, then plucked up a stone from beside his tree, measured the throw with narrowed eyes, and threw. The stone bonged off the pot and spilled it into the fire. The man with the scrolls whipped his head around to see what had befallen, and two other adventurers came loping back through the trees, employing that most favorite of human words, What? in the midst of many oaths. A goodly group. Now before they all ran off again. Ilbrin steadied himself against the tree, cast the spell as quietly as he could but with unhurried care, 
and was rewarded, an instant before its end, with the human mage hissing, Hoy all, be still, listen. The seven odd adventurers obediently stopped their shouting and rushing about, and they stood like statues as the darkness fell away, and waist-high whirling shards of steel melted out of the empty air and cut them all in half. A few of them even saw the elf standing against a tree sneering at them. The crouching mage was beheaded, his blood exploding all over the scrolls as he slumped forward into the dirt. Seeing that, Ilbrin didn't bother to survey the slain any longer. He was listening hard now for the sounds of the living. At least two, and possibly as many as four, were still lurking close by. One of them ran right past him, shrieking in horror as he sprinted into the bloody camp. Sweet trembling trees were all humans this stupid? Evidently they were. Two others joined the first, weeping and yelling. Ilbrin sighed. It wouldn't be long before even fools such as these noticed a motionless elf standing against a tree. Almost regretfully, he sent forth the spell burst that slew them. Its echoes were still ringing off the trees around when he heard the slight scrape of a boot that made him spin around. To stare at a lone, horror-struck human warrior three paces away, coming toward him with sword raised. You're the slayer? the man asked face and knuckles white with fear. No, Ilbrin told him, backing away around the tree. The man hesitated, then resumed his cautious advance. Why did you kill my sword brothers? He snarled, snatching out a dagger to give himself two ready fangs. Ilbrin took another step back, keeping the tree between them and shrugged. You made a mistake, he told the human as they started to slowly circle the tree watching each other's eyes. I was riding along the trail, at peace and intending no harm to you, and you attacked me more than a dozen to one. Brigands? Adventurers? I'd no time to parley or see who you were. All I could do was defend myself. A little thought before swinging swords could have saved so much spilled blood. He smiled mockingly. You should be more careful when you go out in the woods. It's dangerous out here. That evoked the rage he'd hoped it would. Humans were so predictable. With a wordless roar, the warrior charged, hacking furiously. Ilbrin let the tree take most of the blows, waited until the blade got caught, then darted forth to snatch the man's dagger hand aside with one of his own hands, and pressed the other to the man's face, delivering the spell that would take his life. Flesh smoked and melted, gurgling the man went to his knees. By the despairing moan he made thereafter, he knew he was dying, even before he started clawing at his own flowing flesh, trying to get air. Not that I was unhappy to slay you all, Ilbrin told him lightly, seeing as how you cost me a perfectly good horse. He stepped back and shot a look all around, in case other surviving adventurers, or the slayer, whoever that might be, was approaching. No such peril seemed at hand. The warrior made a last choking noise, then seemed to relax. After all, Ilbrin told him, this is the dead place, I'm told. The elf turned away to walk through the camp and see if there was anything he might put to his own use. A few paces along, he stopped, looked around again for foes, and bent rather stiffly and plucked up a good slender blade from among the trodden leaves. Just in case... Ilbrin told the torn body of its dead staring owner, whose fingers would forever be stretched out now toward the blade he'd let fall, the blade that was now no longer there. As the elf reached out with his own sword to cut free the scabbard from amongst the gory, tangled harness, he added almost merrily, You never know when you'll need a good blade, after all. 16. If Magic Should Fail If magic should fail, Faroon shall be changed forever, and not a few folk would welcome those changes. For one thing, the very land itself might tilt under the hurrying weight of the oppressed and aggrieved, chasing down now powerless mages to settle old scores. I wonder what a river of wizard's blood would look like. Tamarist Ten Gloves, Bard of Elupar, 
from The Strings of a Shattered Lyre, published in The Year of the Behir. Begone! Mighty events shake all Ferun, and the holy ones within cannot come out to speak to you now. For the love of Mistra, begone! The guard's voice was deep and powerful. It rolled out over the gathered crowd like a storm-driven wave crashing across the sands of a beach. But when it died away, the people were still there. Fear made their voices high and their faces white, but they clung to the front steps of the house of the Lady Star, as if for their very lives, and would not be moved. The guard made a last grand get-hence gesture and stepped back off the balcony. I'm sorry, Bright Master, he murmured. They feel something is very wrong. It'd take the hounding spells of Mistra herself to shift them now. Do you dare to blaspheme here, in the holy place itself? The high priest hissed, eyes blazing with fury. He drew back his hand as if to strike the guard, who stood a head taller than he despite his own great height, then let it fall back to his side, looking dazed. Lost, he said lips trembling. All is lost. The guard enfolded the lord of the house in a comforting embrace as one holds a sobbing child and said, This shall pass, lord. Wait for nightfall. Many shall leave then. Wait. No peace. And watch for some sign. You have some guidance for this council? The high priest asked, almost desperately. He could not keep a quaver from his voice. The guard patted his shoulders and stepped away with a grave reply. Nay, lord, but look you, what else can we do? The lord of the house managed a chuckle that was perilously close to a sob and said, My thanks, loyal Laram. He drew in a deep breath, threw back his head as if donning his dignity like a mantle, and asked, What do warriors do when they must wait and watch inside their walls, dawdling until a great blow falls on them. Laram chuckled in return. Many things, Lord, most of which I leave to your wits to conjure up. There is one thing of comfort we undertake which I suspect me your question seeks. We make soup, pots and pots of it, as good and rich as we can manage. We let all partake, or at least smell if they cannot sup. The high priest stared at him for a moment then raised his hands in a why-not gesture and commanded the silently watching underpriests. Get hence to the kitchens and make soup. Go. You'll find, Lord, the hulking guard added, that Laram, one of his fellow guards, snapped. Fresh trouble. Without another word, the guard turned away from the lord of the house and ducked back out onto the balcony. The priest took two steps after him, only to find a guard barring his way. No, Lord, he said, face carefully expressionless. Twouldn't be wise. Some of them are throwing stones. Outside, the bright sun fell on the closed bronze doors of the house of the Lady Star. Many fists fell thereon, too, and the guards and gate priests had long since stopped answering knocks and cries for aid. They paced anxiously back and forth inside the gate, casting anxious glances at the bolts and bars, wondering if they'd hold. All of the spikes that could be found in the temple cellars had long since been driven between the stones to wedge the doors against being forced inward. The bright marks on those spikes told how often this morning the doors had already been sorely tested. The priest licked dry lips and asked, for perhaps the fortieth time, and if this all gives way, what? The guard nearest him waved violently for him to fall silent. The priest frowned and opened his mouth to snap an angry response. Then his eyes followed the guard's pointing hand to the doors, and his jaw dropped almost to his chest. A man's hand was protruding through the bronze, magic crackling around his wrist where it passed through the thick metal. It was gesturing, forming the hand signs used between clergy of Mistra when enacting silent rituals. The priest watched a few of them, then hissed, Stay here, and went pounding up the steps to a door that led into the barbican. He had to get onto that balcony. 
The hands of the tall man in the black cloak were trembling as he drew them back from the doors. He knew he'd been seen and knew the mood of the crowd pressing in behind him. It's no use, he said loudly. I can't get in. You're one of them, though, aren't you? A voice snarled close by his ear. I, I saw him use a spell he did, put in another high with fear and anger, or rather the angry need to lash out. The man in the black cloak made no reply, but looked up at the balcony in desperate hope. It was rewarded. Two burly guards came into view with long pikes in their hands, pikes fully able to reach down into and through anyone standing near the gate, and asked gruffly, more or less in unison, Yes, you have lawful business in this holy house? I do, the man in the black cloak told them ignoring the angry mutterings that rose in a wave after his words. Why are the gates closed? Great doings on high demanding contemplation on the part of all ordained servants of Mistra, the guard thundered. Oh, is there an orgy going on in there or just a pig-wallowing feast? Someone called from the thick of the crowd, and there were roars of agreement and derision. Aye, let us in, we want some too. Be gone, the guards bellowed, straightening to face the entire crowd. Does Mistra live? someone cried. Aye, others took up the call. Does the goddess of magic yet breathe? The guard looked scornful. Of course she does, he snarled. Now go away. Prove it, someone yelled. Cast a spell. The guard hefted his pike. I don't cast spells, Roldo, he said menacingly. Do you? Get one of the priests. Get them all, Roldo called. Aye, someone else agreed. And see if one of them, just one of them, can cast a spell. The roar of agreement that followed his words shook the very temple walls. But through it, the man in the black cloak heard one of the guards mutter, Aye, and make it a good big fireball right about there. The other agreed, not smiling. Look, the man in the black cloak said to them, I must speak to Cadeln. Cadeln Perusper. Tell him it's Tenthar. The nearest guard leaned over. No, you look, he said coldly. I'm not opening these gates for anybody, short of Holy Mistra herself. So if you can come back holding hands with her, and the two of you asking very nicely to come in, all right, but otherwise... A third figure was on the balcony, peering around the guard's shoulder, it wore the cloak and helm of a guard, but no gauntlets, and the helm, which was far too big for it, kept slipping forward over its face. An impatient hand shoved the helm back up out of the way, and the white, worried face of Cadeln, tome priest of the temple, stared down at his friend. Tenthar, he hissed. You shouldn't have come here. These people are wild with fear. You know, the man in the black cloak remarked almost casually, Standing down here with them, I'd begun to notice that. Then his control broke, and he almost clawed his way up the wall to the balcony, ignoring a warning pike thrust. The dirty blade stopped inches from his nose and hung there warningly. Tenthar paid it not a blind bit of attention. Cadeln, Tenthar was snarling. What's going on? Every last damned magic I work goes wild, and when I study, nothing. I can't get any new spells. It's the same here, the white-faced priest whispered. They're saying Mistra must have died, and— One of the guards hauled Cadeln away from the edge of the balcony, and the other jabbed viciously with his pike. Tenthar flung himself desperately back out of its reach and tumbled down the bronze doors to the ground. The crowd melted away a few paces as if by magic, and he found himself lying in a little cleared space with the pike once more hanging a handspan above his throat. Who are you? the guard behind it demanded. Answer or die. I have new orders. Tenthar sat up and thrust the pike head away with one contemptuous hand. When he scrambled to his feet, however, he took care to be a good two paces beyond its reach. Tenthar Teir Hamus is my name, he said sternly, opening his cloak to reveal rich robes and a gem-studded medallion blazing on his chest. Archmage of the Phoenix Tower. I'll be back. And with that grim promise, the archmage whirled around and pushed his way almost proudly through the crowd. All around him were murmurs of, It's true. Mistress dead? Magic all undone? 
and the like. A stone spun out of somewhere and struck Tenthar on the shoulder. He did not stop or try to turn, but struggled onward through bodies disinclined to let him pass. An archmage? someone cried. With no spells? another asked, close at hand. Another stone struck Tenthar on the head this time, and he staggered. There was a roar of mingled awe and exultant hunger all around him, and someone shrieked, Get him! Get him! A thunderous chorus echoed. Tenthar went to his knees, looked up to see boots and sticks and hands coming at him from all sides, clutched his precious medallion to guard against the spell going wild, and said the words he'd hoped not to have to say. Lightning crackled in all directions, and Tenthar tried not to look at the dying folk dancing to its hungry surges around him. Chain lightning is a terrible thing even when unaugmented. With the medallion involved, well... He sighed and stood up as the last of the screams died away, watching the bobbing heads of those who'd lived to flee grow smaller as they ran across the fields. He'd best be running, too, before some bloodthirsty idiot rallied them or the folk here who were only stunned and twitching recovered enough to seek revenge. The smell of cooked flesh was strong. Bodies were heaped on all sides. Tenthar gagged, then broke into a trot. He never even saw the pike hurled at him from the balcony. It fell well short and struck, quivering in the dirt. A blackened body rose from among the dead and tugged it free. The thing I hate most about these little games, it remarked to the empty air, is the cost. How many lives will be snuffed out before it's over this time? Another blackened thing rose, shrugged, touched the pike and said sadly, There's always a price, all our power, and we can't change that. There were two shimmerings in the air, and the two blackened bodies were gone. The pike winked out of sight an instant later. Are there archmages under every stone out yonder? Or just what bloody dancing gods were those? The guard who'd thrown the pike barked, more fear than anger in his tones. Mistra and Azuth, the priest beside him whispered. The guards turned to look at Cadeln and gasped in amazement. The missing pike had just appeared in the priest's shuddering hands. He stared at them, eyes full of wonder, and moaned. Mistra and Azuth, they were, standing right there, with the symbols they've granted us to know them by glowing above their heads, right there. He tried to point out into the litter of bodies, but decided to faint instead. He did it very well, eyes rolling up and body folding down. One of the guards caught him out of force of habit, and the other snatched hold of the pike. If gods were going to come calling... He didn't want to be standing there unarmed. Mistra is dead, the Dark Lady declared exultantly. Her priests find their spells to be but flickering things, and mages study and find no power behind their words. Magic is now ours alone to command, ours to control. The purple flames that raged in the brazier before her cast strange lights on her face as she raised eyes that were very large and dark to gaze at them all. Around the flames sat her eager audience, the six priests of the Dark Lady who'd agreed to work as wizards, harnessing for their spells the power of what had already become known in the temple as the secret in the sphere. With them, she could make the House of Holy Night the mightiest temple of Shar in all Faroon, and the faith of the Nightbringer the most powerful in all Toral. It might not even take long. Most loyal dread spells, the high priestess told them. You have a great opportunity to win the favor of Shar and power for yourselves. Go forth into Faroon and seek out the most capable mages and the largest holds of magic. Slay at will and seize all you can. Bring back tomes, rare things, and anything that bears the tiniest glow of magic. You must slay any of those servants of Mistra called the Chosen if you meet with them. We here shall work most diligently with our spells to try to find them for you. Your darkness? one of the wizards asked hesitantly. 
Yes, dread brother Elrin? Dark Lady Avroana's voice was silken, a clear warning to all that anyone who dared to interrupt her had better have a very good reason for doing so, or she'd soon give them one. My work involves far scrying our agents in Westgate, Elrin said quickly, and rumor now abroad in that city speaks of many recent sightings of a chosen in the vicinity of Starmantle, something about going into a dead place. I, too, have heard such tidings, the Dark Lady agreed eagerly. My thanks for giving us a location, Elrin. All of you shall go there immediately, and there begin your holy task. Thrust your hands into the flames. Oh, and most loyal dread spells, bear in mind that we can see and hear you always. Six faces paled, and six hands were reluctantly extended into the flames. Dark Lady of Rowena laughed delightedly at their fear and let them burn for a few moments ere she said the words that teleported them all elsewhere. It was very peaceful in the woods around the shrine, and since the killings had begun and fear had driven folks away, very quiet. Most days Yuldas Black Ram was alone on his knees before the stone block, half-heartedly lashing himself a few times, gently so as not to make much noise, and whispering prayers to the night singer. The shrine had been founded so nicely, consecrated with blood and a wild ritual that still made Yuldas blush to remember it. Now there were no black-robed ladies to dance and whirl barefoot around the horned block, and no one to lead him in the half-remembered prayers. So he did a lot of just thanking Shar for keeping him alive on his stealthy visits to the woods. He hoped she'd forgive him for not coming at night any more. May your darkness keep me safe from the slayer, Yuldas breathed, his lips almost touching the dark stone. May you give me to power and exultation over mine enemies, and make of me a strong sword to cut where you need things cut, and slash where it is your will to slash. O oh, most holy mistress of the night, hear my prayer. The beseeching of your most loyal servant, Yuldas Black Ram. Shar, hear my prayer. Shar, answer my prayer. Shar, heed my. Done, Yuldas, said a voice from above him crisply. Yuldas Black Ram managed to strike his head on the altar, somersault over backward to get a good four paces away, and get to his feet all in one blurred flurry of movement. When he froze, half turned to flee and panting hard, he was looking back at six bald-headed men in black and purple robes, standing in a semicircle around the altar facing him, with faint amusement on their faces. "'Lords of the Lady?' Yuldas gasped. "'Have my prayers been answered at last?' "'Yuldas,' the oldest of them said pleasantly, stepping forward. "'They have. At last. Moreover, a fitting reward has been chosen for you.' You are going to guide us into the dead place. P pray Shar, Yuldas replied, rolling his eyes wildly upward as he toppled to the turf in a dead faint. Revive him, Elrin commanded, not bothering to keep the contempt from his face or voice. To think that such as this worship the most holy lady of loss. Well, one of the other wizards commented, bending over the fallen Yuldas, we all have to start somewhere. The glowing spell sphere orbited the throne at an almost lazy pace. Sayareda gave it only casual attention, absorbed as she was in sending images of her peering self out into the trees to lure this bold Elminster back to her castle. I. Let us gently tease this fittingly powerful and somewhat attractive mage hence. Yet the news was clear enough, from all the mages she covertly far-scried. Word of the death of Mistra was spreading like wildfire. Spells were going wild all over Faroon. Mages were shutting themselves up in towers before grudge-holding commoners could get to them, or tarrying too long and getting caught on the ends of pitchforks in a dozen realms, and on and on. It was time to move at last and make Sayareda Lyonora once more a name to be feared. 
Abruptly, something tore through one of her images. Sayareda sat up with a frown and peered, trying to find out what it had been. The spell sphere abruptly lost its scene of city spires and flapping griffin wings behind armored riders and acquired the dappled gloom of the forest above her. A forest that held a crouching Elminster, several of her floating faces, and... Arrows snarled through her conjured visage and the dead leaves beyond, to thud into the forest loam and send Elminster scrambling around the other side of a tree. Arrows? Damned adventurers, she roared, her cry ringing back to her off the cavern roof and sprang up from the throne. The spell sphere winked out as it fell. The radiance around the stone seat faded, but she was already whirling up the shaft, her eyes spitting flames of mage fire. Were a bunch of blundering sword swingers going to shatter her long nursed plans now? The fittingly powerful and somewhat attractive Elminster boldly dodged another arrow, hurling himself on his face in wet moss and dead leaves, as another dark shaft whined past his ear like an angry hornet and fetched up in the trunk of a nearby hyaxal with a very solid thunk. El scrambled up, drawing breath for a curse and flung himself right back down on his face again. A second shaft hummed past low overhead, joining the first. The High Exel didn't look to be enjoying these visitations too much, but Elminster hadn't time to survey its sadness, or do anything else but charge to his feet, leap over a fallen tree, and whirl around behind its rotting trunk. He bobbed up into view right away, betting that the two archers wouldn't have time to put fresh arrows to their strings just yet, he had to see them. Ah, there. He loosed a stream of magic missiles at one, then ducked down again, hearing the approaching thud of booted feet running hard in his direction. It was time to get gone and be blessed quick about it. He sprinted away downhill and dodging from side to side, hearing crashing in his wake that heralded the coming of someone large, heavy armored, and sword waving. He didn't stop to exchange pleasantries, but whirled around a tree to let the grizzled armsman have some magic missiles full in the face. The man's head jerked back, wisps of smoke burst from his mouth and eyes, and he ran on blindly for another dozen paces before stumbling and crashing to the ground, dead or senseless. Dead or senseless? Hmm. T'would do as a motto for some adventuring bands, to be sure, but... It was time to circle around and take care of that second archer, or he'd be fleeing through the forest, feeling phantom arrows between his shoulder blades for the rest of the day, or until they brought him down. El trotted a goodly way off to the right and started to work his way back toward the ruin, keeping as low and as quiet as possible. It didn't matter if he spent hours worming his way closer, so long as he wasn't seen too soon. He had to get close enough to... A grim-looking man in leathers with a bow ready strung in his hand stepped into view around a gnarled fander not twelve paces away. He couldn't help but see a certain hawk-nosed mage the moment he lifted his eyes from the arrow he'd just dropped. L lifted his hand to shoot forth his last magic missile spell. A moment later the archer exploded into whirling bones and fire. L had a brief glimpse of two dark eyes, if they were eyes in a confused whirlwind of mist. Then whatever it was had gone, and scorched bones were thudding down onto the moss. The Slayer? It had to be. The talk had been all of something that burned its victims when it killed. This was it. Well met, Elminster murmured to the empty woods, and went cautiously forward. He knew he'd already find nothing but ashes and bones of the rest of the adventurers, but just in case... Sprawled garments, weapons, and bones were everywhere he looked, as he drew near the overgrown keep. The ruins seemed deserted again. A tense silence hung over them, almost as if something was waiting and watching for his approach. El stole back to the gaps in the wall he'd looked into before, that big chamber where he'd seen the wardrobes and... A mirror? That would bear another look, to be sure. He peered very cautiously into that vast room again and met those dark eyes once more, the mist they were at the heart of swirling around a wardrobe as its doors banged open. Then the mist flared into blinding brilliance and he couldn't see what was taken out of the wardrobe. 
Whatever it was, the whirlwind spun around and around it, almost as if deliberately hiding it from his view in its bright and chiming tatters as it sped away across the room. El almost clambered in the gap after it to see better, but paused prudently when the glowing mist did. It lingered in the farthest, darkest corner of the room for a moment, hovering above what looked like a well, then plunged down into that ring-shaped opening and out of sight. Ye want me to follow, do ye? Elminster murmured, looking at the well. He glanced around the room, taking in the peeling mirror, the row of wardrobes, the one holding an array of feminine apparel, the lounge, and the rest, then walked straight to the well. Very well, he said with a sigh, another reckless leap into danger. That does seem to be what this job most entails. And he clambered over the edge of the well, dug his hands into the first of a row of handholds in the stone, and tapped with the toes of his boots for another, found it, and started down. He might need his hell-bent flying spell for getting back out again. She laid out the three gowns on the stone at the bottom of the shaft as gently as a nurse stroking a sick child, and as gently set loose stones from the rubble over them. The exacting effort cost her much energy, but she worked swiftly, heedless of the cost, and darted away before her quarry got to the top of the shaft to look down. A moment later, she was sinking into one of the runes that sustained her, hiding her misty self entirely. She had been hungry too long, and the incessant chiming was even getting on her nerves. Branda Garris had been a mighty hero, tall and bronzed and strong. She had fed on him for three seasons, and he had come to love her and offer himself willingly. But in the end, she had drained him and gone hungry again. That was her doom. Once her own body had fallen to dust, what remained was a magic that needed to feed on the living or dwell within and necessarily burn out the innards of a young, strong, vital body. Brandegaris had been one such, the sorcerer Sardin another. But somehow mages, clever as they were, lacked something she craved. Perhaps they had too little vitality. She hoped this Elminster wouldn't be another such disappointment. Perhaps she could win his love, or at least his submission, and not have to fight him long to taste what power a chosen held. Come to me, she whispered hungrily, her words no more than the faintest of sighings above the deep graven rune. Come to me, man meal. 17. A Fine Day for Travel Travel broadens the mind and flattens the purse, they say. I've found it does rather more than that. It shatters the minds of the inflexible and depletes the ranks of the surplus population. Perhaps rulers should decree that we all become nomads. Then, of course, we could choose to stay only within the reach of those rulers we favor— and I can't conceive of the chaos and overburdened troops and officials that would be found in any realm in which folk could choose their rulers. Thankfully, I can't believe that any people would ever be crazed enough to do that. Not in this world, anyway. Yerinus Weyelidon, from Dissensions of Chesenton, published in The Year of the Spur. You're doing just fine, brave Yuldus. Dreadspell Elrin said soothingly, prodding their trembling guide with the man's own sword. Brave Yuldus arched away from the blade, but the noose around his neck, held tight and short-leashed in the fist of Dreadspell Femter, kept him from entirely missing its sharp reminder. Dreadspell Hrelgrith was walking along close by, too, his dagger held ready near the ribs of their unwilling guide. Shar is very pleased with you. Elrin told the man, as they went on along the almost invisible game trail deeper into the dead place. Now just show us this ruin. Oh, and Yuldus, reassure me again, it is the only ruin or building or cave or construct you know about anywhere in these woods, is it not? Choking around his noose, 
Yuldus assured him that it was. Oh, yes, dread lord, indeed it was. May the Nightbringer strike me down now if I lie, and all the watching gods bear witness. Femter didn't wait for Elrin's sign this time before jerking the noose tight enough to cut Yuldus off in mid-babble. The guide silently clawed at his throat, stumbling until Femter relented enough to let him breathe again. Irindel? Elrin asked, without turning his head. I'm watching, Dreadlord, the youngest Dreadspell replied eagerly. The first sign of walls or the like, I'll cry hold. It's not walls I'm seeing, the deep drawl of Dreadspell Deluth put in a few strides later. But an elf, alone, and walking with a drawn sword in his hand, yonder. The Sharan priests stopped, unnecessarily clapping their hands over the mouth of their guide, and glared through the trees. A lone elf looked back at them, disgust written plain on his face. A moment later, Elrin snarled, Attack! And the Sharans surged forward, Elrond and Deluth standing still to hurl spells. They saw the elf sigh, take off his cloak and hurl it high over a tree branch, then turn to face them, crouching slightly. Damned human adventurers, he cried. Haven't I killed enough of you yet? Ilbrin Starm watched the wizards run toward him. Charging wizards? Truly, Faroon was plunging deeper into madness with every passing day. Took up the blade that was battle booty from the last band of fools and said a word over it. When he threw it like a dart at the onrushing men, it glowed, split into three, and leaped away like three falcons diving at separate targets. At the same moment, a tree just behind the line of running wizards turned bright blue and tore itself out of the earth with a deafening groan, hurling earth and stones in all directions. Someone cursed, sounding very surprised. An instant later, a sheet of white lightning broke briefly over the running mages, and a man who seemed to have a noose around his neck convulsed, clawed at the air for a few moments and shrieked, My reward! and fell to earth in a twisted heap. The wizards ran on without pause, and Ilbrin sighed and prepared to blast them to nothingness. His three blades should have done something. One of the running mages grunted, spun around, and went down with something glowing in his shoulder. Ilbrin smiled. One. There was a flash. Someone cried out in surprise and pain, and the three remaining wizards burst through the still-shimmering radiance and came on, one of them shaking fingers that trailed smoke. Ilbrin lost his smile, some sort of barrier spell, and it had taken both of his other blades. He raised his hands and waited. Sure enough, now that they were close enough to him that the army of Ilbrin and the army of half a dozen mages could count each other's teeth, the panting wizards were coming to a halt and preparing to hurl spells at him. Ilbrin cloaked himself in a defensive sphere, leaving only a keyhole open for his next spell. If his measure of these dolts was correct, he'd not have overmuch to fear in this battle. Even with the wizard who'd taken his blade slowly crawling to his feet, and the two who hadn't come running strolling slowly closer in the distance. Abruptly the air in front of Ilbrin's sphere was filled with blue flowers, swirling about as they drifted to earth. An elf mouth crooked into a smile, by the startled oaths coming to his ears, that hadn't been supposed to happen. Perhaps he was caught up in some school of wizardry's battle test of the inept apprentices. He waited politely to see what else would come his way. A moment later, he blinked with new respect. The earth was parting with a horrible ripping sound between the boots of one of the mages and racing toward Ilbrin, zigzagging only slightly as it came. Trees, boulders, and all were hurled aside in the chasm's swift advance, and Ilbrin readied his lone flight spell just in case. He'd have to time this just right, collapsing the sphere and bounding aloft more or less in one smooth sequence. The chasm swerved and snarled past, trailing the awed yells of a wizard who seemed astonished he'd cast it. Ilbrin's eyes narrowed. What sort of madmen were these? Well, he'd wasted more than enough time and magic on them already. He hurled a quick spell of his own out of the keyhole and stood watching as the trunk of the shadow top he'd shattered a goodly distance above the wizards spun about almost lazily, then came crashing down. Wizards shouted and hurled themselves in all directions, 
but when the dancing, flailing branches receded to a shivering, one man lay broken like a discarded doll under a trunk ten times his girth. Ilbrin risked another spell through the keyhole. Why not a volley of magic missiles? These idiots seemed almost like bewildered actors playing at being mages, not foes to fear at all. He hoped a moment later that he hadn't just given the gods some sort of awful cue. If Mistra is dead, what's helping his spells? Dread spell Hrelgrith snarled, puffing his way back to where Elbrin stood watching, cold-eyed. Whatever god of magic elves pray to, dolt, Deluth answered, an instant before blue-white bolts of force came racing their way. Back, Elrin snapped. I don't think these can miss, but back anyway. This is costing us too much. Elrin's prediction proved to be right. None of the bolts missed. The dread spells grunted and staggered their ways back through the trees, hoping the elf wouldn't bother to follow them. Femter, Elrin snapped. A head snapped up. I'll be all right the next time the power surges into us. Femter replied grimly. Some sort of magical blade. Can't use my arm, though. Our guide, dead? Very, Femter said shortly, and there were a few dark chuckles. Erendil? Down, forever. Half a tree fell on him. Elrin drew in a deep breath and let it out in a ragged sigh, very conscious of the unseen eyes of Dark Lady of Rowena upon him. Right. Consider that fiasco our first battle practice. There'll be no more charging into any fray. From now on, we creep through these woods like shadows. When we find the ruin, we wait for the weave to feed us once more. Then, and only then, even if it takes all night, we advance. Out in these woods, only the Chosen really matters to us. And I'm not going to be caught off guard again. That's a good plan. Ilbrin agreed sarcastically, as he let his Clare audience collapse, said farewell to the idiot wizards and their chatter, and cast the guidance spell that would take him to these ruins they'd been heading for. He bid it seek out man-touched stones in any mass larger than four men, which should eliminate tombstones and the like, and in this general direction. Almost immediately he felt the pull of the magic, Ilbrin followed it obediently, striding off through the woods along an invisible but unwavering line. Ah, but magic could be useful at times. It had been cold and dark in Scorchstone Hall for many years. Too cold for the living. A skeleton threw back the shutters of one window to let the sun in and went back to a table where a spell book lay. Sitting down carefully in the stoutest chair left in the hall, the skeleton took up the tome, clutched it to its rib cage with both bony arms and folded around it, and called on the power of the spell it had cast earlier, the power that let it speak. It said only two words, firmly enough, that they echoed back from the dark corners of the room. Mistra, please. Blue-white fire burst forth from the book, the skeleton almost dropped the book in surprise, its bony fingertips clawing at its cover, as the flames that burned nothing washed over its bones, racing from the book to... her. Sharon Dalla shuddered as blue-white fire ran up and down her limbs, leaving something in its wake. She stared down at her glowing bones in wonder, then back at the book, feeling something rising in her throat. Beardaw stiffened at the sudden sound that came through the trees and almost dropped his walking stick. He turned to be absolutely sure that the faint weeping was coming from Scorchstone. It was. In the very heart of that ruined mansion, a woman was sobbing, crying as if she'd never find breath to speak again. In dark, haunted Scorchstone, where the skeletal sorceress walked, Beardaw broke into a frantic shuffle, heading for the maid, where strong drink and plenty of it would be waiting. Along here it should be, Beldrun said, as they came around the bend and almost rode down an old man with a walking stick, who looked to have just taken up trotting and was wheezing loudly to let the world know. There, up ahead on the left, 
the fare made of ripple stones. We can get a good meal there, and decent beds a few doors on, and ask in both places about where Elminster's been hereabouts. I know he likes to look at old mages' towers. And their tombs, too, Tabarist put in. It's been some years since I stopped here, but old Ralder, if he's still alive, used to roast a mean buck. The down at heels Harper, with the pale brown hair and eyes riding between them, nodded pleasantly. Sounds good, was all he said, as they slowed their horses at the ramshackle porch and rang the gong that would bring the stable boys. An old man sitting on a bench deep in one corner of the porch looked at them sharply, especially at Tabarist, as they strode inside. After a moment, he got up and drifted into the maid on their heels. It seemed Caladaster was hungry enough for a second early even feast this day. By the time Bear Dog came puffing up to the front door of the maid, Caladaster was sitting with the three horsemen who'd almost ridden him down as if they'd known each other for years. Aye, I know this Elminster right enough, Caladaster was saying, though a few days back I'd have answered you differently. He came walking up to this very tavern. Beardaw, oh, hey, this is Beardaw. Come sit down with us, old dog, and I were warming yon bench, where you saw me just now, and he came striding up and bought us dinner. A huge feast it was, too, in return for us telling him about Scorchstone Hall. Gods, but we ate like princes. We can do no less, the youngest, poorest-looking of the three horsemen said then, saying his first quiet words since handing a stable boy some coins. Eat hearty, both of you, and we'll trade information again. Oh, uh, well enough. That's very kind of you, to be sure, Caladaster said heartily as he watched platters of steaming turtles and buttered snails brought to the table. Alney Scover even winked at him as the tankards were set down beside them. Caladaster blinked. Gods, he was becoming a local lion. So where and what is Scorchstone Hall? Beldrune asked almost jovially, plucking up a tankard and taking a long pull at it. Beardaw didn't fail to notice the face the newcomer made at the taste of the brew, or how quickly he sat down the tankard again. A ruined mansion just back along the road a ways, he said quickly, determined to earn his share of the meal. You passed it on your way in. The road bends around it, just this side of the bridge. It's warded, Caladaster said quietly. You gentle sirs are mages, are you not? Three pairs of eyes lifted to him in brief silence until Tabarist sighed, took up a buttered snail that must have burned his fingers, and grunted, It shows that badly, does it? Caladaster smiled. I was a mage years ago. Still am, I suppose. You have the look about you. Eyes that see farther than the next hedge, paunches and wrinkles, but yet fingers as nimble as a minstrel's not to mention the wardings on your saddlebags. Beldrune chuckled. All right, we're mages, two of us at any rate. Not three? Caladaster's brows rose. The man with the pale brown eyes and the tousled hair smiled faintly and said, Here and now, I harp. Ah, Caladaster said, carefully not glancing at the regulars in the maid, who were bent almost out of their chairs, straining not to miss a word of what passed between these travelers and the two old tankard tossers. Wizards now, and haunted Scorchstone. Mustn't miss this. A harper and two wizards hunting Elminster. Caladaster felt a little better now about telling them things. Hadn't Elminster had summit to do with starting the harpers? Scorchstone Hall, Caladaster continued, in a voice so low that Beardaw's sudden humming completely cloaked it from the ears of folks at other tables, is the home of a local sorceress, a lady by the name of Sharon Dalla, a good mage and dead these many years. Of course, there are unusual tales of her being seen walking around past her windows as a skeleton and all. But you'd have to be a damned good tree climber to get to where you could just see a window of the hall, let alone look through its closed shutters. He got smiles at that and continued. Whatever. Elminster asked us all about her, and we warned him about the wards, but it's my belief he went in there and did summit. 
We asked him to stop by our places. We live, Berda and I, in the two cottages hard by the Scorchstone, twixt there and here. When he was done, so we'd know he'd fared well, and we wouldn't have to go in there looking for his body, Berda growled and went back to his humming. Tabarist and the harper exchanged amused glances. Caladaster gave his old friend what some folks would call a dirty look and took up his tail again. He did drop by to see us. Looked right happy, too, though he had a little sadness about him, like folk get when they remember friends now gone, or see old ruins they remember as bright and bustling. He said he'd a task to get on with, and had to head east. We warned him about the Slayer, of course, but— The Slayer? the harper asked quietly. Something about his words made the whole maid fall silent from door to rafters, Alni Scaver, the tavern master, moved quickly forward. It's not been seen here, lords, he said, whatever it be. Aye, you're safe here, someone else grunted. Oh, then why'd old Therloon pack up and move back to— He said he was going to see his sister, her being sick and all. Caladaster's open hand came down on the table with a crash. If you don't mind— he said mildly into the little silence that followed and turned to the three travelers again. The slayer is summit that has the high duke up in his castle star mantle way very worried. Summit is killing everything that lives in the forest or travels the coast road past it, between Ogle Stream, just beyond us here, and Rairdrin Hill. Cows, foxes, entire bands of hired adventurers, and several of them too, everything. They've taken to calling it the dead place, this stretch of woods, but no one knows what's doing the killing. Some say the dead have been burned away to bones. Others say other things, but no matter. We don't know what killer we're facing, so folk been calling it the Slayer. He looked around the tap room. Well enough. Said it all, didn't I? There were various grunts and grudging agreements, one or two hastily shushed dissenting opinions, and Caladaster smiled tightly and lowered his voice again. Elminster walked straight into the dead place he did, and must be there now, he said. I don't know right why he had to go there, but it's summit important, isn't it? There was a brief silence again. Then the harper said, I think so, at the same moment as Tabaris snapped, Everything Elminster does is important. You're going after him? Caladaster asked, in a voice that was barely above a whisper. After a moment, the harper nodded again. I'm going with you, Caladaster said, just as quietly. That's a lot of woods, and you'll need a guide. Moreover, I just might know where he was headed. Beldrun stirred. Well, he said gravely, I don't know about that. You're a bit too old to be going adventuring, and I'd not want to be old. Old? Caladaster asked, his jaw jutting. What's he, then? He pointed at Tabarist. A blushing young lass? That old mage fixed Caladaster with a gaze that had made far mightier men quail and snapped. Just might know where Elminster is heading to? What did he tell you, or are you guessing? This blushing young lass wants to know. There's a ruin in that forest, Caladaster said quietly. In off the road. You can tramp around in the trees all day waiting to get eaten by the slayer while you search for it. Or I can take you right to the ruin. If I'm wrong, well, at least you'll have one more old overweight mage and his spells along for the jaunt. Overweight? Tabris snapped. Who's overweight? Ah, uh, Beldrin said, clearing his throat and reaching for a dish of cheese-stuffed mushrooms that Alni Scaver had just set down on the table. That'd be me. I don't think it's a good idea to bring one more man along, Tabarist said sharply, whom we may have to protect against the gods alone know what. Ah, uh, the harper said quietly, laying a hand on Tabarist's arm. But I think I'd very much like to have you along, Caladaster Dearmory. If you can leave with us in the next few minutes, that is, and not need a night longer to prepare. Caladaster pushed back his chair and got up. I'm ready, he said simply. 
There was something like a smile deep in the harper's eyes as he rose, set a stack of coins as tall as a tankard on the table. Many eyes in the room bulged and said, Tavern master, our horses. Here's stabling for a ten-day and for the feast. If we come not back to claim them by then, consider them yours. We'll walk from here. You set a good table. Bayardaw was staring up at his old friend, his face pale. C Calidaster? he asked. Are you going yon in truth into the dead place? The old wizard looked at him. Aye, but we can't take along an old warrior, so don't fear. Stay. We need you to eat all the rest of this for us. I, I, Bear Daw said, and his eyes fell to his tankard. I wish I wasn't so old, he growled. The harper laid a hand on his shoulder. It's never easy, but you've earned a rest. You were the lion of the Elver Salt, were you not? Bear Daw gaped up at the harper as if he'd just grown three heads and a crown on each one. How did you know about that? Calidaster doesn't know about that. The harper clapped his shoulder gently. It's our business to remember heroes forever. We're minstrels, remember? He strode to the door and said, There's a very good ballad about you. And then he was gone. Bear Daw half rose to follow, but Calidaster pushed him firmly back down. You sit and eat. If we don't come back, ask the next harper through to sing it to you. He went to the door, then turned with a frown. All those years, he said, scowling, and you never told me you were the lion. Just such a little thing it slipped your mind, huh? He went out the door. Tabarist and Veldrun followed. They just gave him shrugs and grins at the door, but Tabarist turned with his fingers on the handle and growled, If it makes you feel better, you're not the only one who doesn't know what's going on. The door scraped shut, and Bear Daw stared at it blankly for a while, long enough that everyone else had come back from the windows and watching the four men walk out of town, and sat down again. Alni Scaver lowered himself into the seat beside Bear Daw and asked hesitantly, you were the Lion of Elversalt? A long time ago, Bear Daw said bitterly. A long time ago. If you could go back to some moment then, the tavern master asked a tankard in front of him softly, what moment would it be? Bear Daw said slowly, Well, there was a night in Suzale... We'd spent the early evening running through the castle there chasing young noble ladies who were trying to put their daggers into one another. You see, there was this dispute about... Turning to Alniskaver to properly tell him the tale, Bayardaw suddenly realized how silent the room was. He lifted his eyes and turned his head. All the folk of Ripplestones old enough to stand were crowded silently around him in a ring, waiting to hear. Bayardaw turned very red and muttered, Well, twas a long time ago. Is that when you got that medal? Alni Scaver asked slyly, pointing at the chain that disappeared down Bayardaw's none too clean shirt front. Well, no, the old warrior answered with a frown. That was. He sat back and blushed an even darker shade. Oh, gods, he said. The tavern master grinned and slid Bairdaw's tankard into the old warrior's hand. You were in the castle in Suzale chasing noble ladies up and down the corridors, and no doubt the purple dragons were chasing you and— Ha! Bairdaw barked. They were indeed. Have you ever seen a man in full plate armor fall down a circular stair? Sounded like two blacksmiths fighting in a forge. Why, we— one of the villagers clapped Alniskaver's shoulder in silent thanks. The tavern master winked back as the old warrior's tale gathered speed. Not all that much more sun today, Calidaster grunted. Once we're in under the trees. Hmm, Beldrun agreed. Deep forest, lots of rustlings and weird hootings and such. Calidaster shook his head. Not since the slayer. 
he said. Breezes through the leaves is all. Oh, and sometimes dead branches falling. Otherwise, tis silent as a tomb. Then we'll hear it coming all the easier, the harper said calmly. Lead on, Calidaster. The old wizard nodded proudly as they strode on down the road together. They'd gone some miles and were almost at the place where the overgrown way to the ruins turned off the coast road when a sudden thought struck him, as cold and as sudden as a bucket of lake water in the face. He was very careful not to turn around so that the harper could see his face. This harper who'd never given his own name. But from that moment on, he could feel the man's gaze on him, a cold lance tip touching the top of his spine where his neck started. The harper had called him by his full name, Calidaster Daermree. Calidaster never used his last name, and he hadn't told the harper his last name. He never told anyone his last name. Bayardaw didn't know it. In fact, there was probably no one still alive who'd heard it. So how was it this harper knew it? 18. No Shortage of Victims The one certainty in a coup, orc raid, or well-side gossip session is that there will be no shortage of victims. Raldric Hallowshaw, Jester from To Rule a Realm, From Turret to Midden, published circa The Year of the Bloodbird. It was dark in silence once the scrape of his boots had stilled. He was alone in the midst of cold, damp stone, the dust of ages sharp in his nostrils, and a feeling of tension as something watched him from the darkness and waiting. Elminster let himself grow as still as the stone handholds he clung to, faced the aware and lurking darkness, and called up one of the powers Mr. had granted him. It was one he'd used far too little, because it required quiet concentration and time, far more time than most of the beings he shared Faroon with were ever willing to give. Too often these days life seemed a headlong hurry. His awareness ranged out through the waiting, listening darkness. Things both living and unliving he could not see, but magic, when El concentrated just so, he could feel so keenly that he could make out surfaces on which Dwemer clung, the tendrils of spell bindings, and even the faint, fading traces of preservative magics that had failed. All of those things lay before him, Faint magics swirled everywhere, none of them strong or precisely located, but outlining a large cavern or open space. A good way off on the floor of this chamber or cavern, or down in a pit, he could not tell which, several closely clustered nodes of great, not-so-slumberous magical might throbbed and murmured ceaselessly. L blinked. Trap or no trap, he had to see what waited here that could hold such magical might. He'd been led here. The swirling sentience that had done it was watching him, or at least knew of his coming. So what was the point of stealth? El cast a stone-probing spell, seeking pits or seams ahead of him. Shrouded in its eerily faint blue glow, he stepped warily forward. Great expanses of the floor were the natural rock of the cavern, as El proceeded, this gave way smoothly to a floor of huge stone slabs, smooth-polished and level. No mosses had stained them, but here and there the fine white fur of salts leaching out of age-old rock trailed finger-like across the stone. A throne or seat of the same stone-faced Elminster, empty of magic, surprisingly, though it was almost hidden from view behind the dazzle thrown off by the seven nodes of magic when he viewed it with his mage sight. Thankfully, the seat was empty. El sighed, threw back his head, and stepped forward, seven nodes blinding in their magical might. Predictable or not, he could not ignore such power and remain Elminster. He smiled, shook his head ruefully, and took another step. He might well die here, but he could not turn away. The human was coming nearer. 
the great foe would soon be within reach, but also close to the runes that were too powerful to safely approach. Too close. It would probably get only one chance, so it would have to be a shattering blow that even a great god-touched mage could not hope to survive. After all these years, a few days or even months would matter not at all. The slaying stroke did. The strike that would reveal him and harm the foe all at once had to be one that destroyed, or at least ruined his foe into something powerless but aware. Aware of the pain he would then deal to it at leisure, and of who was harming it during that long, dark time, and why. So wait a bit more, like a patient ghost in the shadows. Two dark eyes that blazed like two inky flames of fury peered from the depths of one of the darkest clefts in the rear of the cavern and watched the wary wizard step forward to his doom. Years consumed by the ache to avenge, the gnawing need that ruled him night and day, years that had all come down to this. Yes, Vaelum, Dreadspell Elrin asked his voice dangerously soft and silky. A long, tense creeping advance to a ruin where powerful foes were almost certainly waiting for them had not improved his temper, especially after one of his boots had found its first muddy, water-filled old burrow hole. That had occurred three paces before his other boot found the second. He'd lost count since then of how many creeper thorns had torn at him and raked across his hands and face, and all of it, of course, watched sneeringly from afar by the cruel upper priestesses of the house, among them the dark lady herself. Vaelum was practically dancing with excitement, his eyes large and round. The foreguard of the Sharan wizards was a thin, soft-spoken priest, both careful and thorough in his duties. He was more excited now than Elrin had ever seen him. Dark brother, he hissed excitedly, I found something. No, Elrin murmured, frowning. Really? You do surprise me. It's a stone, Vaelum continued, astonishingly not catching Elrin's thick sarcasm at all, or displaying uncommonly swift skill at hiding his recognition of it. A stone with writing on it. Writing that says... Well, uh, just one letter, actually, but one as long as a man is tall. It's a K. No... Femter gasped sarcastically. Could it be? Brother, it is, Vaelum confirmed. He seemed genuinely oblivious to their derision. Show us, Elrin ordered curtly, and raised his voice a trifle. Brothers, move slowly, keep apart, and watch the trees around. I don't want us crowded together when someone strikes from hiding. If we arrange things so that one fireball might take care of all of us, a hostile mage might not be able to resist his opportunity, hmm? Aye, Diluth murmured at the same time as someone else. Elrin couldn't tell who muttered, Thinks of everything, our Elrin. Dark thoughts or not, the wizards of Shar reached the stone slab Vaelum had found without incident. It lay between two mossy banks, almost entirely covered with years of rotting, fallen leaves, but the K could clearly be seen. The deep graven letter sprawled across a little more ground than one of the ornate temple chairs would cover. The stone slab seemed both old and huge. Elrin leaned forward, not bothering to hide his own swift-rising excitement. Magic. This had to have something to do with magic, strong magic. And magic was what they were here for. Uncover it all, he ordered and stood back prudently to watch as this was done. The stone proved to be as long a cross or longer than a man laid out straight on his back, and twice that in the other direction, as well as being at the one point where the ground dipped along its edges, at least as thick as the length of a short sword. When they were done uncovering it, the Sharans stared at the massive slab, and it lay there patiently looking back at them. It knew who would blink first. After the silence grew uncomfortably long and the lesser priests started snatching sidelong glances at their leader, Elrin sighed and said, Diluth, work the spell that wizards use to reveal magic. I can see no trigger to this, but there must be one. 
Deloth nodded and did so. Elrin was as shocked as everyone else when he raised his head slowly and said, No magic at all. None upon yon slab or around it. Nothing but what few things we carry within reach of my spell. Impossible, Elrin snapped. Deloth nodded. I agree, but my spell cannot lie to me, can it? As Elrin stood glaring at him, there was a common gasp of relief, of held breaths let out from the other Sharans, and they strode forward to stand on the slab as if it had been calling to them. Elrin whirled, a shout of warning rising to his lips, a shout that died unuttered. The priests under his command strode across the slab, scraped their boot heels on it, stomped and strolled, staring about at the trees as if the slab was an enspelled lookout that gave them some sort of special sight. No bolts of lightning burst from the stone to slay them, and none of them shifted shape, screamed, or acquired unusual expressions on their faces. Instead, one by one, they shrugged and fell silent, blinking at each other and back at Elrin, until Hrelgrith said what they were all thinking. But there must be some magic here, some purpose for this, and it can't be the lid of a tomb, or you'd need a dragon to lift it on and off. Deluth raised a brow. And because we have no dealings with dragons, no one does. What if this is some sort of storage box built by a dragon for its own use? In the midst of a forest, right out in the open and down low, not girt about with rock? Admitting my unfamiliarity with worms, that still feels wrong to me, Femter replied. No, this smacks of the work of men or dwarves working for men, or mayhap giants skilled at stonemasonry. So what or who doth the K refer to? Vaelum burst out. A king or a realm? Or a god, Daleth echoed quietly, and something in his voice brought all eyes upon him. Kossith? In a forest? Hrelgrith said in puzzled tones. Nay, nay, Vaelum said excitedly. What was the name of that mage in the legend who defied the gods to steal all magic and become himself lord over all magic? Clar? No. Carsis. And as that name left the young Sharan's mouth, he vanished, gone in the instant ere he could draw breath. The slab where he had stood so close between Femter and Hrelgrith that they could easily have jostled elbows with him was empty. Those two brave and steadfast priests sprang and sprinted away from the slab with almost comical haste. As Deluth nodded grimly, his eyes fixed on the spot where Vaelum had stood, and Elrin said slowly, Well, well. The four remaining priests stared at the slab in silence for a few tense moments before the most exalted dread spell said almost gently, Deluth? Stand upon the letter, and utter the name Vaelum did. Deluth cast a quick glance at Elrin, read in his face that this was a clear and firm order, and did as he was bid. Femter and Hrelgrith shifted uneasily as they watched their most capable comrade wink out of existence, and the appropriate one couldn't suppress a low groan of fear when Elrin said, Now do likewise, Hrelgrith. Relgrith was trembling so with fear that he could barely shape the name Carsis, but he vanished as swiftly and utterly as his predecessors. Femter shrugged and strode onto the slab without waiting for an order, looking back for Elrin's nod of assent when he'd planted his boots squarely in the center of the giant letter. The nod was given, and another false wizard disappeared. Now alone, Elrin looked around at the trees, saw nothing moving or watching, shrugged, and followed his fellow Sharans onto the slab. Even before their battle with the elf who'd slain Eärendil with such casual ease, he'd thought this entire scheme of holy Sharans trying to be mages was wrong, dangerously wrong. Dread spells indeed. Still, if by some miracle what lay at the other end of this teleport was not one huge trap, it just might lead to enough magic to win them Dark Lady Avroana's holy approval and survival long enough to enjoy it. He smiled slowly at that thought, said Carsis with slow deliberation, and watched the world whirl away.
A red radiance lit up the darkness, gleaming back from a hundred curves of metal and countless gems. The light was coming from the floor. Wherever they'd walked, the boot prints were aglow. It was too late to cry out a warning about awakening guardian spells or beings. The Elam was already wading through knee-deep shifting wonders to pluck at a gauntlet whose rows of sapphires were winking with their own internal light. The lambent glow of awakened magic echoed in sinister chatoyance from a dozen places around the crypt. The low-ceilinged room was crammed with heaped treasures, most of them strange to the eye, and all of them, by the looks of it, harboring magic. Elrin managed to keep from gasping aloud, but he was conscious of the quick glance Deluth threw him and knew his awe and wonder must be written plainly on his face. The junior dread spells certainly hadn't wasted any time. Relgrith seemed to be waltzing with an armored figure as he tried to wrest a gorget from it, and a row of sheathed wands slapped and dangled against Femter's right thigh. Depending from a gem-encrusted belt that enwrapped his waist as if it had been made for him, it had altered to fit him, of course. The eager-eyed priest was already reaching into another heap of armbands and anklets, seeking out something else that had caught his eye. Vaelum was drawing on the gauntlet now, his eyes already on something else. Only Deluth stood empty-handed, his hands raised to deliver a quenching spell should one of the reckless younger dread spells unleash something that could doom them all. Elrin darted glances in all directions, saw nothing moving by itself and no doors or other ways out of the stone-walled room, and asked quietly, O oh, most diligent dread spells, has anyone spared a thought for how we'll be able to leave this place? Carsis, Relgrith said clearly, the gorget clutched triumphantly in his hands. Nothing happened, but Vaelum was already pointing into the farthest, dimmest corner of the chamber. Another K in a clear spot of floor yonder, he reported. That'll be it. Aye, but to take us back out? or in deeper to somewhere else unknown? Deluth asked. Moreover, if I was intending to slay thieves who found their way hence uninvited, the way out is where I'd place guards of one sort or another, Elrin added. Then, having not moved a pace from where he'd appeared, said, Carsis, carefully. No whirling before his eyes occurred again, but he was unsurprised. Slithering metallic sounds heralded Vaelum's continued digging, and as Elrin watched, he saw Femter slip something into his robes, his fingers working at a hitherto hidden underarm pouch. Take nothing you cannot carry, the senior dread spell warned, and be fully prepared to surrender unto the Dark Lady every last item of magic we bear out of this place, no matter how trifling. We are not unobserved. Now and always. Femter's head snapped up, and he blushed as he found Elrin's eyes upon him. He opened his mouth to say something, but Deluth forestalled him by asking the room at large, Has anyone found something whose powers are obvious? He was answered by shaken heads and frowns. Elrin used the toe of his boot to open a small black coffer, lifted his eyebrows to the ceiling when he saw the row of rings it contained snapped it shut again, then blinked at what had lain next to it. Deluth, he asked quietly, inclining his head toward the heap of gleaming mysteries by his boot. That circlet, hasn't that symbol been used to mean healing? Deluth pounced on the diadem. It was of plain but massy gold over some more durable metal, and it bore the device of a gleaming sun cupped in two stylized hands. Yes, he said excitedly. He held it up to show the others and snapped, Find more of these. Leave off looking at other things for now. The lesser dread spells did as they were bid, digging and tossing aside treasures and rising from time to time with cries of satisfaction. Deluth took the items they proffered, four circlets and a bracer, and Elrin snapped, Enough. All of you, take only so much as what you can wear or carry— and leave swords and helms and such like behind. We dare not try to awaken anything here. Gird yourselves as if for battle. 
I don't want to see anyone staggering under an armload of loose items. He reached down and plucked up a number of scepters from among a litter of metal-bound tomes, platters, and smaller boxes. Then, as if in afterthought, he casually picked up the black coffer, its dozen rings riding safely hidden inside it. A few moments of work with the long tongs that always rode in his belt pouch, and the scepters were riding ready at his hip, the coffer hidden down the front of his breeches. Elrin was ready. He said briskly, Balaam, the honor is yours, I believe. Take us from this place. The youngest dreadspell looked at the clear space at the back of the crypt, waiting in silence for him, swallowed, and said, You said there might be guards. Elrin nodded. I have every confidence that you'll deal with them quite capably, he said flatly, and waited. Reluctantly, the youngest priest turned wizard, picked his way through the crowded room, slowing as he approached the letter on the floor. Four pairs of eyes watched him go, their owners crouching down behind heaps of unidentified magic. Vaelum sent them all a look of mingled anger and despair, drew himself erect, and snapped, Carsis! As swiftly and as silently as he'd first left them, Vaelum disappeared. As if that had been a signal, something moved in the heap nearest to Helgrith, rising amid a clatter of many small things, sliding and tumbling as the Sharan stumbled back, moaning in wordless alarm. Do nothing, Eldrin snapped. In frozen silence, the four men watched a glowing sword rise into view, its naked and glittering blade aimed somewhere between Duluth and Elrin. It seemed a good five or six feet long, its ornate hilt a wink with many lustrous gems, an ever-changing array of runes and letters flickering momentarily up and down the blue flank of its blade. Relgrith, Elrin ordered, follow Vaelum. Keep low and do nothing in haste. Go now. When the second sweating dread spell winked elsewhere, the sword in the air seemed to shiver for a moment, but otherwise moved not. Elrin watched it for a while, then said slowly, Femter, follow the others. Again the sword stayed where it was. When only Deluth and Elrin were left, the senior dreadspell asked his most capable comrade, In case some spell prevents us from ever returning here, is there anything in particular we should bear with us? Deluth shrugged. It'd take years to examine all that's here, and even then we'd only know a few powers of each thing. This is utterly fantastic. There's more magic crowded in here around us than I think all who worship Holy Shar in their thousands can muster. If I have to take just one thing, let it be that stand of staves yonder, four staves, I think, almost one for each of us, and all of them sure to hold some sort of magic we can wield in a battle. If we can awaken them, we can at least play convincingly at being archmages for a little time. Let's hope it's long enough. A little time, Elrin agreed, when it comes. To each, they gave the floating sword another long look, slipped carefully past it, and Deluth took the two staves under one arm and pulled out a wand he'd found earlier in the other. The healing circlets bulged in his grip. Elrin looked down at Deluth's ready wand, smiled tightly, and quoted the saying, We dare not trust anyone save Holy Shar herself. As he spoke, he raised the wand already in his own hand into view so that Deluth could see it. I mean this for perils I may find beyond the teleport, Deluth said carefully, not for closer dangers. His voice changed, sharpening in alarm. Where the sword? Elrin whirled around to find the sword hanging just as before. He was still turning as he heard Deluth add calmly, Carsis! The senior dreadspell sprang wildly sideways, just in case Deluth had found the urge to trigger his wand irresistible and sprawled on a heap of enspelled clothing. Glowing mesh flickered under him as he slithered painfully down it, traveling over an array of sharp points. Hastily Elrin clawed his way upright, snatched another look at the sword, and found it still motionless. He looked around the room, down at the red footprints already beginning to fade to the hue of old blood around at the thankfully motionless heaps of treasure, and cast his gaze once more down at the clothes he'd fallen on. Surely that was a stomacher such as haughty ladies wore. He caught up one garment then another, 
feeling the tingling of powerful magic surging through his fingertips. They were all gowns with cutouts in the meshes beneath ornate bodices. Elrin of Shar looked at the shoulders of one, frowning in consideration, then shrugged and began to strip off his own clothes. He'd best hurry, if he was to be swift enough to keep the others out of mischief, or knowing this lot just from wandering off without him. Struggling in the growing dimness while trying to keep his eye on the sword floating nearby, Elrin was briefly glad they'd found no mirror that he'd have to look at himself in. He could imagine Avroana's mirth as she watched him battling the unfamiliar garment, and when at last he stood on the letter on the floor, and with one wary eye on that floating blade, uttered the name Carsis, and it was just this snarled side of a heartfelt curse. The smoking stump of what must have been an old and large duskwood gave mute testimony to the effectiveness of something one of the younger dread spells had awakened. Elrin stared at it with dark anger rising in him, but before he could say anything, Femter was thrusting a ring at him excitedly. Dark brother, look! This ring against the best seeking brother Deluth can cast completely cloaks the dreamers of all magic in contact with its wearer. One could go into the presence of a king armed for a beholder war and strike with impunity. Such bold stratagems are usually more effective in ballads than in real life, Elrin replied severely, to say nothing of prudence. He looked for Deluth and found him carefully taking forth one circlet after another from his script. Ah, the leader of the dread spells announced in satisfaction. A wiser way to spend time. Let us all heal ourselves, then devote a short time to examining wands and staves before resuming our journey to the ruins. Several more trees suffered in the moments that followed. The healing items all proved to be of more effectiveness than a single use. Two of the staves proved to have no more battle-worthy spells than the ability to spit forth the streaking bolts men called magic missiles, but the others could unleash beams of ravening fire and explosive bursts of magic, and two of those seemed able to drain touched magic items and even the spells of their wielders upon command to power their most destructive attacks. What shining luck! Vayelum laughed, blasting a helpless shadow top sapling to ashes. Luck? Holy Shar led us to this spot, Dark Brother, Elrin said severely, playing to the priestesses watching from afar. Shar guides us always. You will do well never to forget that. Of course, Vayelum said hastily, then laughed heartily as the staff in his hands snarled again, and another tree vanished in roiling flames that fell away into streamers of smoke diving down to the leaf mold all around. Vayelum of Shar, Elrin said sharply, stop that wasteful destruction at once. I'd rather not have this forest aflame around us or every druid and mage within a hundred miles appearing around us to give battle. Have you forgotten Irindel's fate already? Vayelum grimaced but he couldn't seem to stop fondling and hefting the staff, like a warrior who's just been handed a superb blade. My apologies, Dark Brother, he said, chastened. I got caught up in its power. He licked his lips, firmly grounded the staff, and asked, as if seeking approval, Do you know how tempting it is just to blast down everything that irritates or stands against you? Yes, Vayelum, as a matter of fact, I do, Elrin replied and wiggled the wand in his hand, the wand pointed at Vayelum's face, ever so slightly to draw the younger man's eyes. As Vayelum saw and paled, the senior dreadspell continued grimly. It's just one of many such temptations. Erlen smiled tightly and thrust the wand back into his belt. Aye, he added slowly, setting out at a steady pace in the direction of the ruins. One of many. He gestured curtly for the dread spells to follow. Reluctantly, they did so. Vayelum stopped to cast a longing look back at the stone slab and the woods beyond it, and found himself looking right into the coldly smiling eyes and leveled staff of Deluth, who was watchfully bringing up the rear. Vayelum managed a half-hearted smile, but Deluth's eyes grew no warmer. The youngest surviving dread spell swallowed, turned, and trudged off toward doom.
Now this curling of the leaf, on the other hand, tells you that this is a si- Starsunder paused in mid-word and straightened up suddenly, almost knocking his head against Umbregard's. The human mage stumbled hastily back out of the way as the elf threw out his hands. Still standing dramatically stiff with his arms spread, the moon elf threw back his head and opened his mouth as if trying to taste the sky. Silence fell. Umbregard watched his statue-like friend for what seemed like a very long time before he dared to ask, Star Sunder? You expect someone else to jump into this body just because I stop moving? came the mild reproof, as Starsunder turned his head, spun around, and took hold of Umbregard's arm all in one smooth motion. Do you know of some body-snatching wizardly peril I'm unaware of? W where are we going? Umbregard asked in lieu of a reply, as the slender moon elf practically dragged him around and between trees, dark green half-cloak swirling. Where we're needed, and urgently, Starsunder said, almost absently urging the human he was towing into a trot. And where? Umbregard was puffing now, even though they were descending a fern-covered slope rather than climbing. Might that be? In a forest almost as old as this one, across an arm of the sea, Star Sunder replied, his voice as calm and his breathing as steady as if he'd been lounging at ease on a giant leaf rather than racing through the woods, leaping fallen trees and roots and swinging around forest giants. No place that humans remember a name for. Why? Umbregard almost shouted, sprinting as fast as he ever had in all his life, with the slim elf still half a stride faster than he and threatening to drag his arm out of its socket. Trees are burning, Star Sunder told him with a frown. Suddenly, as if struck by lightning or firestorm, where there's no storm in the sky to do such harm. And here we are. They plunged between two shadow-top trees that seemed perfectly matched, growing not three feet apart, and somewhere in the gloom between a blue haze plucked them and hurled them far away. Umbregard's next step was in a different forest, one more dry and empty of calling birds and rustling animals. He gaped and tried to look behind him, but at that moment Star Sunder let go of his arm and took hold of his chin. Staring into Umbregard's eyes from inches away, the moon elf murmured, Make no unnecessary noise, and don't call out to anyone you see, even if they're old friends. Hmm? Especially if they're old friends. Why? Umbregard asked, almost despairingly. Why had he bothered to learn to speak any other word but why? You'll live longer, Star Sunder said laying two gentle fingers across the human mage's lips. That's why. The Phoenix Tower was dark and cool and lonely. With his fortress ringed by thick thorns, jagged rubble, and a breakneck chasm dug by his golems literally as they were falling apart, Tenthar felt secure from intrusion by all save the most persistent adventurers. If any such came calling, He'd just have to be very good at hiding, or dying. The Archmage of the Phoenix Tower had long ago passed beyond loneliness into boredom. After all, how often can one read old and familiar spell books that one dare not try any castings out of? He was tired of trudging down to the cellars in the dark to gobble mushrooms like some sort of tomb beast. For that matter, he was tired of trudging everywhere rather than flying, and never leaving the tower. All he'd seen of Faroon these last rides was the view his windows commanded. He lived from dawn to dusk, not daring to frivolously use any of the eight precious candle ends he'd found. He, Tenthar Teerhamus, who was used to conjuring light as needed, almost without thinking. A light after dark might attract the attention of adventurers or hungry beasts that someone was in the shuttered tower. Not two days ago he'd slammed and bolted the shutters just in time. He'd spent most of the rest of the day crouched behind them, dry-mouthed in fear, listening to an angry periton flap and slash with its horns at the old wood that he hoped would hold fast. And if such foes got into the tower, what could he do? He had no particular strength or skill at arms, and his spells failed him all the time now, 
or at least whenever he didn't bolster them with the precious power of his medallion, which was growing more feeble with each use. He'd called on it too often in the early days of this spell chaos, when he'd been frantic to find out what was happening and why. Now he was just sitting in the endless gloom waiting for magic to obey him once more, or someone to force their way into the Phoenix Tower and kill him. Each morning Tenthar went down into the under-pantry, cast a simple spell from his memory, and grimly watched it turn the stone walls purple or make them start to melt or be goaded into a mad display of sprouting flowers, or whatever new idiocy struck Mistress Whimsy that day. Each morning he hoped spells would return to normal and he could begin life as the Archmage of the Phoenix Tower again. Every day his visit to the under-pantry disappointed him. Every day he grimly climbed back up into the cold and lonely kitchens, boiled himself some beans and cut a little more green mold off the huge wheel of cheese under the marble hood before he climbed the stairs to the big window to study anew the spell he'd miscast. Every day he grew a little more despairing. It had almost gotten to the point where, given the right goad, he'd use his medallion to fly away from this place. He could find some distant realm where no one would know his face, seek work there as a scribe, and try to forget that he'd ever been an archmage, and summoned monsters from other worlds. Aye, for the ghost of an excuse he'd... Something shattered in the next room. It seemed a dozen bells rang amid the musical clatter of glass. Tenthar was up and through the door in an instant, peering. Ah, the spell tale he'd laid upon the elven tree gate in the tangled trees. Someone had just used it to travel south to the woods near Starmantle. That was it. He was sick of hiding and doing nothing. The elves are on the move, Tenthar Teerhamus told the glass shards at his feet grandly. I must be there. At least I'll be able to learn as much about this chaos of spells as they do. He cut himself a large wedge of cheese with his dagger, wrapped it up in an old blanket with his traveling spell book, and thrust the bundle into a battered old shoulder bag. Settling the blade back on its sheath, Tenthar called up the flickering power of his medallion and cast a spell he'd had ready for a long time. Farewell, old stones, he told his tower, casting what might be his last look around at it. I'll return, if I can. A moment later, the floor where he'd stood was empty. A moment after that, another spell tale shattered in the room where no one was left to hear. All too often, an archmage's life is like that. Excitement burned within her, leaping to the back of the throat she no longer had in a way it hadn't for years. Gently say, Areda, lose nothing now out of haste. Your centuries pass trembling like a maid, or should be. Like a wisp of dark smoke in the darkness, Sayareda flew up a thin crevice at the back of the cavern, back to the main room above. She'd prepared this spell long ago, and he'd disturbed none of her preparations. In a trice it was done, gray smoke flowing out to settle like old stone over the top of the shaft. Its veil would seem like a raised stone floor to anyone on the surface. The well mouth completely concealed, and her quarry would be trapped beneath its web just as surely as if it was solid stone. Sayareda gave herself a bare breath of time to gloat before plunging back down through the cold dark stone. Now to let myself be freed by my savior prince and bring him willingly to the slow slaughter. She plunged through the cavern like an arrow coming to earth. Elminster frowned and looked up, feeling some magical disturbance, but could sense nothing, and after a long, suspicious time of probing into the dusty darkness, he resumed his cautious advance. That was more than time enough for Sayareda to steal up into one of the runes through the cracked stone beneath, causing it to glow faintly. Elminster stopped in front of it and stared at the unfamiliar curves and crossings. He didn't recognize any of these sigils. They looked both complex and old, and that, of course, suggested lost netheral, or any of a score of its echoes, the fleeting realms that had followed its fall with their self-styled sorcerer kings, if any of the rotting old histories he'd read down the years had it right. 
Only this one was glowing. El stared at it intently. Sentience slumbereth here, he murmured. But whose? Only silence answered him. The last prince of Athelantar acquired the ghost of a smile, sighed, and cast an unbinding. The quiet echoes of his incantation were still rolling back to him from the walls all around, when a ghostly head and shoulders erupted from the pale starry glow of the rune. The eyes were dark and melting flecks in a head whose long and shapely neck yearned up from shoulders of striking beauty. Long hair flowed down over lush breasts, but it seemed his unbinding could free no more of this apparition from the grip of the now pulsing rune. Free me, the voice was a tattered whisper sighing from a lonely afar. Oh, if the kindness and mercy of the gods mean anything to you, let me be free. Who are ye? El asked quietly, taking a pace back and kneeling to look more closely into the ghostly face. And what are these runes? Ghostly lips seemed to tremble and gasp. When her voice soared out once more, it held the high singing note of one who has triumphed over pain. I am Sayereda, Sayereda Lyonora. I am bound here, so long I know not how many years have passed. At the last few words she seemed to grow dimmer and sank back into the rune as far as her shoulders. Who bound ye here? Elminster asked, casting a quick look at the empty watchful darkness all around. Aye, that was it. He could not shake the feeling that he was being watched, and not merely by the dark and spectral eyes floating near his feet. I was bound by the one who made these runes, the whispering shade told him. Mine is the will and essence that empowers them as the seasons pass. Why were ye bound? El asked quietly, staring into the eyes that seemed to hold tiny stars in their depths as they melted pleadingly into his. Her answer, when it came, was a sigh so soft that he barely heard it, yet it came clearly. Carsis was cruel. The eyebrows of the last prince of Athelantar flew up. He knew that name, the proudest mage of all, who in his mad folly had dared to try to seize the power of godhood and suffered everlasting doom. The name Carsis meant peril to any mage of sense, Elminster's eyes narrowed, and he stepped back and forthwith murmured a spell. Bound spirit, undead, wizardly shade, or living woman, he would know truth when she spoke it. And falsehood. Of course, this Sayereda was likely to have been a sorceress of some accomplishment, perhaps an apprentice or rival of Carsis, for her to have been chosen for such a binding. She would know he'd just cast a truth-tell. Their eyes met in shared knowledge, and Elminster shrugged. She would answer as truthfully as she could, concealing only by her brevity. Like dueling swordsmen, they'd have to weigh each other's words and fence carefully. He cast a spell he should have used before entering the shaft, calling up a mantle of protection around himself, and stepped forward again. Unseen beyond the faint shimmer of his mantle, Fresh fury flared in eyes watching from the deep darkness at the back of the cavern. What will or must ye do if freed? El asked the head. Live again, she gasped. Oh, man, free me! What will freeing ye do to the runes? Awaken them once each, the ghostly head moaned, and they'll then be exhausted. What powers have the awakened runes? They call up images of Carsis, who instructs all who view them in ways of magic. Carsis meant them for the education of his clone hidden here. What became of it? El asked sharply, hurrying to hear her answer as the truth-tell ran out. Dark, star-shot eyes stared steadfastly into his. When awareness returns to me after my binding, a long time had passed, I think. I found it headless and wizened on the throne. I know not how it came to be that way. His spell had failed before the second word had left those phantom lips, but somehow El believed her. Sayereda, how do I free ye? he asked. If you have a spell quench or another unbinding, 
cast it upon me, not on the rune, but on me. And if I lack such magics, those dark eyes flickered. Stand over me so that your mantle touches the rune and I am within it. Then cast a magic missile and let its target be the rune. In what follows, you should be unharmed and I freed. Be warned, twill cost you your mantle. Prepare thyself, Elminster told her and stepped over her. Man, I have been waiting for an age, it seems. I am well prepared. Touch not the rune with your boots. The last prince of Athalantar made sure his feet were clear of the glowing sigil and made a careful casting. Blue-white radiance surged around him, roiling and tugging. The rune beneath him flared to blinding brilliance, and he heard Sayareta gasp. Her breathing was ragged and swift as she surged up into the collapsing mantle beside him. As El stepped back, he saw wild delight in her face. All of the magic seemed to be rushing into her, and with each passing moment she grew more solid, more substantial. Her flickering wraith-like form grew whole and acquired a dark gown. She was broad of shoulders, slim-waisted, and as tall or taller than he. Her hair was an unbound waist-length flow of velvet black, her brows startlingly dark tufts above eyes of leaping green. Her face was proud and lively, and very, very beautiful. Hail, Savior Mage, she said, eyes glowing with gratitude as the last fires of magic fled into her. A single tongue of flame escaped from between her lips as she spoke. Sayareda stands in your debt. She hesitated, reaching out one slender hand. May I know your name? Elminster, I am called, El told her, keeping a careful pace out of reach. Elminster, she breathed, eyes sparkling. Oh, have my thanks. She hugged herself as if scarcely believing that she was whole and solid once more, and stepped forward off the rune. Her feet seemed to have grown spike-heeled, pointed black boots. The moment she moved off of it, the rune erupted. A column of white fire burst up from it, twice the height of a man, and smoke surged out of it in all directions from its snarling. Elminster took a pace back, eyes narrowing, and something unseen in the darkness of a deep crevice stirred and made as if to spring forth, but remained where it was not all that far from the mage's unsuspecting back. Sayareda, El snapped, keeping his eyes on the unfolding magic. What is this? The magic of the rune, she replied, smiling at him. Carsis prepared it to impress intruders. Tis harmless, a parade of illusions. Watch. She turned to look at the column of flame, folding her arms, mild interest on her face. As she did so, the surging smoke seemed to freeze and thicken. The archway of glowing runes solidified out of the smoke and air with startling swiftness. It occurred behind the fiery column framing it, a wall that looked every bit as old and as solid as those of the cavern around, but hovered a few feet above the smooth stone floor. The runes around the arch matched those graven on the floor, save that all were afire and even spitting lightning. The risen lightning of awakened magic, now crawling between them almost continuously. Sayareda stood calmly watching, and El, struck by a sudden thought, glided to her elbow and indicated the empty throne. Will ye sit, lady? Sayareda gave him a dazzling smile, raised a hand in wordless thanks, not quite touching him, and sat upon the throne. No change in it or her was apparent to El's intent eyes. Hmm. Well, nothing learned there. As Sayareta crossed her legs and leaned back in ease upon the stone seat, the column of flame grew a face, a youthful face ringed by tousled hair and the stubble of a beard of borning, its eyes two points of blazing gold. They were fixed on the throne, and when Elminster swung his left arm in a sudden wild flourish, the eyes did not move to follow it. The air in the cavern was suddenly alive with a singing tension. The proud mouth opened, and the voice that issued from it crashed and rolled like thunder through Elminster's mind, as well as through the cavern. 
I am Carsus, behold me and fear. I am the Lord of Lords, a God among men, Arcanist Supreme. All magic is my domain, and all who work it or trifle with it without my blessing shall suffer. Be gone and live. Tarry, and the first and least of my curses shall begin its work upon you forthwith, gnawing memories from your brain until naught is left but a sighing shadow. Elminster looked sharply at Sayareda at those last words, but she sat calmly watching as the hair on the flaming head spat a halo of lightning out to the runes. The echoes of its mighty voice still rolling around the cavern as they faded, leaving it shaking and dust-ridden. They burst into showers of sparks and fell, taking the illusion of the arch and its wall with them. Still wearing its cruel smile, the face closed its eyes and shrank back into the column of flame, fading as it did so. In a few moments the flames fell back into the rune, and it winked out, becoming mere dark and lifeless grooves in the stone floor. Did that curse afflict ye? Elminster demanded, striding around to where he could see Sayareda. She lifted the edge of her beautiful mouth in a wry smile. Never, nor has it touched anyone, for tis all a bluff. Believe me, I've seen it many times down the years, whenever I grow overly lonely for the sight and sound of another human. Tis an empty warning, no more. El nodded, almost trembling in his eagerness, and asked, How can one see the scenes held by the other runes, and just what is in each? Sayareda pointed. In the next rune lie two of the most destructive spells devised by Carsus, magics none else have attained since, as well as a defensive shielding of surpassing strength and a healing magic. He placed them thus in case his new self should have urgent need to do battle. Her pointing finger moved. The rune beyond holds another four magics, as powerful as the battle spells but of more mundane usage, one creates a floating worldlet to serve as a stronghold for the mage who uses magic to modify it further. One can stop and hold the waters of a river while digging out a new course for its bed. One can shield an area permanently against specific spells or schools of spells with precision, so that one can allow a lightning bolt but deny chain lightning, say, and the last can coddle and keep from harm a living human while permanently altering one limb or organ. Carsis most often used that to move heart or brain to an unexpected place, or graft beast claws where hands had been or extra eyeballs from others. He also gave some men gills to work under the sea for him, as I recall. Sayareda waved her hand at the curving row of runes. The others hold lesser magics, four in each, and Carsus himself demonstrates all castings, noting drawbacks, details, and effective strategies. She watched the hunger in Elminster's face and suppressed a smile. She had seen this so many times before. Even chosen, it seemed, were like eager children when offered new toys. She waited for the question she knew would come. Elminster licked lips that were suddenly dry before he could swallow and say quietly, I asked how one can awaken these runes, lady, to view what waits within, and you've not answered that. Is there some secret here, some hazard or caution? Sayareda gave him a warm and welcoming smile. Nay, sir, as you're not Carsus and able to work the magics that respond only to his blood, there's but a matter of time and your patience. El raised a questioning eyebrow, and her smile broadened and slid into sadness. Only I can activate the runes, the woman on the throne added softly, and I can call forth the power of only one in a month by means of a nameless spell bound into me by Carsus. Tis a spell I know not how to cast, nor can I teach it to another. I can only call on it when the time is right, and I have no doubt tis the sole reason I still exist. Elminster opened his mouth to say something, his eyes alight with eager fire, but Sayareda held up a hand to stay his speech and added, You asked of a hazard? There is one, and tis thus. Long years must have passed since I was bound here, for my powers have faded indeed. I can awaken one rune and no more. To open another will destroy me 
and all of the magic stored here will drain away and be lost. It cannot persist without me. So there is no way to see the spells Karsis stored here, or at least more than one foursome of them. There is a way, Sayareta said softly, her eyes on his. If you use that last spell I spoke of, not to give me gills or a tail, but to pass magical strength into me, the magic of another spell that heals or imparts vitality or places the vital flowering part of art in items to recharge them. All of these should work. Elminster frowned in thought. And we must bide here a month to see the rune that holds that spell? Sayareta spread her hands. You freed me and woke the first rune. I am yet able to awaken a rune now, and I owe you my very life. Would you like to see the rune I spoke of, which holds the spell that will let me live to unlock the others for you? I would, El said eagerly, striding forward. Sayareta rose from the throne and held up her hands in warning. Remember, she said gravely, you'll see Carsus instructing himself how to cast those spells, and the rune will then be dead forever. Its spells, spells neither you nor any living mage may now be able to cast lost with it. She took two slow steps away from Elminster, then turned back to face him, pointing down at the rune. If you want to preserve its power and be able to view it again hereafter, there is a way, but it will call greatly on your trust. Elminster's brows rose again, but he said merely, Say on. Sayareda spread empty hands in the age-old gesture traitors use to show they are unarmed, and said gently, You can channel energy into the rune through me. Touch me as I stand upon the rune, and will your spell to seek the rune as its target. The bindings set within me by Karsis will keep me from harm and deliver the fury of your magic into the rune. One powerful spell ought to do it or two lesser ones. The eyes of the last prince of Athelantar narrowed. Mistra forfend, he murmured, raising a reluctant hand. Elminster, Sayareta said beseechingly, I owe you my life. I mean you no harm. Take whatever precautions you see fit. A blindfold, bindings, a gag. She extended her arms to him wrists crossed over each other in a gesture of submission. You have nothing to fear from me. Slowly, Elminster stepped forward and took her cold hand in his. 19. More Blood Than Thunder The thunder of a king's tongue can always spill more blood than his own weight in gold before dawn the next morning. Mintipper Moonsilver, Bard From the ballad, Great Changes a Borning First performed circa the Year of the Sword and Stars Sayareta's touch was cold, colder than icy rivers he'd plunged into, colder even than the bite of blue glacial ice that had once seared his naked skin. Gods! Elminster struggled to catch his breath, too shocked even to moan. The face so close to his held no hint of triumph, only anxious concern. El stared into those beautiful eyes and roared out his pain in a wordless shout that echoed around the cavern. It was answered a moment later by a greater roar, a rumbling that shook the cavern and split its gloom with a flash of light, a flash that made all of the runes briefly catch fire and sent a slim, stealthy figure shrinking back hastily into its crevice, unregarded. One of her best spells shattered like a glass goblet hurled to stones, and it could not be any doing of this helpless, shuddering mage in her hands. Oh, dark luck rule. Were there spells on a chosen that called for aid by themselves? Sayareta straightened, eyes blazing and snarled. Who? The light that stabbed down the shaft this time was no flash of destruction, but a golden column of more lasting sorcery. Four figures rode its magic smoothly down into the cavern of the throne, boots first. Three of the men in that column of light were old and stout and amazed. Caladaster, Beldrune, and Tabarist 
were all staring in awe at their companion. The quiet harper had just broken a spell that had shaken the very trees around in its passing and swept away a thick stone floor in the doing with a casual wave of his hand. He'd taken a few steps forward, smiled reassuringly at them, and another gesture had swept them up into waiting radiance and borne them down the shaft together in its glowing heart. Elminster, the fourth man said crisply, as his boots touched the stone floor as lightly as a falling feather kisses the earth. Stand away from yon runes. Mister forbids us to do what you are attempting. A gasping Elminster had only just then recovered the power of speech. He turned with a stiff, awkward lurch, limbs trembling, and said sharply through lips that were thin and blue, Mr. forbids us to do, never to look. Who are you? The man smiled slightly, and his eyes became two lances of magical fire, stabbing across the cavern at Sayareda. Call me Azuth, he replied. The spell failed again, Lord, the man in robes said, his voice not quite steady. The Lord Esbray Fell Morrill nodded curtly. You have our leave to withdraw. Go not where we cannot summon you in haste if need be. Lord, it shall be so, the wizard murmured. He did not quite break into a run as he left the chamber, but the eyes of both guards at the door flickered as he passed. Nazmere, Lady Fell Morrill lifted unhappy eyes to his and said, this is none of my doing, Lord. Prayers to Most Holy Azuth are as close as I come to the art now. This I swear. A large and hairy hand closed over hers. Be at ease, lady. I cannot forget that hard lesson any more than you can. I know you forget not and transgress not. I have seen your blood upon the tiles before the altar and seen you at prayer. You humiliate yourself as only one who truly believes can. A smile touched his lips for a moment and stole away again. You frighten the men more now than you ever did when you ruled this castle by your sorcery, you know. They say you talk with Azuth every night. Esbray, his lady whispered, holding her eyes steady upon his despite the blush that had turned her face, throat, and beyond crimson. I do, and I am more frightened right now than ever I was when Azuth stripped my art from me before you. All magic is awry all over the realms. It will be down to the sharpest sword and the cunning of the wolf once more, and not one of our hired mages will be able to aid us. And what is so bad about trusting only in sharp swords and the strong arms and cunning of warriors? Esbray the Lady Nazmere whispered, bringing her lips up to brush his, but too slowly for him to miss seeing the bright glimmer of unshed tears welling up in her eyes. How long can you stand against foe after foe without the spells of our mages to hew them down for you? How many sharp swords and how much cunning does an orc horde have? A chiming as of many bells rang out across the chamber. It nearly deafened Elminster as the chill wind that carried it raced through him, searing him once more into frozen immobility. The ghostly mist that had been Sayareda was spiraling about him, coiling and twining, seemingly unharmed by the beams of fire Azuth had hurled that roared through her into Elminster. Ice, then fire, fire that lifted him off his feet in a whirlwind of battling mist and flames and set him down again, staggering too overwhelmed to do more than bleed in wordless pain. Here, Tabarist mumbled through lips that were white and trembling with fear. That's our Elminster you're smiting, sir. Your, er, divineness, sir. Break free of her, the harper who was Azuth said quietly, his gaze no longer flaming, but now bent on the pain-narrowed eyes of Elminster. Or you are doomed. I'd say you're doomed anyway. A sneering voice said from above, and five staves spat in unison, hurling a rending rain of doom down the shaft.
the overmistress of the acolytes strode through the black curtain of hanging chains with every inch of the cruel authority that made her so feared among the underclergy. The cruel barbed lash rode upon her shoulder, ready to snap forward at the slightest act or omission that displeased her, and her face beneath the horned black mask wore a smile of cruel anticipation. Even the two guardian priestesses of the chamber shrank back from her. She ignored them as she strode on, the metal-shod heels of her thigh-high black boots clicking on the tiles, and shouldered through the three curtains of fabric into the innermost place of the dark lady's contemplation, the Pool of Shar. A figure moved in the gloom beyond the pool, a figure in a familiar horned headdress and deep purple mantle. Dread Sister Clalera went to her knees immediately, holding forth her lash in both hands. With leisurely tread, the dark lady came over the inky waters and took it from her. The overmistress immediately bowed forward to kiss the knife-blade toes of the dark lady's boots, holding her tongue against the cold, blood-stained metal until the lash came down across her own back. It burned, despite the webwork of crossed lacings that were part of her own garb, but it was a mark of pride not to flinch or gasp. She held firm, waiting for the second blow that would mark her superior's displeasure, or the rain of cuts that meant Avroana's fury was aroused. None came, and with a smooth motion that almost managed to conceal her relief, she straightened to a sitting position once more, for Avroana to put the lash to her lips. She kissed it, received it back, and relaxed. The ritual was satisfied. Your darkness? she asked, as was the custom. Clalera, the dark lady said, almost urgently. Her familiarity made the overmistress stiffen with excitement. I need you to do something for me. Despite Narlkin's assurances, those five dread spells are going to fail us. You must be the striking hand that rewards them for their misdeeds. If they betray the House of Holy Night, you must bring the justice of the house to them, whatever the danger to yourself. I demand it. The flame of darkness herself demands it. Dearest of my believers, will you do this for me? Gladly, Clalera said, and meant it. To travel outside the house once more, to breathe the free winds of Faroon out in the open, and see lands spread out before her once more. Oh, of Rowena! Lady most kind, she said, her voice trembling. What must I do? The noise smote their ears like a blow. Dust curled up, the ground shuddered and heaved beneath their boots, and here and there around the ruin slabs of stone whirled aloft, thrust into the air by geysers of rocketing vapor. The five dread spells exchanged awed, delighted glances, the roaring of their unleashed magic swallowing their shouts of excited approval, and poured down death until Elrin slapped at their arms and waved the scepters in his hands, weapons he'd snatched from his belt after his staff sputtered out. When he had their attention, the senior dark brother aimed the scepters at an angle toward the floor beside the shaft. If their fire burst through into the cavern below, it would burn an angled path reaching to where Elrin's spying spell had shown him the staggering chosen, near a throne and a ring or half-ring of runes that could perhaps, just perhaps, be made to explode. The destruction of a chosen was, after all, their holy mission. As Femter, Vaelum, and Hrelgrith aimed their staves with undaunted enthusiasm, Elrin stepped back a pace or two and saw Deloth, on the far side of the group, doing the same. They exchanged mirthless smiles. If there was a backlash, someone had to survive to take word to the distant Dark Lady, or, if it raced along the linkage she used to spy on them all, to see what fate she suffered. Perhaps it would even be one that would let two false wizards go their separate ways in Faroon, so heavily laden with enchanted items that they could barely stand. A more prudent time for such moon dreams would come later, when they weren't standing in a haunted ruin near sunset at the heart of a killing forest emptied of life, with a known chosen and a madman who thought he was a god, and the ghost of a sorceress locked in battle somewhere close by under their feet, 
Hurling spells around and over old and powerful spell runes cut into the stone floor for some old and very important purpose. The thunder of destructive magic roared on unabated as the junior dread spells laughed and exulted in the sheer rush of power under their command. Walls toppled, smashing wardrobes flat, as the floors that supported them melted away and tumbled into an ever lengthening chasm. Trees all around groaned and creaked as the ground shifted. Deluth kept his own wands trained straight down at the self styled Azuth and his companions. He'd seen the casual waves of a hand that had wrought what it took most archmages long and complicated rituals to achieve. God or Avatar or boldly bluffing archmage, whatever it was, must be destroyed. Elrin aimed his scepters to fire through the opened, dust-choked space in the wake of the three staves, which were now one by one shuddering to exhaustion, to be tossed aside in favor of Nethery's scepters, whose blasts were almost as potent. Chosen or not, no lone wizard could stand unscathed in the face of such destruction. Elrin snarled as a scepter crumbled to dust and snatched forth another to replace it. No, there was no chance at all that a man could survive this. Why, then, was he so uneasy? The end of the cavern vanished in tumbling stones and the flash and rock spray of spell-wrought explosions. Floor slabs bounced upward as a shock wave rolled through them, toppling the throne. More rocks broke away and fell from the ceiling, bouncing amid the roiling fury there. On his knees, a dazed Elminster watched through pain-blurred eyes as the collapse of the ceiling continued in a rough line heading toward him, chunks of stone larger than he was crashing down or being hurled aside in an endless roaring tide. Someone or something aloft must be trying to slay him, or destroy the runes, not that he faced any dearth of foes nearer at hand. Sayareda, who must have lied to him about everything except who put the runes here, was riding him like a mounted knight, her claws around his throat and searing his back with talons of icy iron. He knew before he tried that no amount of rolling or smashing himself into a wall could harm or dislodge her. How can one crush or scrape away a wisp of ghostly mist? Move he must, though, or be buried or torn apart by the snarling, smoking bolts and beams of magic that were gnawing their way through earth and stone to reach him. El groaned and crawled a little way along heaving stones until the runes of Carsus erupted into white-hot columns of flame, one by one. As they licked and seared the collapsing ceiling, magic played all around the cavern, purple lightning dancing and strange half-seen shapes and images forming and collapsing and forming again in an endless parade. The last prince of Athalantar smashed his nose and shoulder into a floor slab that was heaving upward to meet him, and rolled over with a gasp of pain and despair. As he clawed at the edges of the stone with bloody, feeble fingers trying to drag himself upright again, the stone melted away into smoke and rending magic burst into him. Ah, well, this is it. Forgive me, Mistra. But no agony followed, and nothing plucked at his flesh to melt and sear and reeve. Instead, he was rolled over as if by the empty air, and glowing nothingness enclosed him in ropes of radiance. Dimly through his tears and the roiling motes of light, Elminster saw magic rushing toward him from all sides, being drawn to him, veering in its dancing to race in. Wild laughter arose in him, high and sharp and exultant. Sayareda! She was wrapped around him, clinging in a web of glowing mists that grew thicker and brighter as she gorged herself on magic, a ghost of bright sorcery. Sunlight was stabbing down into the riven cavern now, but the dancing dust cloaked everything in gloom, everything but the rising giant built around Elminster's feebly writhing form. The rune flames were twisting in midair to flow into Sayareda, and she was rising ever higher, a thing of crackling flame. El strained to look up at her, and two dark flecks among the magical fire became eyes that looked back at him in cold triumph, until a mouth swam out of the conflagration to join them and gave him a cruel smile. "'You're mine now, fool,' she whispered in a hoarse hiss of fire, "'for the little while you'll last.'" 
Lord Thessamel Arunder, the Lord of Spells, the steward announced grandly as the doors swung wide. A wizard strode slowly through them, a cold sneer upon his sharp features. He wore a high-collared robe of unadorned black that made his thin frame look like a tomb obelisk, and a shorter, more lushly built lady in a gown of forest green clung to his arm, her large brown eyes dancing with lively mischief. Good sirs, he began without courtesies, why come you here to me once more this day? How many times must you hear my refusal before the words sink through your skulls? Well met, Lord Arunder, said the merchant Fellbellow in dry tones. The morning finds you well, I trust. Arunder gave him a withering glare. Spare me your toadying, rag-seller. I'll not sell this house raised by mighty magic, nor any wagon length of my lands, no matter how sweetly you grovel or how much gold you offer. What need I have for coins? What need I have for gowns, for that matter? Aye, I'll grant that, one of the other merchants grunted. Can't see him looking like much in a good gown. No knees for it. No hips, neither, someone else added. There were several sputters of mirth from the merchants crowded at the doorway. The wizard regarded them all with cold scorn and said softly, I weary of these insults. If you are not gone from my halls by the time I finish the ghost chant, the talons of my guardian ghosts shall— Lady Faya, Holder Fellbellow asked, has not seen the documents? Of course, good Sir Fellbellow, the lady in green said in musical tones. Favoring them all with a smile, she stepped from her lord and drew forth a strip of folded vellum. And he signed them, too. She proffered them to Fellbellow, who unfolded them eagerly the men behind him crowding around to see. The Lord of Spells gaped at the paper and the merchants, then at Faya. W what befalls here? he gasped. A sensible necessity, my lord, she replied sweetly. I'm so glad you saw the good sense in signing it, a most handsome offer, enough to allow you to retire from your castings entirely if you desire. I signed nothing, Arunder gasped, white-faced. Oh, but you did, Lord, and so ardently, too, she replied, eyes dancing. Have you forgotten? You remarked at the time upon the hardness and flatness of my belly that made your penmanship such ease. You signed it with quite a flourish, as I recall. Arunder stiffened. But that was base trickery, one of the merchants chuckled. Ah, well done, Faya. Someone else barked with laughter and a third someone contributed a murmur of, That's rich, that is. Apprentice, the Lord of Spells whispered savagely, What have you done? The Lady Faya drew three swift paces away from him into the heart of the merchants, who melted aside to make way for her like mist before flame, and turned back to face him, placing her hands on her hips. Among other things, Thassamel, she told him softly, I've slain two men this last ten day who came to settle old scores since your spells failed you, and word of it spread. Faya, are you mad telling these— They know, Thess, they know, his lady told him with cold scorn. The whole town knows. Every mage has his hands full of wild spells, not just you. If you paid one whit of attention to Faroon outside your window, you'd know that already. The Lord of Spells had turned as pale as old bones and was gaping at her, mouth working like a fish gasping out of water. Everyone waited for him to find his voice again. It took quite a while. But your spells still work, then? He managed to ask at last. Not a one, she said flatly. I killed them with this. She drew forth the tiny dagger from its sheath at her hip then drew back her left sleeve to lay bare a long, angry-looking line of pine gum and wrapped linens. That's how I got this. Were these merchants also coming to... to... Arunder asked faintly, swaying back on his heels. His hands were trembling like those of a sick old man. I went to them, Faya told him in biting tones, to beg them to manage again the offer you so charmingly refused two months ago. They were good enough to oblige when they could well have set their dogs on me. 
the apprentice of the man who turned three of them into pigs for a night. There were angry murmurs of remembrance and agreement from among the merchants around her. Arunder stepped back and raised a hand to cast a spell out of sheer habit, before dropping it with a look of sick despair. His lady drew herself up and said more calmly, So now the deal's done. Your tower and all these lands, from high noon today henceforth, belong to this cabal of merchants, to use as they see fit. And, and what happens to me? God's woman! Faya held up a hand, and the wizard's ineffectual gibbering ended as if cut off by a knife. Someone chuckled at that. We, my lord, are free to live unmolested in the South Spire, casting spells, so long as they harm or work ill upon no one upon this holding, as much as we desire, or are able to. You, Thess, receive two hundred thousand gold pieces. That's why all of these good men are here, all the firewood we require, and a dozen deer a year prepared for the table. Without a word, Hulder Fellbellow laid a sack upon the side table. It landed with the heavy clink of coins. Wayandle the butcher followed him then, one by one, all of the others, the sacks building up until they were reaching up the wall atop a table that creaked in protest. Arunder's eyes bulged. But you can't have gold enough, none of you. His lady rejoined him in a graceful green shifting and laid a comforting hand on his arm. They have a backer, Thess. Now thank them politely. We've some packing to do, or you will be wearing my gowns. I, I, her hitherto gentle hand thrust hard into his ribs. My lords, Arunder gulped, I don't know how to thank you. Thessimel, Felbello said genially, you just did. Have our thanks too, and fare thee well in the South Spire, eh? Arunder was still gulping as the merchants filed out, chuckling. The noises he was making turned to whimpers, however, when their withdrawal revealed the man who'd been sitting calmly behind them all the while, the faint glow of deadly magic playing along the naked broadsword that was laid across his knees. That blade was in the capable grasp of the large and hairy hands of the famous warrior Barundrin Harbright, whose smile, as he rose and looked straight into the wizard's eyes, was a wintry thing. So we meet again, Erunder. You, the wizard's snarl was venomous. You're my tenant now, mage, so spare me the usual hissed curses and spittle. If you anger me enough, I'll take you under my arm down to the stream where the little ones play and spank your behind until it's as red as a radish. I'm told that won't hamper your spell casting one bit. One large, blunt-fingered hand waved casually through the air past Arunder's nose. The wizard blinked in alarm. What? Who told me so? Harbright lifted his chin in a fond smile that was directed past Arunder's shoulder. The Lord of Spells whirled around in time to see Faya's cat-like smile drifting out the door they'd come in by together. The rest of her accompanied it, a vision in forest green. Lord Thessimel Arunder moaned, swayed on his feet, and turned, on the verge of tears of rage to turn away from it all, only to come to an abrupt halt, with a squeak of real alarm as he found himself about to run right into the edge of Harbright's glowing blade. His eyes rose, slowly and unwillingly, from the steel that barred his way to the huge and hulking warrior who held it. There was something like pity in Barundrin Harbright's eyes as he rumbled, Why are wizards with all their wits so slow to learn life's lessons? The blade swept down and away, seeking its sheath, and a large and steadying hand came down on the wizard's shaking shoulder. Mages tend to live longer, Arunder, Harbright said gently, if they manage to resist their most attractive temptations. The Sharans were beginning to sweat now from the sheer strain of aiming and holding steady as the art they wielded punched aside old stones and earth to lay open a fortress and slay the beings below. Elrin watched Femter wince and shake the smoking fragments of a ring off one finger as Hrelgrith tossed aside his third wand 
and Deluth slid one failing scepter back into his belt. Enough, Elrin bellowed, waving his hands. Enough, dread spells of Shar. Something had to be saved in case they met with other foes this day, or gods above, there was someone still alive down there. The priests turned wizards turned their heads in the sudden peace to blink at him, almost as if they'd forgotten who and where they were. We have a holy task, dark brothers, Elrin reminded them, letting them hear the regret in his voice, and it is not melting away earth and stone in a forgotten ruin in the heart of a forest. Our quarry is the Chosen. How fares he? Three heads peered at roiling dust. All five looked down the shaft where they'd begun, where the dust was but a few flowing tongues. There was rubble down there, and... One of the Sharans cried out in disbelief. The harper who'd claimed to be Azuth was looking calmly back up at them, standing more or less where he'd been when the barrage began. The three old men still blinking at him in awe stood around him. He, they, and the floor around the bottom of the shaft seemed untouched. Finished? he asked quietly, looking up at them with eyes of steady storm-smoke gray. Elrin felt cold fear catch at the back of his throat and slide slowly down into the pit of his stomach. But Femter snarled, Shar, take the man, and snatched a wand from his belt. Before Elrin or Deluth could stop him, Femter leaned over the well and snarled the word that sent a streak of flame down, down into the gloom below, straight at the upturned face of the gray-eyed man. The harper didn't move, but his mouth somehow stretched wider than a man's mouth should be able to, and the flames fell right into him. He shuddered for a moment as all of the fire plunged into his vitals. By the stumbling of the three old men around him, it seemed some sort of magic was keeping them at bay, moving them as he moved. A moment later the fireball burst with a dull rumbling. The harper stood with an unconcerned expression on his face as smoke whirled out of his ears. He gave the watching Sharans a reproving look and remarked, Needs a little more pepper. The dread spells were screaming and fleeing wildly even before Azuth lowered his head and looked again across the riven cavern at Elminster. I mean what I say, he said gravely. You must get free of her. I can't, Elminster gasped, staring into the dark eyes of Sayareda as she reared up over him in triumph like some sort of giant snake twining around him in large and tightening coils. And you never will, she breathed triumphantly, her cold lips inches from his. He could feel the chilling frost of her breath on his face as she purred, With the power of a chosen and all the might Carsus left here, I can defy even such as him. She lifted her head to give Azuth a challenging glare as she clamped one giant hand of solid mist around El's throat. Other tentacles of mist rose around them both in a protective forest, undulating and lashing the tossed and shattered stone slabs. The last prince of Athelantar struggled to breathe in her grasp, so throttled he couldn't speak or shout, as the ghostly sorceress leisurely turned the uppermost spire of her mists to a lush and very solid human torso, curvaceous and deadly. Slim fingers grew fingernails like long talons, and when they were as long as Sayareda's hand, she reached almost lovingly for his mouth. We'll just have the tongue out, I think, she said aloud, to forestall any nasty... Ah, but wait a bit, Sayareda. You want him to tell you a few things before he's mute. Hmm. Razor-sharp talons drifted just inches past Elminster's tightly constricted throat to slice into the first flesh she found bared. Plowing deep gashes across the strangling mage's neck, she flicked his blood away in droplets that were caught in her whirling mists and held her bloody talons exultantly up to the sunlight. Ah, but I'm alive again, Sayareda hissed. Alive and whole. I breathe. I feel. She brought that hand to her mouth, bit her own knuckles, and held the hand out toward the grimly watching avatar of Azuth to let him see the welling blood. I bleed. I live! Then she screamed, swayed, and stared down, dark eyes widening in disbelief, at the gore-slick, smoking sword-tip that had just burst through her breast from behind. 
Some people live far longer than they should, said Ilbrin Starim silkily from behind the hilt as he stared gloating into the eyes of the mage still frozen in Sayerada's grasp. Don't you agree, Elminster? A door was flung wide to boom its broken song against a heavily paneled wall. It had been years since the tall, broad-shouldered woman who now stood in the doorway, her eyes snapping in alarm and anger, had worn the armor she hated so much. But as she stood glaring into the room, the half-drawn longsword at her hip gleaming, she looked every inch a warrior. Sometimes Rant Lavon wished he was more handsome, strong, and about ten years older. He'd have given a lot for so magnificent a woman to smile at him. Right now, she was doing anything but smiling. She was looking down at him as if she'd found a viper in her chamber pot, and his only consolation was that he wasn't the only mage rolling around on the floor under her dark displeasure. His master, the gruffly sardonic elf Eric Lonavan, was gasping on the fine swan-weave rug not a hand span away. Eric, by all the gods, the Lady Lord Nuressa growled, what befell here? My farce crying spell went awry, the elf snarled back at her. If it hadn't been for the lad here, all those books would be aflame now and we'd be hurling water and running with buckets for our lives worth. Rontlevon's face flamed as the Lady Lord took a step forward and looked down at him with a rather kindly expression. It was nothing, great lady, he stammered. Master Rontlevon, she said gently, an apprentice should never contradict his master of magecraft, nor belittle the judgment of any of the four lords of the castle. Rontlevon blushed as maroon as his robes and emitted the immortal words, You just, you just, er, uh, um... I, uh, yes, yes, boy, brilliantly explained as usual, Eric Lonavan said dismissively, rolling to his elbows. Now belt up and look around the room for me. Is anything amiss? Anything broken? Smoldering? A flame? Hop now. Rant Levon hopped, quite thankfully, but kept his attention more on what two of the four lords of the castle were saying. They'd all been debonair and successful adventurers less than a decade ago, and one never knew what wild and exciting things they might say. Well, nothing about mating dragons this time. So tell me, Eric, the Lady Lord was saying in her I really shouldn't have to be this patient voice, just why your farce crying spell blew up. Is it one of those magics you'd just be better off not trying? Or were you distracted by some nubile elf maid seen in your spying, perhaps? Nessa! The elf growled. Rontlevon had always admired the way he could look so agile and elegant and youthful, and yet be more gruff than any dwarf, as he rose and fixed her with one glaring, that's quite enough eye. This is serious. For us all, everywhere in Faroon. Stop playing the swaggering warrior bitch for just a moment and listen, for once. Rontlevon froze. His head sunk between his shoulders, wondering if folk really survived the full fury of great Lady Nuressa a-storming, and just how swiftly and brutally she'd notice him and have him removed from the room. Very, and with iron calm, it seemed. Master Rontlevon, she said calmly, you may leave us now. Close the door on your way out. Apprentice Rontlevon, his master said just as calmly, it is my will that you abide with us. Send Master Rontlevon out and close the door behind him, remaining here with us. Rontlevon swallowed, drew in a deep breath, and turned around to face them, hardly daring to raise his eyes. I... I've found nothing amiss at this end of the chamber, he announced, his voice higher and rather more unsteady than he wished it would be. Shall I examine the other half of it now, or later? Now we'll be fine, Rontlevon the Lady Lord said in a voice of velvet menace. Pray proceed. The apprentice actually shivered ere he bowed and mumbled, As my great lady wishes. It's a wonderful thing to make men and boys fear you, Nessa, but does it really make up for your years under the lash? The escaped slave gets even by enslaving others? His master's voice was biting. Rontlevon tried not to let his momentary hesitation show. The Lady Lord had been a slave? 
kneeling naked under a slaver's lash in the dust and the heat. Gods, but he'd never have. Do you think we can leave my past careers in my own bedchamber closet, Eric? The Lady Lord said, almost gently. Her next sentence, however, was almost a battlefield shout. Or is there some pressing need to tell all the world? I won't tell anyone. I won't. I swear I won't, Ron Levant babbled, going to his knees on the rug. He heard the great lady sigh and felt iron-like fingers on his shoulder hauling him back to his feet. Other fingers took hold of his chin and turned his head as sharply as a whip is flicked. The apprentice found himself staring into the Lady Nuress's smoky eyes from a distance of perhaps the length of his longest finger. Rontlin, she said, addressing him as he liked his handful of friends to, a short name he'd had no idea any of the lords even knew about. You know that one of the most essential skills any wizard can have is to keep the right secrets and keep them well. So I shall test you now to see if you are good enough to remain in the castle as a mage in training, or a wizard in your own right in time to come. Keep my secret and stay. Let it out, and be yourself shut out of our lands, chased to our borders with the flat of my blade finding your backside as often as I can land it. Ront Levon heard his master start to say something, but the Lady Lord made some sort of gesture he couldn't see behind her back, and Eric Lonavan fell silent again. Do you understand, Rontlin? Her voice was as calm and as gentle as if she'd been discussing haying a field. Ront Levon swallowed, nodded, squirmed under the hard points of her gaze, and managed to say, Great Lady, I swear to keep your secret. I shall abide by your testing. And if ever I let it slip, I shall come to you myself to admit the doing so the chase can begin at your convenience. Her dark brows rose. Well said, Master Apprentice. Agreed, then. She took a quick step back from him and lifted her gown unhurriedly to display a tanned muscular leg so long and shapely that he swallowed twice, unable to tear his eyes from it. Somewhere far, far away his master chuckled, but Ron Levon was lost in the slow but continuing rise of fine fabric, up, up to her hip. He was swallowing hard now, and knew his face must be as bright as a lamp, where his eyes locked on a purplish-white brand. The cruel design was burned deep into her flesh, just below the edge of the bone that made her hip jut out. She traced a circle around it with one long finger and asked in a dry voice, Seen enough, Rontlin? He almost choked, trying to swallow and nod fervently at the same time, and somewhere in the midst of his distress the gown went to her ankles again. Her hand clapped his shoulder like a club crashing down, and her deep voice said in his ear, So we have a secret to share now, you and I. Something to remember. She shoved him away gently and added, I believe this end of the room hasn't been fully inspected yet, Master Apprentice. Her voice was a brisk goad once more, but somehow Ront Levon found himself almost grinning as he strode away to the end of the room and announced, Inspection resumes, great lady, and sharing begins. His master laughed aloud, and after a moment Ront Levon heard a low, thrilling murmur that must have been the lady lord chuckling. She used the lash of her voice on Eric Lonavan next, breaking off in mid-chuckle to snap, Enough time wasted, mage. You frighten me up from my table with a map half-drawn and my soup growing cold, then go all coy about why. What's so serious that your apprentice must hear about it alongside me? Do you think you can get around to telling me about this oh-so-serious matter before, say, nightfall? I meant it when I said this was serious, Nessa, Ront Levon's master said quietly. Put the edge of your tongue away for a moment and listen, please. He paused then, and wonders. Ront Levon even turned around to see, earning him an almost amused glance from the great lady. The Lady Lord Nuressa gave him silence, waiting to hear him speak. Eric Lonavan blinked, seeming himself surprised, then said swiftly, you know that magic, all magic not bolstered by draining a few sorts of enchanted items, is going wrong. Spells twisting to all sorts of results, untrustworthy and dangerous. 
Some mages are hiding in their towers, unable to defend themselves against anyone who might try to settle grudges. Magic has gone wild. If fewer folk knew about it, I'd say that this should be our secret, Rontlevon's and mine own, for you to keep, or else. It will come as no surprise to you that many mages have been trying to find out why this darkness has befallen. I am one of them. And that's even less of a surprise, the Lady Nuressa said quietly. Rontlevon's head snapped around to regard her somber face. He'd never heard her speak so gently before. She sounded almost tender. I have no items to waste in bolstering my spells, Eric Lonavan continued. So the boy, Rontlevon, has been my bulwark, using his spells to steady mine. Word has even come to us that some wizards, and even priests of the faiths of the weave, believe Divine Mistra and Azuth themselves have been corrupting magic deliberately, for some purpose mortals cannot even hazard. You worship our gods of magecraft? Nessa, Eric Lonavan said calmly, I don't even have a bedchamber closet to keep my secrets in. I'm trying to hurry this, really I am. Just listen. Nuressa leaned back against one of the lamp-girt pillars that held up the ceiling of the spell chamber and gestured for the elf mage to continue. She didn't even look irritated. Just now we were seeking but had not yet called up a place in our scrying, the enchantment being just complete, Eric Lonavan continued. When I felt one thing and saw another, I think everyone in Faroon who was attempting a scrying at the time felt what I did. The willful, reckless release of many wizard staves at once, in one place, all directed at the same target. You mean mages everywhere feel it whenever one wizard blasts another? Nuressa's voice was incredulous. No wonder you're all so difficult. No, we do not normally feel such things, nor have the violence of feeling anything strike us so hard that our own spells collapse into wildfire, Rontlevon's master told her. The reason we did this was the target of this unleashing, the High One. I saw him, standing at the bottom of a shaft with three mortal mages, while magic seeking to destroy him rained down, and his attention was elsewhere. Azuth? Who was crazed enough to use magic to try to blast down a god of magic? The Lady Lord looked surprised. That I did not see, Eric Lonavan replied. I did, however, see what Azuth was regarding, a ghostly sorceress who was trying to slay a chosen of Mistra. What's that? the great lady asked. Some sort of servant of the goddess? Yes, the elf mage said grimly, and he was someone you might remember. Cast your thoughts back to a day when we fled from a tomb, a tomb furnished with pillars that erupted in eyes. A mage was hanging above us there, asleep or trapped, and came out after we fled. He asked you what year it was. Oh, yes, the Lady Lord murmured, her eyes far away. And I told him. And thereby we earned the favor of the goddess Mistra, Eric Lonavan told her, who delivered this castle into our hands. The Lady Nuressa frowned. I thought Amandarn won title to these lands while dicing with some merchant lords, hazarding all our coins in the process, she said. Rontlevon stood very still, not wanting to be ejected again now. Surely this was an even more dangerous secret than Amandarn lost all our coins, Nessa. Folosan nearly killed him for it, and they had to flee when he stole a few bits back to buy a meal that night and got caught at it. The two of them hid in a shrine to Mistra, rolled right in under the altar and hid under its fine cloth. There they slept, though both of them swear magic must have dragged them into slumber, for they'd had little to drink and were all excited from their flight and the danger. When they awoke, all of our coins were back in Amandarn's pouch, along with the title to the castle. The great lady's brow arched and she asked, And you believe this tale? Nessa, I used spells to glean every last detail of it out of both their heads after they told me. It happened. I see, the great lady said calmly. Rontlevon, be aware that this is another secret shared between us here, and only us here, or you'll have to flee four lords of the castle, not merely one. Yes, great lady, the apprentice said, then swallowed and faced them both. There's something I should say now. 
If something happens to Great Azuth, or Most Holy Mistra, and magic keeps crumbling, we all share a grave problem. And what is that, Rot Levan? the Lady Nuressa asked in almost kindly tones, her fingers caressing the pommel of her longsword. Rot Levan's eyes dropped to those fingers whose fabled strength was one of the rocks upon which his world stood, then back up to meet her smoky eyes. I think we must pray for Azuth or find some way to aid him. The castle was built with much magic, he told the two lords, the words coming out in a rush. If its spell fails, it will fall, and us with it. The great lady's expression did not change. Her eyes turned to meet those of Lord Eric Lonavan. Is this true? The elf merely nodded. Nerissa stared at him for a moment, her face still calm, but Rontlevon saw that her hand was now closed around the hilt of the longsword and gripping so tightly that the knuckles were white. Her eyes swung back to his. Well, Rontlevon, have you any plan for preventing such doom? Rontlevon spread empty hands, wishing wildly that he could be the hero and see love for him awaken in her eyes, wishing he could give her more than his despair. No, Nerissa. He was astonished to hear himself calmly whispering. I'm only an apprentice, but I will die for you if you ask me. He drew his blade out of the swaying sorceress with savage glee, to thrust it into the great foe he'd pursued for so long, the grasping, stinking human who dared to stain bright Cormanthir with his presence and doom the House of Starm, now helpless before him, able to move just his eyes, fittingly, to see whence his doom came. No, as you die, human worm, Ilbrin hissed, that the star of Aven... And those were the last words he ever spoke, as all the magic that the ancient sorceress had drawn into herself rushed out again in a fiery flood of raw magical energy that consumed the blade that had spilled it, and the elf whose hand held that blade, all in one raging wave that crashed against the far wall of the cavern and ate through solid rock as if it was soft cheese, thrusting onward until it found daylight on the slope beyond, and the groan of toppling trees and falling stones began in earnest. Sayreda wailed, flame streaming from her mouth, and fell away from Elminster her mists receding into a standing cloud whose dark and despairing eyes pleaded with his for a few fleeting moments before it collapsed and dwindled away to whirling dust. El was still staggering and coughing, his hands at his ravaged throat, when Azuth strode forward and unleashed a magic whose eerie green glow flooded the runes and the dust that had been Sayreda alike. Like a gentle wave rolling up a beach, the god's spell spread out to the crevice Ilbrin had hidden in and every other last corner of the ravaged cavern. Then it flickered, turned a lustrous golden hue that made Beldrun gasp, and rose from the floor, leaving scoured emptiness behind. Azuth strode through the rising magic without pause, caught hold of the reeling Elminster by the shoulders, and marched him one step farther. In mid-stride they vanished together, leaving three old mages gaping at a fallen throne in a shaft of sunlight in a pit in the forest that was suddenly silent and empty. They took a few steps toward the place where so much death and sorcery had swirled, far enough to see that the runes were now an arc of seven pits of shivered stone, then stopped and looked at each other. "'They're gone and all, eh?' Beldrun said suddenly. "'That's it.' All the fury and struggle and in the space of a few breaths, that's it. All done. And us left behind and forgotten. Tabarist of the three sung curses raised elegantly white tufted eyebrows and asked, You expected things to be different this once? We were worthy of a god's personal protection, Kaladaster almost whispered. He walked with us and shielded us when we were endangered. Danger he did not share, or he'd never have been able to deal with that fireball as he did. That was something, wasn't it? Beldrun chuckled. Ah, uh, I can see myself telling the younglings that. A little more pepper indeed. I believe that's why he did it, Tabarus told him. Yes, we were honored, and we're still alive, 
Unlike that ghost sorceress and the elf, that's an achievement right there. They looked at each other again, and Beldrune scratched at his chin, cleared his throat, and said, Yes, ahem, <clears throat> well, I think we can just walk out, there at the end where the fire burst out of the cavern, that way. I don't want to leave here just yet, Calidaster replied, kicking at the cracked edge of one of the pits where a rune had been. I've never stood with folk of real power before, at a spot where important things happen, and I guess I never will again. While I'm here, I feel... alive. Huh, Beldrun grunted. She said that, and look what happened to her. Tabaris stumped forward and put his arms around Calidaster in a rough embrace, muttering, I know just how you feel. We've got to go before dark, mind, and I'll want a tankard by then. A lot of tankards, Beldrun agreed. But somewhere quiet to sit and think, just us three, Tabarist added, almost fiercely. I don't want to be sitting telling all the drunken farmers how we walked with a god this night and have them laugh at us. Agreed, Calidaster said calmly and turned away. Beldrun stared at his back. Where are you going? The old wizard reached the rubble-strewn bottom of the shaft and peered down at the stones. I stood just here, he murmured, and the god was there. Though his voice was steady, even gruff, his cheeks were suddenly wet with tears. He protected us, he whispered. He held back more magic than I've ever seen hurled before in all my life. Magic that turned the very rocks to empty air for us, that we might live. Gods have to do that, you see, Beldrun told him. Someone has to see what they do and live to tell others. What's the good of all that power otherwise? Calidaster looked at him with scorn, anger rising in his eyes and stepped back from Beldrun. Do you dare to laugh at Divine? Yes. Beldrun told him simply. What's the good of being human elsewise? Calidaster stared at him, mouth hanging open, for what seemed like a very long time. Then the old wizard swallowed deliberately, shook his head, and chuckled feebly. I never saw things that way before, he said, almost admiringly. Do you laugh at gods often? Once or twice a ten day, Beldrun said solemnly. Thrice on high holy days, if someone reminds us when they are. Stand back, holy mocker, Tabarist said suddenly, waving at him. Beldrun raised his eyebrows in a silent question, but his old friend just waved a shooting hand at him and strode forward, adding, Move those great booted hooves of yours, I said. All right, Beldrun said easily, doing so. So long as you tell me why. Tabarist knelt in the rubble and tugged at something a corner of bright cloth amid the stones. Gems and scarlet fine weave? he asked Faroon at large. What have we here? His wrinkled old hands were already plucking stones aside and uncovering cloth with dexterous speed, as Beldrun went to one knee with a grunt and joined him at the task. Calidaster stood over them anxiously, afraid that, somehow, a ghostly sorceress would rise from these rags to menace them anew. Beldrun grunted in appreciation as the red gown with gem-adorned dragons crawling over both hips was laid out in full, but he promptly plucked it up and handed it to Calidaster, growling as he waved at more cloth beneath. There's more! The daring black gown was greeted with an even louder grunt, but when the blue ruffles came into view and Tabarist stirred around in the stones beneath enough to be sure that these three garments were all they were likely to find, Beldrun's grunts turned into low whispers of curiosity. Being as Azuth wasn't wearing them that I saw, these must have come from her, he said. Tabarist and Calidaster exchanged glances. Being older and wiser than you his old friend, told him kindly. We figured out that much already. Beldrun stuck out his tongue in response to that and held up the blue gown for closer scrutiny. Do these hold power, do you think? Tabarist asked, the black gown dangling from his fingers as Calidaster suppressed a smirk. Hmm, 
Power or not, I'm not wearing this backless number, Beldrune replied, turning the blue ruffles around again to face him. It goes down far enough to give the cool drafts more than a bit of help, if you know what I mean. 20. Never have so many owed so much. Never before in the history of this fair realm have so many owed so much to the coffers of the king. Never fear but that he'll come collecting in short order, and his price shall be the lives of his debtors in some foreign war or other. He'll call it a crusade or something equally grand, but those who die in Cormir's colors will be just as dead as if he'd called it a raid to pillage or a head-collecting patrol. It is the way of kings to collect in blood. Only archmages can seize such payments more swiftly and recklessly. Elberton of Marsember, from A Small But Treasonous Chapbook, published in The Year of the Serpent. Doom time, that deep voice boomed in Elminster's head. Mind you make the right choices. Somehow the Athelantin knew that Azuth was gone, and he was alone in the flood of blue sparks, the flood that he'd thought was Azuth, whirling him over and over and down to a place of darkness with the cold stone floor under his bare knees. He was naked, his gown and dagger and countless small items of majory gone somewhere in the whirling. Robbed by a god, he murmured and chuckled. His mirth left no echo behind, but what happened to it as it died away left him thinking he was somewhere underground, somewhere not all that large. His good feeling died soon after his chuckle. Elminster's innards felt ravaged. It was damp and a chill was beginning to creep through him, but El did not rise from his knees. He felt weak and sick, and when he tried to seek out magic or call up his spells, all of his powers as a chosen and as a mage seemed to be gone. He was just a man again, on his knees in a dark chamber somewhere. He knew that he should be despairing, but instead he felt at peace. He had seen far more years than most humans and done, so far as he could judge at least by his own standards, fairly well. If it was time for death to come to him, so be it. There were just the usual complaints. Was it time for his death? What should he be doing? What was going on? Who was going to stop by and furnish him with answers to his every query? And when? In all his life, there had only been one source for succor and guidance who wasn't certain to be long dead by now, or entombed and asleep he knew not where. And that one source was the goddess who made him her chosen. Oh, Mistra, you've been my lover my mother, my sole guide, my savior, and my teacher, Elminster said aloud. Please, hear me now. He hadn't really intended to pray, or perhaps he had all along, but just not admitted it to himself. I've been honored to serve ye, he told the listening darkness. You've given me a splendid life, for which, as is the way of men, I've not thanked thee enough. I am content to face now whatever fate ye deem fitting for me, yet, as is the way of wizards, I wish to tell thee some things first. He chuckled and held up a hand. Save thy spells and fury, he said. Tis only three things. Elminster drew in a deep breath. The first, thank ye for giving me the life ye have. Was something moving in the gloom and shadows beyond where his eyes served him reliably? He shrugged. What if something was, alone, unclad, on his knees without magecraft, to aid him? If something did approach him, this is how he'd have to greet it. And this was all he had to offer it. The second, El announced calmly, being thy chosen is really what I want to spend out my days doing. Those words echoed where the darkness had muffled his words before. El frowned then shrugged again and told the darkness earnestly, The third, and most important to me, to impart, Lady, I love thee. As those words echoed, the darkness disgorged something that did move 
and reveal itself and loom all too clearly. Something vast and monstrous and tentacled slithered leisurely toward him. Was it a god? Vayelum asked, white to the lips. Shrugs and panting were the first answers he got from his fellow dreadspells as they lay gasping in the hollow. Scraped and scratched by tree limbs in their run and thoroughly winded, they were only now shedding the heavy cloak of terror. God or no god, Femter muttered, anyone who can withstand all we hurled down on his head and swallow fireballs for Shar's sake is someone I don't want to stand and face in battle. For Shar's sake indeed, dread brother, someone said almost pleasantly from the far side of the hollow, where the ferns grew tall and they hadn't been yet. Five heads snapped around, eyes widening in alarm, and five jaws dropped, the throats beneath them swallowed noisily, and the eyes above them acquired a look of trapped fear. The masked and cloaked lady floating in the air just above their reach, reclining at her ease on nothing, was all too familiar. For there is a black flame in the darkness, the cruel overmistress of the acolytes purred in formal greeting. And it warms us, and its holy name is Shar, the five priests murmured in a reluctant, despairing chorus. You are far from the house of holy night, dread brothers, and unused to the ways of wizards, all too apt to stray and in sore need of guidance, dread sister Clalera observed, her voice a gentle honey of menace. Wherefore our most caring and thoughtful Dark Lady of Rowena has sent the House of Holy Night to you. Hail, Dread Sister, Dread Spell Elrin said then, managing to keep his voice noncommittal. What news? News of the Dark Lady's deep displeasure at your leadership, most bold Elrin, the Overmistress said, almost jovially, her eyes two spark-adorned flints. And of her will that you cease wandering Faroon at your pleasure and return to the place from whence you so lately fled. Immense power lies there, and Shar means for us to have it. I know you'd not want to fail, most holy Shar, or disappoint Dark Lady of Rowena. So turn about and return thence to serve Shar as capably as I know you can. I shall accompany you to impart the Dark Lady's unfolding will as you return to the mission you were sent here for. Now rise, all of you. Return? Femter snarled, his hand darting to one of the wands still at his belt. To duel with a god? Are you mad, Clalera? The other dreadspells watched silently, neither rising nor snarling defiance and something unseen flashed between the overmistress, at her ease with her head propped on her hand, and Femter Deldranus, the wand still on its way out of his belt and not yet turned outward to menace anyone. The priest shrieked and clutched at his head with both hands, hurling the wand away and staggering forward, his limbs trembling. They watched him spasm and convulse and babble for what seemed like a very long time before Clalera raised one languid hand and closed it in a casual gesture, and Femter collapsed in mid-word, falling in a sprawled and boneless heap like a dangle puppet whose string had been cut. I can do the same for any of you, and all of you, at once, the overmistress drawled. Now rise and return. You fear death at the hands of this god you babble of. Well, I can deliver you sure and certain death to set against one that may happen, or may not. Would any of you care to kneel and die here and now, in agony and in the disfavor of Shar? Or will you show the flame of darkness just a little of the obedience she expects from those who profess to worship her? As dread sister Clalera uttered these biting words, she descended smoothly to the ground, drawing from her belt the infamous barbed lash with which she disciplined the acolytes in her charge. The dread spells turned their faces reluctantly back toward the ruins they'd left so precipitously and began to trudge up out of the hollow, to the serenade of her whip crashing down on the defenseless back of the motionless femter. At the lip of the hollow they turned in unspoken accord to look back, in time to see femter head lolling and eyes glazed, 
rise to his feet in the grip of fell magic and stagger after them, his back mere ribbons of flesh among an insect-buzzing welter of gore, his boots leaving bloody prints at every step. Clalera shook drops of his dark blood from her saturated lash and gave them a soft smile. Keep going, she said silkily. I'll be right behind you. Despite the floating menace of the overmistress behind them, the five dread spells slowed cautiously as they climbed the last wooded ridge before the ruins. Blundering ahead blindly could mean swift doom, and a delay could well bring them to a shaft now empty of dangerous mages, leaving the ruins free for scavenging. Careful, Elrin murmured, the moment he heard the creak of leather that marked dread sister Clalera's bending forward to bring her lash down hard on someone's shoulders, probably his. There's no need for anyone to strike alone in the fray if we work together and avoid making pretty little speeches, Clalera snapped. Elrin, shut your mouth and lead the way. There's nothing between us and the ruins save a couple of stumps, a lot of waste lumber, your own fears, and us, a musical voice murmured, an elven voice. Its owner rose up from the other side of the ridge, a scabbardless sword made of wood held in both his hands. A walk in the woods these days holds so many dangers, Starsunder added. My friend here, for instance. The human mage Umbregard rose up from behind the ridge on cue and favored the Sharans with a brief smile. He held a wand ready in either hand. The overmistress snapped. Slay them. Oh, well, Starsunder sighed theatrically. If you insist... Magic roared out of him, then in a roaring tide that swept aside wand bolts, simple conjurations, and the lives of struggling Hrelgrith and dumbfounded Valem alike. Femter screamed and fled blindly back into the trees, until Clalera's unseen magic jerked him to a halt as if a noose had been settled about his neck, and spun him around, thrashing and moaning, for the slow stagger back into the fray. Beams of light were stabbing forth and wrestling in the roiling air as Elrin and a snarling Deluth sought to strike down the elf mage, and Umbregard used his own wands to disrupt the strike aside their attacks. Deluth shouted in pain as an errant beam laid bare the bone of his shoulder, flesh, sinews, and clothing all boiling away in an instant. He staggered back a pace or two, at about the same time as Umbregard went over backward in a grunt and a shower of sparks leaving the elf standing alone against the Sharans. The overmistress of the Acolytes found her coldest, cruel smile and put it on. It widened slowly as Star Sunder's shielding spell darkened, flickered, and began to shrink under the bolts and bursts streaming from the wands of the dread spells. I don't know who you are, elf, Clalera remarked almost pleasantly, or why you chose to get in our way, but it's quite likely to be a fatal decision. I can slay you right now with the spell, but I'd rather have some answers. What is this place? What magic lies here that makes it worth you losing your life over? The only thing that amazes me more about humans than their habit of splitting up Fair Faroon into separate places, one seemingly having no connection to the next, Starsunder replied, as casually as if he'd been idly conversing with an old friend over a glass of moon wine, is their need to gloat, threaten, and bluster in battle. If you can slay me, do so, and spare my ears. Otherwise, he sprang into the air as he spoke, leaving Sharan wand blasts to ravage elfless stumps and ferns, and collapsed his shield into a net of deadly force that clawed at the overmistress. She writhed in the air, sobbing and snarling, until her desperate mental goading dragged the wild-eyed femter over to stand beneath her. Then she collapsed her own defenses, and Starsunder's attack still gnawing at them, down into the helpless dread spell in a deadly flood that left him a tottering, blinded mass of blood and exposed bone. The joints of Femter Deldranus failed, and he sought his last eternal embrace with the earth, ignored by all. He hadn't even been given time to scream. A gasping overmistress tumbled away through the air as her flight spell began to collapse, Elrin roared in wordless victory as his wand bursts found Starsunder at last, spinning the elf around in a swarm of biting bolts, 
Umbregard was struggling to rise, his face sick with pain as he watched his friend beset. Deluth leveled his own wand at the human mage at point-blank range, across the smoking bodies of fallen fellow dreadspells, and smiled a slow and soft smile at the horrified human. Then he spun around and smashed Dread Sister Clalera out of the air with all the might the wand in his hand could muster. It crumbled away, leaving him holding nothing, as the lash all of the House of Holy Night hated and feared so much blazed from end to end and spun high into the trees, hurled by a spasming body in black leather that was crumpling into smoking ruin. Crumpling then snarling into a standing stance once more, surrounded by crackling black flames. The face that had been Clalera's, working and rippling beneath dead, staring eyes as her lips thundered, Deluth, you shall die for that! The voice was thick and roaring, but the two surviving dread spells recognized it. Elrin's head snapping around from the task of rending the convulsing, darkening body of the elf mage. You are cast out of the favor of Shar. Die friendless, false priest, Dark Lady of Rowena thundered through the lips that were not hers. The bolt of black flame that the body of the overmistress vomited forth then swept away the errant wizard priest and old and mighty tree beyond him and a stump that dwarfed them both, shaking the forest all around and hurling Elrin to the ground. The last dread spell was still struggling to his feet as Clalera's dangling body, still streaming black flames, floated forward. Now let us be rid of meddling mages, elf and human both, and... The sphere of purple flame that came out of nowhere to hit what was left of the overmistress tore her apart, spattering the trees around with tatters of black leather. Ah, fool, that's one thing none of us will ever be rid of. A new voice told the dwindling, collapsing sphere of black flames that hung where Clalera had been. Elrin gaped up at a human who stood holding a smoking, crumbling amulet in his hand, a black cloak swirling around him. Verun will always have its meddling mages, the newcomer told the dying knot of flames in tones of grim satisfaction. Myself, for instance. Elrin put all of his might into a lunge at this new foe, swinging his belt mace viciously and jumping into the air to put all his weight behind the strike. His target, however, wasn't there to meet the blurred rush of metal. The newcomer slid a knife into the priest's throat with almost delicate ease as he stepped around behind the last dread spell and said politely, Tenthard Teir Hamus, Archmage of the Phoenix Tower, at your service. Eternally, it appears. Choking over something ice-cold in his throat that would not go away as the pleasant world of trees and dappled shade darkened around him, Elrin found he lacked the means to reply. Purple flames exploded over the altar of Shar with a sudden flourish, scorching the bowl of black wine there. The chosen acolyte held the glowing knife that was to be slaked in it aloft and kept fervently to his chanted prayer, not knowing that bursts of purple fire weren't part of this most holy ritual. So intent was he on the flowing words of the incantation that he never saw the dark lady of the house stagger and fall past him across the altar, her limbs streaming purple fire. Wine hissed and sputtered under her as she thrashed face up and staring at the black purple-rimmed circle that adorned the vaulted ceiling high above. Avroina was still arching her body and trying to find breath enough to scream as the prayer reached its last triumphal words, and the knife swept down. With both hands the acolyte guided the consecrated blade, the runes on its dark flanks pulsing and glowing, down, down to the heart of the bowl, the very center of Dark Lady Avroina's breast. Their eyes met as the steel slid in to the very hilt, of Rowena had time to see triumphant glee dawning in the acolyte's eyes amid the wild horror of realizing his mistake before everything grew dim forever. Gasping, Starsunder managed to raise himself on one arm, his face creased with pain. Large, weeping blisters covered all of his left flank, save where melted flesh glistened in dangling droplets and ropes of scorched sinew. Umbregard half staggered and half ran to his side, trying not to look at the archmage of the Phoenix Tower, his foe of many years. Fear of what Tenthar might do, 
standing so close at hand behind him, was written clearly on Umbregard's face as he knelt by Star Sunder and carefully cast the most powerful healing spell he knew on the stricken elf. He was no priest, but even a fool could see that an unaided Star Sunder hadn't long to live. The elf maid shuddered in Umbregard's arms, seemed to sag a trifle, then breathed more easily, his eyes half closed. His side still looked the same, but the organs, only partially hidden beneath the horrible seared wounds, were no longer wrinkled or smoking. Still, a long hand reached past Umbregard, its fingers glowing with healing radiance, and touched Star Sunder's flank. The glow flared, the elf shuddered, and the last fragments of something that had hung on a chain around the archmage's neck fell away into drifting dust. Tenthar rose hastily and stepped back, his hand going to his belt. Umbregard looked up at the wand that hand had closed around and hesitantly asked its owner, Is there going to be violence between us? Tenthar shook his head. When all Ferun hangs in the balance, he replied, personal angers must be set aside. I think I've grown up enough to set them aside for good, he extended his hand. And you? Elminster knelt on the cold stone as the slithering tentacled bulk drew nearer and nearer. With almost indolent ease, a long mottled blue-brown tentacle reached out for him, leathery strength curling around his throat. Icy flames of fear surged up his back, and El trembled as the tentacle tightened almost lovingly. Mistra, he whispered into the darkness, I, a memory of holding a goddess in his arms, as they flew through the air came to him unbidden then, and he drew on the pride it awakened within him, forcing down his fear. If I am to die under these tentacles, so be it. I've had a good life, and far more of it than most. As his fear melted, so did the slithering monster, melting into nothingness. It hung like clinging smoke around him for a moment, before sudden light washed over him. He turned his head to its source and stared. What his eyes had told him was probably a bare stone wall, though the cloak of gloom made it hard to see properly, was now a huge open archway. Beyond was a vast chamber awash in glowing golden coins, precious statuary and gems, literally barrels full of glistening jewels. Elminster looked at all its dazzle and just shrugged. His shoulders had barely fallen before the treasure chamber went dark, all of its riches melting away, whereupon a trumpet sang out loudly behind him. El whirled around to see another vast, grand, and warmly lit chamber. This one held no treasure, but instead a crowd of people, royalty by their glittering garb, crowns, and proud faces. Human kings and scaled lizard-like emperors jostled with mere folk, who were gasping in the air, all crowding forward to lay their crowns and scepters at his feet, murmuring endless variations on, I submit me and all my lands, great Elminster. Princesses were removing their gem-studded gowns now and offering both gowns and themselves to him, prostrating themselves to clutch at his ankles. He felt their feather-like fingers upon him, stared into many worshipping, awed, and longing eyes, then shut his own firmly for a moment to gather the will he needed. When he opened them, an eternity later, it was to say loudly and firmly, My apologies, and I mean no offense by my refusal, but no, I cannot accept ye, or any of this. When his eyes opened, everything was melting away amid growing dimness, and off to his right another light was growing, this one the dappled dance of true sunlight, Emira of Buckralam's starn was sliding forward across a bright room toward him, her arms outstretched and that eager smile on her face offering herself to him. As she drew near, shaping his name soundlessly on her lips, she pulled open the bodice of her dark blue gown, and Elminster swallowed hard as the memories rose up in a sudden warm surge. The sun fell through the windows of Fox Tower and laid dappled fingers across the parchments Emira was frowning over. Gods, how did anyone make sense of such as this? She sighed and slumped back in her chair. Then, in a sort of dream, 
found herself rising to glide across the room toward its darkest corner. Halfway there her fingers began to pluck at her catches and lacing to tear open the front of her gown as if offering herself to empty air. Amira frowned. Why? she murmured, then abruptly shivered, whirled around, and did up her gown again with shaking fingers. Her busy fingers clenched into fists when she was done, and she peered in all directions around the deserted room, her face growing pale. Wan Lorne, she whispered. Elminster, do you need me? Silence was her answer. She was talking to an empty room, driven by her own fancies. Irritated, she strode back to her chair and came to a halt in mid-stride as a sudden feeling of being watched washed over her. It was followed by a surge of great peace and warmth. Emira found herself smiling at nothing, as contented as she'd ever felt. She beamed at the empty room around her and sat back down with a sigh. Dappled sun danced across her parchments, and she smiled at a memory of a slender hawk-nosed man saving the starn while she watched. Emira sighed again, tossed her head to send her hair out of her eyes, and returned to the task of trying to decide who in the starn should plant what, so that all might have food enough to last comfortably through the winter. Her warm, yearning eagerness and hope, her delight. Elminster reached for Emira, a broad smile growing on his own face, a smile that froze as the thought struck him. Was this spirited young woman to be some sort of reward for him, to mark his retirement from mistress service? He snatched back his hands from the approaching woman and told the darkness fiercely, No, long ago I made my choice to walk the long road, the darker way, and know the sweep of danger and adventure and doom. I cannot turn back from it now, for even as I need Mistra, Mistra needs me. At his words, Amira and the sun-dappled room behind her melted away into falling motes of dwindling light that plunged down far below him in the great dark void he hung within, until his eyes could see them no more. Abruptly, fresh sunlight washed in from his right. Elminster turned toward it and found himself gazing into a long chamber lined with rows of bookshelves that reached up to touch its high ceiling Sunlit dust motes hung thick in the air, and through their luster Elminster could see that the shelves were crammed with spell tomes, not an inch of shelf left empty. Ribbons protruding from some of the spines, others glowed with mysterious runes. A comfortable-looking armchair, footstool, and side table beckoned from the right-hand end of this library. The side table was piled high with books. El took a step forward to get a better look at them, and found himself striding hungrily into the room. Spells of Athalantar, gilt lettering on one spine said clearly. El extended an eager hand and let it fall back to his side, muttering, No, it breaks my soul to refuse such knowledge, but where's the fun of finding new magic, mastering it phrase by guess, and deduction by spell trial? The room didn't fall away into darkness as all the previous apparitions had done. El blinked around at more spell books than he could hope to collect in a century or more of doing nothing but hunting down and seizing books of magic, and swallowed. Then, as if in a dream, he took a step toward the nearest shelf, reaching for a particularly fat volume that bore the title, Galagard's Compendium of Spells Netherese. It was inches from his fingertips, when L whirled around and snarled, No! In the echoes of that exclamation, his world went dark and empty again. The dusty room swept away in an instant, and he was standing in darkness and on darkness, alone once more. A light approached out of black velvet nothingness and became a man in ornate high-collared robes, standing on a floor of stone slabs with a spell staff winking and humming in his hand. Not seeing Elminster, the man was staring grimly down at a dead woman sprawled on the stones before him, gentle smokes rising from her body, her face frozen in an eternal scream of fear. 
No, the man said wearily. No more. I find that first among her chosen has become an empty boast. Find another fool to be your slave down the centuries, lady. Everyone I loved, everyone I knew, is dead and gone. My work is swept away by each new grasping generation of spell hurlers. Faroon fades into a pale shadow of the glory I saw in my youth. And most of all, I'm so damned tired. The man broke his staff with a sudden surge of strength, the muscles of his arms rippling. Blue light flared from the broken ends, swirling in the instant before a mighty explosion of released magic coalesced into a rushing wave. The despairing Chosen thrust one spear-like broken shaft end into his chest. He threw back his head in a soundless gasp or scream and fell away into swirling dust, that convulsing jaw last an instant before the outward rush of magic became blinding. L turned his gaze away from that flash, only to find it mirrored in miniature elsewhere in a hand-sized scrying sphere that a bald man in red robes was hunched over. The man shook his fist in triumph at what he saw in the depths of the crystal and hissed, Yes, yes, now I am first among Mistress Chosen, and if they thought Eltheris was overbearing, they'll learn well to kneel and quiver in fear beneath the spell-seizing scepter of Wirkheimbrand. <laughs> the weak might just as well slay themselves right now and yield their power to one more fitted to wield it. Me. The mad shout was still ringing in Elminster's ears as that scene winked out, and a circle of light occurred right beside the last prince of Athelantar. Floating with it was a dagger, and as he recognized it, it slowly turned and rose, offering its hilt to his hand. L looked down at it, smiled, and shook his head. No, that's a way out I'll never take, he said. The dagger winked out of existence, and promptly reappeared off to Elminster's left in the hand of a robed man, his back to L, who promptly drove it into the back of another robed man. The victim stiffened as his wound spat forth a blue radiance, and the blade of the murderer's dagger flared up into a blue flame that swiftly consumed it. The dying man turned, his wound leaking a trail of tiny stars, and El saw that it was Azuth, face convulsed in pain. The god clawed with his bare hands at the face of the man who stabbed him, and the radiance leaking out of him showed El the face of the recoiling murderer. The slayer of Azuth was... Elminster. No! El shouted, raking at the vision with his hands. Away! Away! The two figures struggled with each other in the heart of a spreading cloud of blue stars, oblivious to him. Such ambitions are not mine, El snarled, and shall never be if Mistra grant it so. I am content to walk Faroon and know its ways more than I know the deep mysteries. For how can I truly appreciate the one without the other? The dying Azuth swirled away and out of the stars that had been his blood strode a man El knew from memories not his own. Spell shared with him once in Myth Draenor. It was Rawmark, a sorcerer king of Netheril, who'd survived the fall of that decadent realm to become one of the founders of Halrua. Rawmark the Mighty stood alone in a hall of stout white pillars and vast echoing spaces, at the top of a high dais, and his face was both pale and grim. Carefully he cast a spinning whirl of disintegration, testing it by dragging it through one of the giant pillars. The ceiling sagged as the top of the sheared-off pillars fell away into heavy crashing shards to the unseen floor below. Rawmark watched the collapse, stone-faced, and brought the whirl back to spin in front of him, just beyond the lip of the dais. He nodded down at it, as if satisfied, and jumped through it. The scene died with Rawmark, to be replaced by a view of a dusty tomb. A man El did not recognize, but somehow knew was a chosen of Mistra, was taking an old and tattered grimoire out of a shoulder sack and placing it into an open casket, the same task El had done so often for the Lady of Mysteries. This chosen, however, was in the grip of a seething fury, his eyes blazing with near madness. 
He plucked a cobwebbed skull up out of the casket, gazed into its sightless eye sockets, and snarled at it. Spell after spell I just give away, while my body crumbles and grows deaf and stumbling. I'll end up like you in a few winters. Why should others taste the rewards I dole out while I do not, eh? He flung the skull back into its resting place and shoved the stone lid closed violently, the stony grating so loud that L winced. The Chosen strode forward with red fire in his eyes and said, To live forever? Why not? Seize a healthy body, snuff out its mind, ride it to ruin, then take the next. I've had the spells for a long time. Why not use them? He resumed his determined walk, fading like a ghost through Elminster. But when the Athelantin turned his head to watch what happened to the Chosen, the man was gone, and the tomb he'd left fast fading behind him. Such a waste, El murmured, unshed tears glimmering in his eyes. Oh, Mistra, lady mine, must this go on? Torment me no more, but give me some sign. Am I worthy to serve you henceforth, or are ye so displeased with me that I should ask ye for death? Lady, tell me. It was a shock to feel the sudden tingling lips upon his. Mistress' lips they must be, for at their touch the thrill of raw power surged through him, making him feel alert and vigorous and mighty. Elminster opened his eyes, lifting his arms to embrace her, but the Lady of the Weave was no more than a dwindling face of light, beyond his reach and receding swiftly into the void. Lady, he gasped, almost despairingly, stretching out beseeching arms to her. Mistress smiled. You must be patient, her calm voice came quietly into his ear. I shall visit you properly in time to come, but I must set you a task for me first, a long one perhaps the most important you'll ever undertake. Her face changed, looking sad, and she added, Though I can foresee at least one other task that might be judged as important. What task? El blurted out. Mistra was little more than a twinkling star now. Soon, she said soothingly, you shall know very soon. Now return to Faroon and heal the first wounded being you meet. The darkness melted away, and El found himself in his clothes again, standing in the woods outside the ruins. A few paces away, two men were talking with an elf, all three of them sitting with their backs against the trunks of gnarled old trees. They broke off their converse to look up at him rather anxiously. One of the mages suddenly sprouted a wand in his hand, leveling it at Elminster. He asked coolly, And you would be? El smiled and said, Dead long ago, Tenthar Teerhamus, save for the fact that Mistra had other plans. The three mages blinked at him, and the elf asked rather hesitantly, You are the one they call Elminster, aren't you? I am, El replied, and the mission laid upon me is to heal ye. Ignoring a suddenly displayed arsenal of wands and winking rings, he cast a healing spell upon Starsunder, then another upon Umbrigard. He and Tenthar locked gazes as he finished his castings, and El inclined his head toward the ruins and asked, "'Tis all done, then?' "'All but the drinking,' Tenthar replied, and there was suddenly a dusty bottle of wine in his hand. He rubbed its label, peered into it suspiciously, drew out its cork, sniffed, and smiled." Magic seems to be reliable once more, he announced, holding out his other hand and watching four crystal goblets appear in it. Mistress' need is past, I think, El told him. A testing is done, and many dark workers of magic have been called. Tenthar frowned and said, It is the way of the cruel gods to take the best and brightest from us. Umbregard shrugged as he accepted a glass and watched several other bottles appear out of thin air. It is the way of the gods to take us all, he added, in the end. Star Sunder said then, My thanks for the healing, Elminster. As to the way of gods, I believe none of us were made to live long, elf, dwarf, human, even, I think, our gods themselves. 
The passage of too many years does things to us, makes us mad. The losses, friends, lovers, family, favorite places, and the loneliness. For my kind, a reward awaits, but that doesn't make the tarrying here any less wrenching. It only gives us something to look at beyond present pain. Elminster nodded slowly. There may well be truth in thy words. He looked at Starsunder sidelong, then asked, Did we meet, however briefly, in Myth Draner? The moon elf smiled. I was one of those who disagreed with the coronal about admitting other races into the fair city, the elf admitted. I still do. It hastened our passing and gained us nothing but all our secrets stolen. And you were the one to break open the gates. I hated you and wished you dead. Had there been an easy, traceless way, I might have made things so. What stayed your hand? El asked softly. I took your measure several times at revels and in the mythal and after. And you were as we, alone and striving as best you knew how. I salute you, human. You rested our goading, conducted yourself with dignity, and did well. Your good deeds will outlive you. Many thanks, Elminster replied, his eyes bright with tears as he leaned over to embrace the elf. To hear that means a lot. The fair maid was elbow to elbow crowded. It seemed the High Duke's latest idea was to send huge armed caravans along the perilous road. Ripplestones looked like a drover's yard with beasts bawling and on the move everywhere. Inside shielded a trifle from the dust if not the din. Beldrune, Tabarist, and Calidaster were sharing a table with the haughty mage from the Sword Coast, brimming tankards in every hand. The talk was of spells and fell monsters vanquished, and wizards who would not die rising from their tombs, and folk were crowding around to listen. Why, that's nothing, Beldrune was snarling. Less than nothing. This very day, in the heart of the dead place, I stood beside the god Azuth. The mage from the coast sneered in open disbelief, and thus goaded, Beldrun rushed on. Oh, yes, Azuth, I tell you, and Calidaster and Tabarist exchanged silent looks, nodded, and with one accord rose and rummaged in Calidaster's pack while their comrade snarled on, jabbing a finger in the coast mage's startled nose. He needed our help, I tell you. Our spells saved the day. He said that, and he gave us to understand that we'd earned these magical robes, Tabarist broke in triumphantly, holding up the daring black gown for all to see. The roar of laughter that followed threatened to shake the very ceiling of the inn down on top of all the table-slapping, hooting drinkers, but as their laughter finally trailed away, a high-pitched chuckle joined in from the doorway. Those who turned to see its source went very still. That almost looks as if it would fit me, Sharon Dalla, the sorceress, told the four gaping mages brightly. And I do need something to preserve my modesty, as you can see. The Lady of Scorched Stone Hall wore only her long silken brown hair. It cloaked her breast and flanks as she strode forward, but no man there could fail to notice that aside from her tresses, she was bare to the world from the top of her head down to her hips, where her flesh ended, leaving bare bones from there to the floor. May I? she asked, extending a hand for the garment. Around her, several folk slid down in their seats, fainting dead away, and there was a rush of booted feet for the door. Suddenly there was a small circle of empty space in the fair maid, ringed by men who were mostly white-faced and staring. I've got to get through a few more spells before I'll be able to eat or drink anything, Sharon Dalla explained, and it's rather embarrassing. Tabarist snatched the gown out of her reach with a low growl of fear, but Calidaster stepped in front of him, tugging on his own robe. He had it over his head and off in a trice to reveal a rotund and hairy body clad in breeches and braces that were stiff and shiny with age and dirt. It's none too clean, lady, he said hesitantly, and will probably hang on you as loose as any tent, but take it, tis freely given. A long, slender white arm took it, 
and a smile was given in return. Calidaster, you were just a lad when I... Oh, gods, has it been so long? Calidaster swallowed, red-faced, and licked lips that seemed suddenly very dry. What happened to you, Lady Sherry? I died, she replied simply, and utter silence fell in the maid. Then the sorceress shrugged on the offered robe and smiled at the man who'd given it to her. But I've come back. Mistra showed me the way. There arose a murmur from the crowd. Sharon Dalla took Calidaster's arm in one hand and his tankard in the other. Her touch was cool and smooth and normal-seeming enough. She said gently, Come, walk with me. We've much to talk about. As they moved toward the door together, the half-skeletal sorceress paused in front of the mage from the coast and added, By the way, sir, everything that's been said about Azuth here this night is true, whether you believe it or not. They went out the door in a silence so deep that people had to gasp for air by the time they remembered to breathe again. He seemed to have lost his boots again and to be walking barefoot on moonlight somewhere in Faroon where the sun of late afternoon should still have reigned. A breath ago he'd been talking with three mages in a forest, and the cheese had begun to arrive to go with their wine, and now he was here left with but a glimpse of their startled faces at the manner of his going. So where exactly was here? Mistra? he asked aloud, hopefully. The moonlight surged up around him into silver flames that did not burn, but instead sent the thrill of power through him, and those flames shaped themselves into arms that embraced him. Lady mine, Elminster breathed as he felt the soft brush of a familiar body against his. There went his clothes again. How did she do that? And the tingling touch of her lips. He kissed her back, hungrily, and silver fire swept through him as their bodies trembled together. He tried to caress soft, shifting flames, only to find himself holding nothing and standing in darkness once more, with Mistra standing like a pillar of silver fire not far away. Mistra, El asked her, letting a little of the loneliness he'd felt into his voice. Please, the goddess whispered pleadingly, this is as hard for me as it has been for you. I must not tarry. And you tempt me, Elminster. You tempt me so. Silver flames swirled and a hungry mouth closed on El's own for one long, glorious moment, fires crashing and charging through him, rising into splendor that made him weep and roar and writhe all at once. Elminster, that musical voice told him as he floated in hazy bliss, I'm sending you now to Silverhand Tower, to rear three chosen. Rear? Al asked, startled, his bliss washed away into alert alarm. There seemed to be a laugh struggling to break through the tones of the goddess as she said, You'll find three little girls waiting in the tower, alone and uncertain. Be as a kindly uncle and tutor to them, feed them, clothe them, and teach them how to be and who to be. Elminster swallowed watching Mistra dwindle once more into a distant star. You are forbidden to control their minds or compel them save in emergencies most dire, she added. As they grow older, let them forge forth to make their own lives. Your task, then, will be to watch over them covertly and to ride in and pick up the pieces to ensure their survival from time to time, not to guide them unless they seek your advice. And we both know how often willful chosen seek out the advice of others, don't we? Mistra, El cried despairingly, reaching out his arms for her. Oh, by the weave, man, don't make this any harder for me, Mistra murmured, and the kiss and caress that set him afire then also whirled him end over end away. Epilogue Perhaps the greatest service Elminster has ever done for Faroon is to be father and mother to the daughters of Mistra.
holding almost all of Mistra's magic and keeping Toral together with his very fingertips during the time of troubles. That was easy. Rearing little girls of clever wits, much energy, bewitching beauty and mighty magical powers, and doing it well. Now that's hard. Antarn the Sage, from The High History of Faerunian Archmages Mighty, published circa the Year of the Staff. Silverhand Tower, when he found himself standing a little way off from it, blinking in the sunlight, was a riven shell, little more than a cottage attached to an empty ring of battlements and the gutted stump of a keep. Deep woods surrounded it, cloaked it, and were in the patient process of overwhelming it, hewn back only from an oval vegetable garden. A small, dirty face was peering doubtfully at him from its leafy green heart, a face that vanished, leaving only dancing leaves behind once he smiled at it. Elminster peered at the garden to see if he could catch sight of a little body scuttling anywhere. He could not, and soon shrugged and strolled toward the cottage, its straw roof a mass of bright flowers and nodding herbs. Ambera, he called gently as he approached. Athena? The door seemed to be stuck fast, off the latch, but refusing to open. He nudged it with his knee, mindful of the fact that little bodies might be crouching behind it, and heard the faint protest of wood splintering. It had been pegged closed into a dirt floor. Someone had a mallet or mace or axe to hand. Ambera? he asked the darkness within. Athena? Am a man away? The wand spat so close behind him that he heard the young light voice murmur the command word quite clearly before the rain of magic missiles tore into him, hurling him against the door. His body was still shuddering as something snatched the peg away and hurled the door open, spilling him into the dim interior, and something else drove an axe at his head, hard. It struck his spell shield with a shower of sparks and glanced away, numbing hands that were too small for it and making their owner sob with pain. Without thinking, El reached out and placed a healing on the small barefoot slip of a girl who was trying not to cry, and became aware that an utter silence had fallen. He drew his hand slowly back from the one he'd healed, seeing an intent face above a tightly clutched and dusty dagger close by his left ear, and an equally intent face over the ready-held wand just out of reach to his right. Long and tousled silver hair adorned all three heads, and all three of the faces, even in their dirty, alarmed, and childlike state, were breathtaking in their beauty. How is it you know our names? The eldest one with the wand asked him fiercely. Who are you? Mistra told me, Elminster replied, giving her a grave smile, and sent me to do for ye three what thy mother now cannot. Our mother's dead, the girl with the wand told him fiercely. Elminster nodded. Year Ambera, he said, aren't ye? Nobody calls me that, the girl told him, tossing her head angrily. Gods, but she was beautiful. Year Ambera Dove, four summers old, El said gently. What would ye like me to call ye? Dove, the little girl told him. And that's Storm. She can talk a little. Layer can't yet. She just cries. She needs changing, El observed gravely. We all do, Dove told him severely, after the fright you gave us. What we need most, though, is something to eat. I can't be wasting this precious thing. She waved the wand with the air of a veteran battle mage, blasting down any more little birds and beasts that make us sick to even look at them, and the things I know are safe to eat are gone. I'm not a great cook, El told her. Dove sighed. Why'd Mistress send you, then? She asked rudely, then pointed with the wand. We used that bit of the stream below the stump to wash and drink from up here. You change lair, and I'll go hunting. Storm will be watching you, Storm said suddenly, putting out a hand to take firm hold of Elminster's beard. Shielding lair. Be nice, like your beard. Nice. Elminster grinned at her, found that he had a lump in his throat and tears threatening to burst forth. He swept them all into his arms and wept openly knowing just a little of what a long, hard road lay before these three little ones down the long years ahead. Laryl gurgled with pleasure at being so close to the man who banished her pain, 
but Dove swatted him matter-of-factly on the side of the head and snapped, Stop that crying. Night soon, and we've got to eat. Elminster's tears turned to a chuckle, and suddenly he was rolling around on the dirt floor with three laughing, tumbling girls locked onto his hair and beard. How many years was he going to be doing this? The roast lizard was just bones and scorched scales and a pleasant smell now. His crushed berry sauce had been crude but a beginning, and he'd discovered that none of the girls had enough clothing to keep them warm as they slept, to say nothing of decent, but that his cloak would easily furnish three blankets just large enough to wrap them in. The sun was going down, and as El stared up at the twilit woods, he saw Mistra's dark eyes gazing down at him from among their tangled branches. He stared into those eyes of deep mystery as they sent him silent love and sympathy and fond admiration and sent back a silent prayer for guidance. He did not move until it was fully dark and true night ruled the land. A small hand captured one of his. Gods, but they could move silently, these three or stealthily enough that an insect chorus could cloak their noises at least, Elminster looked down and whispered, Shouldn't ye be getting off to sleep? Dove pulled at his hand. Uncle Weirdbeard, she said insistently, It's dark time, and I can't sleep until I know you're on guard against the wolves and all, else I have to stay up with my stick. I'm tired. Hadn't we better go in? He stared at her, found tears swimming in his eyes again, and quickly looked up at the brightening stars overhead. "'Sir,' she asked almost sternly, pulling on his hand again, "'hadn't we better go in?' El sighed, gave the stars a last look, his heart full. He knelt down, gave her a gentle kiss and a smile, and said, "'Yes, I suppose we should. Why don't ye lead the way?'